And then he was a descendant of uh, the cousin of the Prophet وسلم, who is Jafar ibn Abi Talib, okay? So that's the first part of his bio. Um, his mother, and this is for all the moms who are tuning in, I'm a mother, and I want you, and I wanted to again honor Imam al biography, but also all, honor all the mothers because we sometimes don't give ourselves enough credit. But look at you know what we know of Imam al maulud that his mother, Maryam bint Muhammad Maulud ibn al Nahi, was also very knowledgeable, and she was her son's first teacher, subhanAllah. Most of us are. Most of us are our children's very first teachers, right? Um, but he actually memorized the Quran through his mother. So again, such a beautiful inspiration for all of us to reflect on as mothers and as children that the, the greatest uh, school is, is our is oftentimes our home and our teacher is uh, the greatest teacher that we have, first teacher anyway, is our mother, alhamdulillah. So he's a great scholar of his time, authored many, many books, over 70 books. And then, uh, you know, he passed away in the year 1905. Uh, so not, you know, I mean, it's not that long ago, right? Alhamdulillah. But he did so much for our uh, faith by providing this beautiful poem that examines the diseases of the heart. And we're going to talk about that, what that means in just a moment. So now that we know a little bit about Imam Mawlud, let's talk about the next person that's really important to this because he brought this text, which is in classical Arabic, to uh, the Western audience. He translated it from Arabic to English and then provided commentary, which is the basis, which is what we're going to talk about in this class as we go day, you know, session by session. We're going to talk about the commentary that Sheikh Hamza Yusuf provided. So who is he? Well, we should all know him, especially of those of us in California and the Bay Area, because he is a Bay Area native, mashallah, but he's also a global scholar known throughout every region of the world, mashallah, tabarakallah, and he currently serves as president of the first accredited Muslim college in the U.S., which is Zaytuna College, which is right here in Berkeley, California. A huge honor for those of us, again, in the Bay Area and in California in general. Alhamdulillah, Sheikh Hamza is, uh, you know, he, we could say so many things about him and his acumen, but mashallah, he holds uh, traditional advanced degrees, ijazat in Islamic law and theology, as well as a BA in religious studies from San Jose State University and a PhD from UC Berkeley, the Graduate Theological Union, alhamdulillah. He was ranked by the Muslim 500 as the 23rd most influential Muslim worldwide. Huge honor, right? Of all the Muslims, billions of people in the world, Sheikh Hamza was ranked as the 23rd most influential, meaning that his teachings, mashallah, have spread to so many people, alhamdulillah. And uh, most of those th teachings are by way of books, articles that he's written, as well as classes that are available for people and, and lectures that he's made available online. And so the books that he's published right here in this bottom uh, section are, include the Burda, Purification of the Heart, which I just showed you, The Content of Character, another amazing book for parents, again, to look into, The Creed of Imam at tahawi and Agenda, Agenda to Change Our Condition, Walk on Water, and The Prayer of the Oppressed. Alhamdulillah, all incredible uh, resources for us to have. So Alhamdulillah, please keep both of them in your du'as as we go through this class, because we would not be able to do this if it wasn't for their efforts. And it's so important to be in a state of gratitude to our teachers and to those who, again, give us access and knowledge uh, that enhances us and helps us on our spiritual journey. Okay, so with that said, we're going to jump into this topic because I want to maximize the time that we have. We have about an hour, maybe a little bit more if I take some Q&As at the end, which I want to. But let's proceed, inshallah. Why do we need to purify the heart? This hadith, which Imam Nawawi said, is one of four or five hadith around which the entire religion of Islam is understood is pretty critical to understanding why we have to do this process of purifying the heart. And we're gonna get into details again about what that means. Um, the Prophet said that the, hadith, the halal is clear and the haram is clear and between them are matters unclear that are known to most people. Whoever is wary of these unclear matters has absolved his religion and honor and whoever indulges in them has indulged in the haram. It is like a shepherd who herds his sheep too close to preserve sanctuary, and they will eventually graze in it. Every king has a sanctuary, and the sanctuary of Allah is what he has made haram. There lies within the body a piece of flesh. If it is sound, the whole body is sound. And if it is corrupted, the whole body is corrupted. Verily, this piece is the heart." 
So what does this mean, the word sound, right? It's kind of like strange because we think of sound, we think of hearing, we think of something that we hear, but actually has multiple meanings. In this case, it means that if it's healthy, okay? So if the heart is healthy and you can, we're talking specifically, you know, uh, we can we can interpret this hadith as the, the physical heart as well as the spiritual heart, right? And, and that's what our scholars have done, that it applies to both. And, and it's true it, from a medical or physiological standpoint, if you have a healthy heart, then alhamdulillah, everything in the body just seems to go smoothly. A lot of people, it's one of the number one killers is heart disease, right? A lot of people get have sick hearts. And I actually have a picture of a sick heart coming up. I just want to put that out there in case anybody's a little squeamish. Uh, I'll give you an alert before I post it. But I want you to see what happens when our hearts become diseased and then try to understand that the same thing can happen to the spiritual heart, okay? So this is why we purify the heart. Now, another really important thing to understand is that there are different types of hearts, okay? So uh, what we mean by that is here, here are the eight types of hearts. And we're gonna go through these the description of each one to understand that where people, different people throughout the world are, some people have, diff, you know, they don't have a sound heart, they don't have a healthy spiritual heart or physical heart, but we're, again, speaking about the spiritual heart here. So these are, there's eight different types of hearts that we learn through hadith or learn through commentary or learn through ayahs of the Quran, and we're going to now describe each one, okay? Here's the first one, the dead heart. In the Quran, in chapter 50, verse 37, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that verily in this is a message for any that has a heart or who gives ear and earnestly witness the truth. So he's talking about the Quran itself, that for people who have a heart, and obviously this does not apply to the physical heart, because if you don't have a physical heart, you're not alive, right? We're specifically talking about the spiritual heart, that for those people who have a spiritual heart that's working, that's functioning, and who actually listen and earnestly or sincerely are trying to learn the truth, the message of the Quran is gonna to touch their hearts. So what that means or the opposite or what this ayah tells us is that there are people that their hearts aren't working, that somehow something's gone wrong, that the spiritual heart is dead. Right. And these are the people who do not know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the way they should. They don't worship him the way he commands in the way that he likes and the way that he's that pleases him. Instead of worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they just do whatever they want to do. It doesn't matter. It's like, oh, I want to, you know, not pray because I'd rather go and, you know, have some ice cream or I'd rather go watch a movie or I want to go on my bike and take a ride, bike, uh, you know, ride around the court. So whenever there's something that has to be done as a form of worship to Allah, they don't do it. And even though they know that this might cause Allah's displeasure and wrath, they still go and do whatever they want. So these types of people are what we would say there's something wrong with their actual spiritual heart in that it's not functioning and it's probably dead. Now, can it come back to life? Yes, that's the good news, alhamdulillah. How? They have to humble themselves, make tawbah to Allah, and then they have to be willing to listen and take the message Right, whatever, like to listen to the message of the Quran and to listen to the words of the Prophet ﷺ with sincerity. This is how this kind of a heart can come back to life. So the hardened heart, okay, now I want you, again, I'm using this imagery because I want you guys to think about what happens to the spiritual heart, okay? When a person stops remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the way that they should, and they stop, uh, you know, doing what they should be doing in terms of fulfilling their, you know, ibadah, the heart starts to harden, okay, the spiritual heart. Um, and so to prevent this from happening, the answer that what we should be doing is always being in a state of remembrance as much as possible, thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, feeling grateful for the blessing of existence, for all of the blessings that Allah has given us. Our families, for example, our parents, our homes, the food that we eat, the drink that we have, the drinks that we get to have, the clothes that we wear, all of the things that we have in life are gifts that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has showered on us, he's blessed us with. So 
we have to be in remembrance and gratitude to Allah. And when we do that enough, it prevents the heart from getting hardened. Okay, so that's why saying mashallah, alhamdulillah, subhanallah, inshallah is so important to have as a practice. Astaghfirullah, right? A lot of things we could say, but if, as long as we're remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The third heart is the darkened heart. And if you notice in this picture, there's light, but it's not going through this heart. Why? Because this heart is darkened. And, you know, we talked about the dead heart, right? Those who basically are just in disobedience. They know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, you know, is, uh, may, may be upset with them, but they continue to follow their own desires. And those people, yes, their hearts can come alive uh, through being attentive and actually witnessing the truth. But the people who still remain in darkness, right? That maybe they've heard the truth. Um, they hear the message and they're just not willing to accept it. That those people, they remain heedless. They just are, you know, they don't want to do what they're supposed to do. They, their hearts become darkened, right? And that darkness is because they are heedless, which means they're not fulfilling their obligations to Allah. And then that what that does, it actually makes them suffer in many ways. They start to have uh, problems with their life, in their life. They may have uh, mental health problems or other spiritual problems like anxiety, depression, fear. They might start getting a lot of stuff. And that's, uh, again, sorry, the reason for that is because um, a person who has peace in their heart that they have peace and they have light in their heart because they're remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when you don't remember Allah, this is the consequence is that it starts to darken. Okay. So what about a, the difference? So what's the difference between a darkened heart and a blackened heart? Well, we know from the hadith that the Prophet said, verily when the servant commits a sin, a black mark appears upon the heart. So you want to look exactly like this picture. Okay. Every time we sin, every time we lie, every time we don't do our prayers on time, or we do something that our parents told us not to do, and we, we make our parents upset, or we do something that, again, is forbidden in Islam, whatever that is, the, it, it, it's a sin and it, it, it creates a black mark upon our heart. Now, the hadith is hopeful because the Prophet said, if he abandons the sin, so if you say, Astaghfirullah, you recognize your mistake, and then you seek forgiveness and you make your tawbah, then Alhamdulillah, the black spot gets removed. It's like it wasn't even there and it's polished again. But if you keep going back to the sin, then that sin or that dark blackness will increase and it just starts to take over the heart. It's like the whole heart starts to get spotted with these black spots. And then it looks like something like this, right? And uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has an ayah in the Quran also that talks about a covering, right? So this is what we mean, that when uh, sins start to cover our hearts, uh, it's because of what we've done. It's our own sins, right? <clears throat> and this is why it's so important to make astaghfirullah every day. The Prophet said would make astaghfirullah every single day. And he didn't even sin. But why is he teaching us to do that? Because he knows that we will fall into mistakes and sins, but if we always go back to Allah, inshallah, we'll be okay, okay? So the next heart is called the sealed heart, okay? And this is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, thus does Allah seal the hearts of those who do not know. So there's the word in Arabic is taba, which means to stamp or seal. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about how he seals the hearts of the disbelievers and those who transgress, those who go against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who are disobedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah puts a seal on their heart. And so there are people out there who, again, they uh, may hear the message of Islam, but they don't, Allah's not guiding them because he's put a seal on their heart. Okay. A locked heart. This is another heart, and there's two more, okay? So the locked heart, this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, do they not then earnestly seek to understand the Quran, or are their hearts locked? So this is really interesting, right? Because there are people who they have the truth, alhamdulillah, they may, you know, they're Muslim, they, they may have learned a lot of things, but for some reason, uh, they've put a, heart, a lock on their own heart. And so this is, the person is doing this to themselves, right? And that prevents them from reciting the Quran, reading the Quran, learning about the Prophet Sallallahu seeking knowledge, doing their prayers on time. For whatever reason, they're just maybe, again, their nafs is too strong and they want to just do what 
what they want to do, but these are people who put a lock on their own heart, okay? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking, you know, uh, those who, people like think about what you're doing, right? That this is, you're the one that's putting that lock on your heart. And then we have the blind heart, okay? And this is also important. There's a lot of people who are just blind. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says here, do they not travel through the land so that their hearts may thus learn wisdom and their ears may thus learn to hear? Truly, it is not their eyes that are blind, but their hearts which are in their chests. So there are a lot of people who don't seem to see, you know, the importance of worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of doing what they're supposed to be doing because they're forgetting. They're forgetting that they were created for a purpose Purpose. And so this is a verse is a challenge that says basically go out and look right observe with your own eye how beautiful this world is look at the stars and the heavens and the universe and the sun and the moon look at the waterfalls and the mountains and the, all of the beautiful things in creation the beautiful uh, animals that Allah Subhanahu has created some of them can camouflage and change their color some of them you know can can do so many incredible things uh, so think about all of these uh, miracles in a way that we're witnessing when we look out into the world and reflect that who, how did this all come about? If you're blind, you're not seeing these things. So that's why it's very important to be in touch with nature and to try to always go out and maybe take a hike or go somewhere where that it connects you back with nature, right? I know a lot of children, one of the things I love, I love many things about children, but one of the things I love about children is that you have a natural love, most children do, of nature. You love to, you know, be out and about, and you know, whether it's, you know, just being outside and playing in your backyard or going on a hike, going mountain, I mean, to the mountains, going to the beach. You just like to be out and, and look at the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's why children are always in this beautiful state of joy and happiness because they're in awe. They love to see all of the great things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made uh, and created, right? So your hearts are, mashallah, fully, uh, you have great sight, right? A lot of other people, we need to uh, learn from you because you mashallah have uh, this this natural ability to see things that sometimes adults don't always see okay so alhamdulillah so may Allah protect us again from all of these hearts and then the heart that we all want this is the one okay so we covered seven so far there's eight this is the heart that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants all of us to have and that we should all want to have. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the day on which neither wealth nor children will be of any benefit except for whoever brings to Allah a sound heart. What does he mean by that? He's saying that on that day, the most important thing that you can come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with is you can't you know buy Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's happiness with you. You can't bargain with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The most important thing that you can do is make sure that your heart is shining, bright, uh, and healthy and sound. There's that word again, sound, right? Which really means healthy, vibrant, alive, right? And the Prophet ﷺ said, Verily, Allah does not look to your faces and your wealth but he looks to your spiritual heart and to your deeds. So this is, again, another reminder that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't care how tall we are, how small we are, how uh, much, uh, what color our hair is, what color our eyes, uh, you know, are, or uh, what, you know, other things that we have in terms of our physical appearance. None of that matters. He doesn't care about how much money we have. None of it. The most important thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us is a really sound, healthy, beautiful, sparkling, shiny, spiritual heart. So how can we get that? Well, that's what we're doing. This is what the whole class is about. The whole class is to teach all of us how we can try to keep our hearts from getting diseased, okay? So this heart that I just described is qalbun salim, that word sound. In Arabic, it's salim. And here is an ayah again in the Quran from chapter 26, verse 89, that says what? إِلَّا مَنْ أَتْ أَتْ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٍ So the, when the only one who will be saved is the one who comes before God with a heart devoted to Him, right? A heart that's devoted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, إِذْ جَاءَ رَبَّهُ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٍ Again, He came to His Lord with a devoted heart, right? Very important that our hearts are clean for, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
So, ooh, oh, sorry, I, I forgot to give you guys the warning. Okay, if you can't look at things that are kind of, you know, with the human body, um, I'm going to put a picture up, but I want you to see it. I hope that you guys are okay with looking at it. I know we have some kids that are 11. We have other teens that are much older. So I'm going to put it out there and let your parents uh, hopefully decide whether or not you can look at this. It's not too bad, but I think it's an important visual, okay? So how do we achieve a devoted heart, a clean heart? Well, look at this picture on the right. You see that healthy heart, right? That's what we all start off with. Every single person that's born you know, healthy, all infants, we're given this beautiful, fresh piece of you know, flesh in our body that just does what it's supposed to do really well. It pumps blood and it brings us you know, full health throughout the rest of our body, right? But over time, because of things that we do, uh, there's people who eat really bad food, but then there's other people who do things like drink alcohol, which is haram in Islam, right? Um, or they smoke cigarettes, or they smoke other things, or they do other uh, you know, type of uh, just wrong things. Those things have an effect on their heart, and it starts to do this, what we see in the damaged heart. It starts to cover the heart with disease, right? The, the heart is no longer working right. And that's why those people sometimes have a hard time breathing. They have a hard time, you know, doing anything. Walking a few steps can, for some people, be really difficult. And it's likely because their hearts have just been damaged for so many years. Um, and, uh, you know, it, can, it, it just prevents them from living a normal, healthy life. So the spiritual heart is the same way. Over time, if you don't, if you're not aware of the diseases of the heart, what can happen is it starts to take over the spiritual heart, just the same way like uh, the damage that you see in this physical heart. Okay, so that's why it's so important that we first identify what the diseases are. Because if you go to a doctor, right, and you say, "Doctor, I'm I'm experiencing some chest pains and I think my heart hurts." He, he or she will send you for uh, you know, some testing, they'll look into your heart, and they'll then tell you these are the changes that you need to make if you want to get your heart to be healthy again. They'll tell you to stop eating this, stop doing this, exercise more. That's all advice to get your heart to be healthy again. But you have to first identify where the problems are. So for the spiritual heart, it's the same exact thing. You cannot fix the heart if you don't know what the diseases are that affect the heart. So that's what we are going to talk about in this class. So let's go ahead and look. Now, there are 25 diseases of the heart, okay? This is a long list, but we're going to go over all of them by the end of the class. And this is just the first 13. Here's the rest. So I'm going to go over each one of them and kind of give you, again, some commentary so that you understand what they all mean and how human beings can develop them. Like, how can someone get a diseased spiritual heart? Well, we're going to talk about that. So let's go ahead and jump into the very uh, first five or six. I, I, we're likely, because of time, uh, we had to do an introduction. We might not get to all of these. I think we're probably only going to be able to do the first three, but I still wanted you to see them. So let's just quickly look at this list. The first one that we're going to talk about is called miserliness or stingy. Okay. Again, the uh, the English words are on the right column. The middle column has the Arabic words, and then the definition is in the right column. So the Arabic word for being stingy or miserly is bukhul. Okay. And this is the definition is someone who is holding on to their wealth and not spending it when it's necessary. And they're being stingy or greedy. They don't want to let go of their wealth for whatever reason. Okay, so this is a disease of the heart for many reasons because, which we'll get to, okay? But if you can imagine, again, in Islam, the Prophet ﷺ, when you study his life, you know one of the things that he was very well known for was how generous he was. He was always helping people. He helped everybody. He even helped animals. So his generosity wasn't just for, uh, you know, his family or friends. He helped complete strangers. He helped people from all different backgrounds. And he even helped, as I said, animals. So to not be a helpful person or a generous person or a charitable person is to go against the way of the Prophet ﷺ. That right in and of itself makes being stingy a very big problem, right? And again, we'll get into that in just a moment. 
The next disease of the heart is called wantonness, which is batr. And this is being way too exuberant, joyful, but that leads you to be reckless in your extravagance. And I know those are probably big words for some of you. I'll explain. What that means is that you, Allah, may have given you a certain lifestyle, right? Maybe you have uh, a lot of money. Like maybe during all these you know, years, you've gathered some money from family, from you know, your grandparents, uncles, aunts, for your birthday, for Eid, and you have a lot of money. And then you take all that money and you just want to spend it without really thinking about where would be best to spend. You're just like, you know what? I'm going to go and buy like, you know, 10 pounds of candy and then go and buy all these toys. And even though you have a lot of toys and you probably don't need all that candy, it's just because you have so much uh, that you can do with all this money that you just let yourself go. Now for a child, that's, you know, to a certain degree, okay. But when you have an adult that has that problem, it can really be become a big issue, right? And I'm gonna, again, talk it more in detail once we get to that. The third disease that we're gonna cover for today is called hatred. And this is bughd in Arabic. And this is when you hate someone for really no reason, no justifiable reason. Um, and it's definitely, it's not for the sake of Allah because there's sometimes, you know, uh, if you hate something, anything, it has to be for the sake of Allah. You can't just hate for no reason, right? And so we're going to talk about how that disease can also really affect a person's overall spiritual state, okay? So those are the three that we're going to cover today, and then I'm going to leave it open for some questions, hopefully. But let's go ahead and get to the first one. So miserliness, okay? This is, again, bukhul in Arabic. So I want you to, at home, with your parents, if you're there, to repeat the words because you should know how they sound. Miserliness and bukhul, okay? Kha with a kha, bukhul. Now, what is that? Here we have reminders uh, from the Quran and Hadith. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that those who are miserly and enjoying miserliness on other men and hide what Allah has bestowed upon them of his bounties. And we have prepared for the disbelievers a disgraceful torment. So Allah is warning us very clearly that if you're a miserly person and you hide, you're hoarding. To hoard something is where you basically are just collecting, right? You're gathering things for yourself, right? And I don't know how many of you are paying attention, but when this whole pandemic started, a lot of people were running to the stores to get what? Piles and piles of toilet paper, piles and piles of hand sanitizer. And there were a specific people who got so much that they cleared out the stores. So all the local stores in their cities, they didn't even have any of these things available because one or two people took all of it for themselves. This is completely wrong in Islam. You can't do things like that because there were so many people who needed that stuff, right? They needed it to keep their families healthy and safe. But the, a miser doesn't care about other people. They're selfish. They're only thinking about themselves. And then they hoard things, maybe even more than they need. Um, there was actually, you know, even shows, I remember watching uh, a few of them that go through uh, people who have this disease of the heart and they go, they, they're, you know, they're, it's like a documentary kind of, which is where um, it's like a little news story where a camera crew will go into the house of a person and then kind of, you know, just show what, how they live. A lot of people have a disease called hoarding. Okay. Um, and hoarding is where you just can't help yourself. You just want to gather as many things as possible. Some of these people, if you go into their homes, you know what happens? You can't even walk through the front door. You have to go through a window or a side door because the things that they have uh, get gathered or accumulated over time are so much that they go all the way to the roof of the house. So can you imagine? And some of these people, like, they have one specific thing. Like, I remember watching one woman. You know what she loved to buy? She loved to buy uh, dolls. So she would buy, she was like an older woman. So it's not like a little girl who just loves dolls. She liked to collect dolls. So what she did is she bought so many dolls that they were taking over every room of her house. 
So this is what happens with people who hoard, right? They just keep taking and taking and taking, not realizing this is wrong. You're not letting other people also have their share. And so it's a disease, right, of the heart. The Prophet also said, spend in charity and do not count it, lest Allah count it against you. Do not hoard it, right? Do not be miserly, lest Allah withhold it from you. So this is a clear warning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you are a hoarder, someone who hoards or miserly, that Allah will withhold things from you too, right? So you do that to other people, you're going to have it done to you. This is really important to understand. Now, this is an interesting fact. Some of you may know this, some of you may not. Did you know that in Arabic, the Arabic language, the word for miserly or miserliness is compared to something really unpleasant that all human beings experience, even you, pretty much all of us. We have all at some point in our lives experienced this because it's just natural uh, thing, but it's not very pleasant, okay? And I'm going to tell you what it is. So check this out. The miser ardently clings to what? His wealth, right? And he hoards it up. The word for cling in Arabic is masak. Okay, everybody say masak, okay? What is masak? This is derived from another Arabic word, which means constipation. O-M-G, right? I see your smiling faces and laughing faces. I knew this was going to get you guys to giggle a little bit. But just think about it for just a second that the person, right, who is constipated is what? They are holding on to something that's actually harmful for them to hold on to because you need to go, right? When it's time to go, you need to go. But if you can't go because your body has a problem, what happens is it causes you problems, right? So miserly people are compared to a person who is in that state because they're clinging on to something that actually poisons them, right? What do we mean by that? When you have wealth and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you abundance of something, in Islam, we have to give part of our wealth away, right? We give zakat, we give charity. Why? Because that zakat and, and sadaqah that we give cleans or purifies all of the other wealth that we have. So it's kind of like a detox, right? Because we don't know if all of the money that we have is is halal. So we give it part of it away so that Allah cleanses the rest of it for us. But if you're a miser, what you do is you don't give sadaqah, you don't give zakat. You're holding on to your money for whatever reason. And so you're they compare you to a person who's in that constipated state. That's why it's something so odious, something so repulsive, right? We don't want to be misers, just like we don't ever want to be in that physically very, very uncomfortable state, right? So remember that word, the word masak. Remember what it means, okay? So another, also just to, for those of you who might, again, want a, a quicker definition, miser, a miser is someone who's also cheap, okay? So cheap people, stingy people, miserly. Those are all the words that you need to know to understand this disease of the heart. Now, how do you get rid of it? Okay, so important because as we talk about the diseases, we also have to talk about the cures, right? We can't just identify the diseases without figuring out, well, how do I make sure I don't ever, 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 ever become a miser? Well, let's look at what our scholars have told us. They've said, first, number one thing is to remember death, okay? Remember that wealth is accumulated over time and a lot of people work hard. If you look at your parents, they work really hard every single day to give you the life that you have, right? They go to work early. They sometimes deal with really difficult people. They're not always in the best state, but why do they do it? Because they have to, they have to provide for their families. So when you accumulate wealth, it takes time. But also one of the things that we know about this world is that death can come at any time, right? And so you have to be grateful for what Allah gives you and use it in its appropriate time without thinking that you have time to spend because we don't know. We have no idea how much life we have in this world, right? We always have hope and we should always have the best hope with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But remembrance of death will humble us to know, you know what, what am I holding on to this for? 
And then we also have to learn how to balance our spending because it's perfectly fine to spend your wealth. If Allah is giving you wealth to spend it, you shouldn't, you know, uh, hold on to it for no reason, but you also shouldn't waste it. Okay. Wasting your wealth is just splurging, buying things for no reason, just kind of being careless. Okay. About your wealth. We should not do that. And we should learn how to spend it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's a balanced view just doing both, right? And then this is a really important point. So I want you to pay attention, okay? The miser is considered the ultimate loser. Why? Because they don't use their wealth in this world because they're holding on to it, right? They don't want to spend. They're holding on to their wealth. And then in the next life, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala holds them to account, which means he's going to ask them about it, right? He's going to say, why didn't you use that wealth that I gave you to help the orphans or to help the refugees or to help the family that was struggling after their house went on fire, you know, or to help this person or that person. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to ask every single one of us how we, where we got our wealth from and how we used it. So the miser is going to be in a lot of trouble on the day of judgment. But then if you think about their life on in this world, well, how sad, because Allah has given you all this wealth, but you don't want to spend it. That means you're not even enjoying your wealth. You're just holding on to it for no reason. So this is why the miser is considered, again, a double loser. Okay, important to know. May Allah protect us all from miserliness. So inshallah say ameen, okay? We have to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he cleanse our hearts so that we don't ever get these diseases, right? So it's so important to make that dua. Ya Allah, please protect me from miserliness. I don't want to be uh, ever in this category of people, right? And also another thing that the scholars say is that the miser is usually someone that nobody really likes, not even other miserly people. <laughs> so kind of funny, but not really just the idea that they're so, you know, like disliked that even other people like them don't like them. So think about that. We never want to be like that, right? So the next disease is wantonness, okay? This is called batr uh, or batr in Arabic, okay? Um, and what is this? This, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, again, verse, uh, is chapter 8, verse 40, 46 to 47, he says, do, and do not be like those who leave their homes filled with excessive pride about their state, batara, right? Showing off before people and preventing others from the way of God. And God encompasses what they do. And then he also tells us, he reminds us, how many cities have we destroyed that exulted in their livelihood? Here are their homes now uninhabited after them, except for a few. What is that? He's warning us that there were people throughout history that had a lot of wealth and they were very, they were big show offs. They liked to show off and they had all this pride, but they didn't do anything really good with, with their wealth. They, they instead used it excessively. They, they, they sp sp uh, spent on things they didn't need. Right. And that is uh, something that now the only thing that remains about them are the big homes that they used to go around and, you know, show off about because they themselves were destroyed. So Allah reminds us that, you know, this world is something that's not going to last forever. And so don't think that, again, you just having the wealth that you have and spending it on whatever you want, that you're not going to be asked about that. Right. It's important that we know there's a it's going to end at a certain point and we're going to be hold, held accountable. So let's look at this. Wanting, wanting is the definition again, is being so full of oneself and proud of one's lifestyle and standard of living that it becomes difficult to show restraint and control one's desires, okay? So a person afflicted with this disease wants more and more and more of something, even if they don't need it, just because they can have it. So this is a form of greed, right? It's a form of greed to be, uh, to have this disease of the heart. And a lot of people, like especially adults, what happens to them, and this is, by the way, happening everywhere. A lot of adults, they end up uh, falling into debt. And what does that mean? If you fall into debt, it means that you uh, are spending more than you have. And how do people do that? 
They usually go and get credit cards and, you know, get loans from other people. They borrow money from other people and they do things that are just not right because they're trying to live a certain standard of living, like a, a lifestyle. So they'll buy like really expensive cars, but guess what? It's not with their own money. They're borrowing money, whether from a bank or their father or their mother or their brother. So they basically can't control this desire to just spend, 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 and uh, it ends up harming them and their families because if you can't control that, then it's going to you know affect everybody. It's a, and a lot of people they have you know uh, their their families fall apart because they can't control this disease of the heart. So very serious disease. Now, how do we protect ourselves from it? Right important to know that the treatment is similar to what we're doing right now okay we are all experiencing hunger right when you deprive yourself you go through that process of saying i'm not gonna eat i'm not gonna drink uh what does it do it just instantly reminds you right of of all the things that maybe you went a little overboard with, it humbles you, you start to appreciate what you have more. You've Because usually when you just keep wanting things, you lose the value of it. But once it's taken away, you remember the value of it, right? And so another important thing, to which relates to that picture that I showed you of the heart, is that a lot of different religions, not just Islam, have what we call shared, like universal beliefs. That we, we share the same idea about things. And so among them is that too much food um, actually harms the spiritual heart, okay? And in fact, could kill it. So this is connected to wantonness because a lot of people who have wantonness are, are excessive in everything they do, not just spending on wealth and material things, but also on eating too much. And what happens is their spiritual heart becomes hard, hard hearted. Okay. That picture that I showed you of that heart that looks like a rock. That's what happens to people who eat too much or who drink too much or who do anything in excess, spend too much. If you don't have restraint, that's what's going to happen to you. You're slowly basically killing your spiritual heart. And the interesting thing, the parallel, is that the same thing happens with the physical heart. When people eat really rich foods or and eat too much of it, like if you're eating a lot of fried foods and sugar and just things that are not good for you, they're, you know, they're not... Um, healthy foods that would promote health, but they're actually dangerous uh, foods, what happens is your heart actually becomes hard-hearted with something called arteriosclerosis. And this means that the arteries in your heart are hardened. They start to get really, really hard, right? Um, and so similarly, when you eat too much food, your spiritual heart starts to also become hard. So fasting is one of the ways to actually prevent yourself from getting this disease of the heart, inshallah. Another one is to also seriously reflect on death and the hereafter. Um, and this includes, you know, the various scenes and states of death, because death is a process, right? And then to think about the grave, walking on the sirat, right? So if your parents or your Islamic school teachers have ever taught you that there's, you know, a life after this life, we have different uh, things that occur, right? We, we, we have the soul travels. The soul was somewhere with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then it came to the womb of our mothers and then we're born into this world. And then we're in the barzakh, which is the stage between this world and the next life. And then we have the next life. So it's important to know those steps because then it reminds you that, you know what? You have to be better and you have to stop being too greedy and wanting too much and showing more more uh, control of yourself, right? And so then the last disease that we're going to cover is borod. This is hatred. Very important because it's so common. A lot of people, unfortunately, um, they have too much hate in their hearts. So let's look at what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet ﷺ taught us. Uh, first, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Oh, you who believe, stand out firmly for Allah and be just witnesses, right? Witnesses who are just. They're people of justice. And let not the enmity and hatred of others make you avoid justice. 
be just, that is nearer to piety and fear Allah. Verily, Allah is well acquainted with what you do. So Allah is telling us right away that if you are a hateful person, you're not going to be justful, right? You're not going to be a just person. So we need to know that what's closer to Allah and what's going to please him more is being just. So we cannot let hatred take over our hearts. The Prophet Wasallam also said, by the one in whose hand is my soul, you will not enter paradise until you submit to Allah and you will not submit until you love one another. Spread peace and you will love one another. Beware of hatred for it is the razor. So he's using this word razor, sharp thing, object, right? And he says now he clarifies, I do not say that it shaves hair, but rather it shaves away the religion. So hatred is something that will chip away at our faith, at our hearts, at our spiritual hearts. We cannot let it enter our hearts, right? And so again, just to expand on this a little bit, one of the consequences of allowing this disease of the heart to grow is that it inevitably it makes someone unjust that we're you you're if you can't let hatred enter your heart for people for no reason oh i don't like this person because i don't like the way they talk or i don't like the way they walk or why do they have to you know have this kind of uh, shirt on. Sometimes people can get really silly, but they'll find re really ridiculous reasons, right, to uh, to not like someone, and then they let that dislike turn into hatred. Uh, and you see this happening a lot, not just you know with adults, but sometimes even children, right? So children can bully and they can be really mean to each other for no real reason, um, but it's because again they've allowed this to enter their heart. And so, uh, what one of the things we have to understand is also how this takes a Effect. Well, what hateful people do is they tend to focus on one specific thing, right? So you sp sp uh, one, you focus on one thing you don't like about someone, uh, someone, and then that fuels the hatred. It just starts to make you feel more and more bad towards them. And then what that does is you can't even see all their good qualities anymore. You don't see anything but that hatred. Now, we have a word for this. This is called, and it's a little bit sophisticated, but I trust that you guys can learn this. Uh, it's called confirmation bias. This is when you think, have an idea of something, and then you convince yourself of it, and then that's all you ever see about a person or, or anything, then you just think that, that that's, your, that's the truth for you. Uh, but the truth is it's not reality at all. You've convinced yourself of something, and then you keep looking for that thing, and then you think that that's all there is in that person. So that's why it's so wrong, because we're very you know, most people have goodness in them, right? Most people are good. It's just that maybe they had a bad day. Maybe if someone said something to you that and it wasn't very nice, maybe they were just having a bad day and you have to be more forgiving instead of what? Getting straight to uh, this feeling of hatred, right? Which is why, um, you know, making excuses for people, which we're going to get to soon, what that means is a way to remedy and to remove the, this disease from the heart, right? And so that point about, again, that you can't be hateful and also be a fair person at the same time is important to remember. So how do we treat this disease of the heart? First and foremost, we have to acknowledge that one of the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-wadud, which is the loving one. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is full of love, right? And there's so many beautiful hadiths where he talks about his love and his mercy. One of my favorite hadith I was just telling, I think, my kids yesterday or the day before, was about how many parts of love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, right? He has, he says, that there's a hundred parts of his love. Only one part of that love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put on the earth. So that means that every type of love that you see, all the animals, all the you know uh, forms of love between human beings, mother, child, uh, sister, brother, uncle, grandmother, you know, husband, wife, all that love is what only from that one tiny part of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's love, the other 99 parts he is saving for us, the believers on the day of judgment. So love is such a big part of, of our deen and we have to be loving people, right? And we also have to remember that hate is the absence of love. So if you can have a hateful heart, then that means 
that there's a problem because in your heart, love is removed and we have to help put some more love into your heart, right? And so that's why we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always to protect us from this disease by, by giving us love in our life and increasing his love for us. Inshallah, we can uh, hopefully overcome it. We also want to be active, proactive, right? So if you uh, ever have bad feelings towards someone, it could be a classmate, it could be anybody, a stranger, what you want to do is stop and, and think about what's going on in your heart, listen to your thoughts, or you know, pay attention to what your thoughts are, and then say, hmm, you know what? I don't really know everything about that person. Is it really fair of me to think all of these bad things about them? That's not right. I shouldn't do that. Astaghfirullah. Allah forgive me. You know, I, I want to actually be uh, better. So I'm going to do something even more, more than just say astaghfirullah. I'm going to do something better, which is what? To make dua for that person. So that's one of the ways that you can remove hatred from your heart is that you go the next step. You take it you know, to the next extra step and you say, I'm gonna make dua by their name. So you actually, if you know their name, if it's a stranger, you don't know their name, that's okay. Uh, you could just say that person, right? Allah knows who they are. And you say, oh Allah, give that person guidance. Always, that's the first thing you should ask, right? That they're guided because we want everybody to have guidance and we want everybody to, to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and for him to be pleased with them. And then you can make other du'as that you want for them, okay? So very important to do that and to do it with sincerity. And then to remember the hadith, right? Uh, the Prophet ﷺ taught us that none of you has achieved faith until he loves for his brother or sister, what he loves for himself. So this means that if you really want to be a good Muslim, you have to love uh, other people the same way that you love yourself, right? And you should want for them what you want for yourself. This is how we become the best Muslims that we can become. And uh, Imam Nawawi, by the way, said that this hadith is universal brotherhood, right? It's not just for your family, if you have a brother in your family or your Muslim family, but it's for all humanity that we want all people to have uh, to be better and to be in a better state. So that's how we, inshallah, grow in uh, our love for other people. And that love will remove the hatred from our hearts, inshallah ta'ala. So I'm going to stop here, you guys, because we are just a little bit over time or almost at the end. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashrib al-anbiya'i wal mursaleen. Sayyidina wa maulana wa habibina Muhammad. صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا الحمد لله This is our second session of purification of the heart Thank you again all of you for being here We covered a lot of information on Tuesday And I know I watched the video afterwards And I know I was going a little fast at certain times And I apologize if I was going too fast But I'm going to do this sort of summary every class Before we get into the new material So don't worry and if you have any questions, the chat box is open, but it's uh, oh, it's going to come to me and my co-host, Sister Homera, who is also here, and she's going to facilitate. So if you have certain questions about anything that I'm saying at any time, feel free to use that chat box. Um, and just, you know, let's uh, enjoy the rest of this, uh, this program together, inshallah. I want participation, especially right now. Uh, so right now I'm going to just do a quick refresher by first asking some questions to see who is really paying attention on Tuesday, okay? So first, can who can tell me the name of the author who wrote the poem that was written in Arabic? We went over his biography, okay? So if you can type it in the chat box, I have someone who already, mashallah, gave their answer very quickly. I love it. I love that you were on it. But I'm not talking about the translator, okay? I'm talking about the person who actually, mashallah, Noor, there we go. Noor got it. Jazakallah khair and Noor, you wrote the right answer. Imam Mawlud or Imam al Mawlud, right? So Imam Mawlud is the one who wrote the Arabic text, okay? And he's the one whose poem, uh, the next person translated. So now, if Imam Mawlud is the one who wrote the Arabic text, who is the one who wrote the English uh, translation of his text? 
Okay, mashallah, there we go. We got Bilal, we got Yasin, and actually before all of you, uh, he he answered first, uh, San, right? You're the one who said uh, Hamza Yusuf first, so that was very good, mashallah, but that was for the translator. So good job. At least you guys know the names of these two very important people. So Imam al-Mawlud is the one who wrote the Arabic text, okay? He wrote the Arabic poem about 200 years ago. Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, who's still alive and well, alhamdulillah, he's here in Berkeley, he translated it into English. So make sure you know his name. It's very important. Now, before we jumped into some of the diseases, I described a couple or a few, more than a few, I should say, different types of hearts. Who can tell me first the number? How many hearts are there described in the Quran, Hadith, or in the commentary of some of these uh, texts? Very good, mashallah, you guys are all getting the right answer. So let's look at the chat to see who answered first. Um, I think this, this was Ishan, right? Ishan or Ishal, Ishal and Zaina. Okay, so I have Ishal and Zaina. Mashallah. And then Rahil, very good. Alina, Noor, all of you gave the right answer, mashallah, amen. Yasin, Saqib, Aisha, very good. Ismail, Maryam, awesome job, you guys. You guys are paying attention. I love it. Jazakallah khairan. Okay, so now a quick question. Of all the different hearts that we covered, which is the most important one? Which is the one we should all have and we should all want to have? Very good, mashallah. You guys are coming with the answers so quickly. I love it. So, okay, Yasin, Noor, Misha, Ishal, very good, Aisha, Afnan, Maryam, um, Alina. I love Alina. You said the shining heart. Everybody else said the sound heart. Very good. So, the shining heart, the sound heart, very good. Does anybody remember the Arabic word for it? Because that's the English meaning. Who can tell me the Arabic word or the term? It's a term. Okay, who remembers the Arabic? Let's see. Oh, mashallah, Maryam, you got it. Qalb Salim or Qalbun Salim. Very good, Maryam, mashallah, tabarakallah. Awesome job. I wish there was like a point system, but very good. Okay, excellent. Now we're going to go to the first three diseases that we covered. Who can type the first three diseases? Okay, very good. We got miser or miserliness, stinginess. Or, okay, good. And mashallah, Ihsan, you wrote the Arabic. Awesome. You wrote bukhul. I love it. So you gave me, some of you have given me the English. Some of you are giving me the Arabic. Oh, this is awesome, mashallah. Very good. Okay, let me just quickly pull up my uh, slides because I want to make sure I am um, have, have everything ready here. Okay, bismillah. Okay, very good. So let's see. I'm sorry. So go back to the chat. So you guys got miserliness. What's the second disease of the heart that we covered? So we covered miserliness, right? Which is bukhul in Arabic. Very good, mashallah. Wantonness, yes. And butter, awesome, ahsan. And afnan, you guys are on it. You, you definitely got it. And then Noor, Noor coming in, sliding in with all three answers. In her, uh, in her response, mashallah. Very good, Noor. I'm going to see who else remembers the third one. The third disease of the heart. Give me the English and the Arabic if you can remember the Arabic as well. Okay, let's see. Very good, Ihsan. Got it. Great job. So, mashallah, Noor, you got all three. Excellent. Rahil, Yasin, Aisha, great job. So, Bogod, right? So, we covered miserliness, which is Bukhul wantonness, butter, and hatred, bhagat. You guys rock. Very good job. Thank you guys for, uh, for ma- mashallah, giving me, uh, again, that sense that you were paying attention and that you retained, which means that you remembered what we talked about. That's really exciting. All right, so now we're going to go ahead and move into today's lesson, okay? So for this, I'm just going to quickly cut out my camera so you guys are not going to see me, and then I'm going to go into the screen share so you guys will see my desktop as soon as I expand this. Okay, let's see, bismillah. One second, you guys, sorry. Alhamdulillah. Okay. This should hopefully be 
Mm. Okay. So let's see. Why it is it not expanding? Huh. Sorry, guys. I'm trying to make this expand. It was working just a second ago, but let's quickly check why this isn't working. Um, bismillah. Presenter view, hopefully it'll come right on, okay? Just give me one second. Okay, bismillah. There we go, yay, okay. So thank you again for your patience. Here we go, so now you guys should be able to see the entire screen, not a tiny little screen. So we're gonna go through the slides, some of the slides that we saw last time, and uh, we'll go through all of these hearts, which we talked about. Ooh, there's that picture. <laughs> Okay, and here's the full list of the diseases of the heart. This is what we covered. The first three we covered last time, which is miserliness, stinginess, wantonness, and hatred, which we just talked about. Now we're going to go into number four, which is iniquity or transgression, bari, okay, bari in Arabic. And the meaning of this is it's hatred for other than the same, or excuse me, harming anything in creation without a just cause, okay? So if you ever cause harm to something without reason, this would be bari, okay? So let's go ahead and uh, talk about bari. We're going to fast forward through all of these because we already went through. Here we go. So bari is harming anything in creation without a just cause, which means without a good reason. If you're going to harm something, like sometimes, you know, um, you'll see uh, adults or kids, just people walking um, down the street and then they see um, a bug and they just squash it, right? Why would you squash an innocent bug? That's not nice. That bug was just living its life. It didn't do anything to you. So we don't harm things without reason, especially if you're just, you know, walking by something or you see people pulling out grass or flowers, you know, when they are at a park, you'll they'll just go and just start pulling out things. We want to be careful not to cause harm to anything, right, um, in creation. So those are just smaller examples. But of course, this can be a big problem if it's not checked, right, because with the diseases of the heart, some people can have like, a, just like with any disease, you can have it like a mild kind of version of it or like a really serious. So a mild version would just be wanting to like destroy things, right? Just harming things, destroying things, destroying property, destroying, uh, like I said, innocent uh, creations like bugs and animals, kicking a cat or a dog. These are all haram. You cannot do that. It's not permissible, right? Uh, but when it gets... Uh, in a, a worse form, this can be very, very dangerous because it can lead to a lot of terrible things happening, right? So the word bari is derived, and this is again important to know because it explains the meaning and how we got the meaning of this disease of the heart. It's derived from the Arabic root word for desire, ragaba. So bari is desiring something so bad that you're willing to harm someone or something else for it. Like you're you know, whatever that thing is that you want, um, you're willing to destroy something else. This is why it's such a dangerous and terrible disease of the heart. So let's talk about how this can be come in a, in a bigger form, in the worst form possible, right? Bari is something that leads often to obsession with power. So if you look at some of the world's most notorious leaders, like the worst leaders throughout history, they were afflicted with this disease, right? And they caused mass uh, genocide. Genocide is when you kill a lot of people at the same time for no reason, just because you want power. Maybe you don't like a particular group of people, right? And throughout history, that's that, that's definitely happened where people have harmed entire uh, villages, cities, groups of people just, just because they, they wanted to and for no good reason, uh, just because they didn't like them or they wanted power. So bari can bring a lot of harm if it's not treated, right? It causes this disease, again, of power and wealth. Other people that are also have this problem are criminals, right? People who steal, for example, or who destroy other people's properties. Why do they do what they do? It's for, you know, maybe they want something, right? If a, if a, if a thief goes into 
someone's home, um, they're not caring about the safety of that family or those people inside the home. They just want what they want. But maybe if they're, you know, confronted by someone, they will hurt them because they want to run away before the police come and catch them. So they basically really don't have that value for human life. And they'll do whatever they can to get what they want, right? Which is why it's so dangerous. So criminals, thieves, they have this disease, but another group of people also have a version of this disease. And that's something, a term that you might all know, which are bullies, okay? Bullies want sometimes to become popular or liked by certain people, or they want power, right? Like it, it, they want to, to have other people scared of them. So what they do is they'll ridicule, mock, sometimes even fight people who are less, you know, maybe weaker than them or smaller than them, uh, all just to get something uh, for themselves. So they don't really care. So this is why, again, it's such a dangerous disease of the heart. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us and warns us about uh, Baghi, right? He says that all faces shall be humbled before him, the living, the, sub uh, the subsisting, eternal, hopeless indeed will be the man that carries iniquity on his back. So he's saying that the person who has this disease of the heart is going to be hopeless on the day of judgment. That means that they're not going to be safe because they ha caused so much harm to people in this life that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to call them to account. He's, they're going to have to face him. And then um, the Prophet Wasallam said, who's Islam, or uh, sorry, Abu Musa reported that they said, they asked the Prophet a question. They said, oh, messenger of Allah, whose Islam is best, right? And he answered, the one from whose tongue and hand Muslims are safe. So making sure that you don't cause harm to people, right, with your words or your hands is a big part of being a Muslim. So you cannot have baghi and be a practicing Muslim at the same time. If you're someone that causes people harm uh, with, with your words or, like I said, with your hands, this is definitely something we have to treat. We have to stop that behavior, right? Um, so, inshallah, that is what we have for baghi. And here's the treatment for it. So the first part of the treatment that Imam al-Mawlud suggests is having certainty that the day of judgment is real and that every single person is going to face Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and be asked about why they did what they did and that nothing escapes the knowledge of Allah, right? He knows everything, he sees everything, and he's the most just. All people are going to be asked. Every single one of us will have to answer for what we did. So we should know that. And once you know that firmly, then it should protect you and prevent you from, uh, from iniquity, from baghi, from doing this, where you harm other people. Another thing is to remember death. Okay. Remembering death is similar because you remember like I have to leave this world. So whatever power I want, whatever control I want, whatever money I want, it doesn't last. It's going to eventually, it's not going to matter because I can't take it with me when I die. Right. And we don't know when that time is for some people, they live a long life. Other people, maybe not that long, but the point is all of us, we only, uh, we don't take anything with us when we die. Right. That's the only thing we take with us is our good deeds, right? Or our deeds. And then we're going to be asked about that on the day of judgment. So very important to remember these things frequently. And the more you remember them, it prevents you from having baghi. Okay. So that is the first disease that we're going to talk about today. Now, the next one is kind of related because certain parts of baghi or baghi is, is, is fueled by the desire for something, right? You want something and therefore you're willing to hurt people for it. So that desire is what we're going to talk about now when we talk about the next disease of the heart, which is love of the world or in Arabic, hubbad dunya, okay? So the love of the world is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns us about in the Quran because it's something that can distract us, right? It can take us away from uh, worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he tells us here in chapter 6, verse 32, he says, And the life of this world is nothing but play and amusement, but far better is the house in the hereafter for those who are pious. Will you not then understand? So he's trying to tell us, like, don't get too caught up in this small 
world, uh, short world, because it's not going to last very long compared to eternity, right? Uh, we're going to be here we're, for a short time, and we should just focus on what we're supposed to do, which is worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the next life is so much better. It's longer. We're going to be with our loved ones, and we won't have all the problems and the issues that, that we have in the dunya. So basically, stay focused. And then he says, let not this present life deceive you, which is to also just kind of warn us, like, don't be tricked by the dunya, because the dunya can be so distracting, right? If you, like I said, start work, worrying about money and clothes and cars and all the different things you want, you'll just forget to do other things, right? It's That's the power of the, the dunya, is that it can basically take you away from your responsibilities to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to your parents, your family, your work. It can just uh, take you away because you keep wanting more and more and more. So the Prophet actually gave us many different hadith that talked about this disease of the heart. But there's one in particular that really talks about the time that we're living in now, right? Where he says that nations are about to unite and call each other to set upon you, just as diners are invited to a plate of food. So then someone asked, is it going to be, be because of our lack of numbers that day? Will we be small in number? So what the Prophet just described, he said that the Muslim ummah is going to, uh, base, there's going to be other people that are going to come and just kind of start taking from our lands, you know, like the, the Muslim lands throughout the world. The way that a, a person who's really hungry comes to a dinner table and just jumps on a plate of food. So they were kind of confused because, you know, they were strong people. So they didn't understand, like, how could that be? And so their immediate uh, thought was maybe it's because we're not going to be that many. There's not going to be that many Muslims. And that's why we're going to be so powerless. Like all these countries are going to be able to invade our countries and take what they want. So that's what they were thinking, right? So they asked, is it going to be because our numbers, like we're going to be small in number? And the Prophet said, no, you're going to be many on that day, but you will be like the foam that floats on the ocean. So what the Prophet is telling us is that the, the in terms of numbers, population, Muslims are going to be very, like there's going to be a lot of Muslims, but there's uh, we're going to be like the foam that floats on the ocean. And I'll explain what that means in a second. And then he says, Allah will remove the fear of you from the hearts of your enemies and put wahan into your hearts. So two things are going to happen. These forces that are invading in Muslim lands, they're not going to be scared of you. You're not strong people. They're not intimidated by you. You're weak, basically. And Allah, and they put wahan into your hearts, right? There's wahan. So then they were like, wait, uh, what does that mean? So they asked, O oh, Messenger of Allah, what is wahan? And he said, love for the dunya and hatred for death. So what he's basically telling us in this hadith is that that uh, that we, even though we have large numbers, right? Muslims are large in population. We become weak and we're so weak that other forces can will start invading our countries and taking things from our countries. So some of you may know people from certain parts of the world. I, for example, was born in Afghanistan, right? There's many other uh, people who uh, were born in different Muslim lands who have had this experience where other governments, other people came into the country, took what they wanted and left, right? It's happened in Iraq and Syria and so many other places in the Muslim world, right? And so why does this happen? Well, the Prophet ﷺ told us it's because we, he's putting the responsibility back on us, right? He said that we have a love for the dunya, right? Which is, and we'll talk about, you know, the different types of love that we can and can't have. And we have a hatred for death. So we don't want to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because death is really one step closer to meeting Allah, right? And so anybody who hates death, they don't want Jannah, they don't want to meet Allah. So if you have both of these uh, problems or issues, then it's, is it, you know, any wonder why you see so much of the Muslim world in the state that it's in? It's because we need to not have these diseases of the heart, right? Both of them are diseases of the heart, love for the dunya and hatred for death. So now let's just examine this a little bit more, okay? 
The froth of the ocean, this is a really good analogy. Look at that man in the first picture, how small he looks in compared, comparison to the foam, right? The foam of the ocean, depending on where you're standing, can go really, really far. So that's, it's a pretty you know, large swath of, of, of foam that you're looking at here. And this is just one little you know, area of, of, in the world. But oceans are huge. They make up the most, uh, you know, part of the of the entire globe, right? It's water. So, but look on the right picture and you see that it's like soap, right? Doesn't it look like soap, right? So when you go wash your hands and you lather your hands really well and then you see a bunch of soap in the sink, that's what this looks like. It's light, it's airy, it has no weight, which means it's not something strong, right? It's not something strong. So the Prophet used them use this analogy to say, we're going to be a lot. There's going to be a lot of Muslims. And right now there's about almost 8 billion people in the world. And one, I think about 1.5 or 1.6 billion Muslims in the world. So we are one eighth, one eighth of the world population. And mashallah, Muslims are in every part of the world. Okay. We're not just in certain parts. We're everywhere. But even though we have that many numbers, are we as strong? No, we're not. We're like the foam of the ocean. And why? Because too many of us are afflicted with the disease of hubba dunya. Okay. And what is hubba dunya? Here we go. This is hubba dunya. You wanting all of the best of the best of the best of the best. You want a huge house. You want the nicest car. You want gold and jewelry and money and the you know eating the most lavish meals and all the nicest accessories you just keep wanting and wanting and wanting that you it starts to make what in your heart greed right it builds this other disease of the heart greed where it's just never enough right and this is kind of what we talked about on tuesday wantonness wantonness is you can't control your desire for things you become prideful so these all these diseases kind of you know, affect each other. If you have wantonness or love of the dunya, you're probably going to share a lot of the same qualities, which are that you just keep wanting more and more and more, and you start to have, so you have greed and you start to have pride, right? So these are the dangers of, of, of uh, having hubba dunya is that it makes you keep, uh, it, it leads to these other dangerous diseases, right? Greed and pride. So again, we're looking at, you know, extra when you when you're doing when it's out of balance, it's excess, it's too much. Habadunya is when that desire for these things takes over you. Okay, and so let's look at again the other consequence of habadunya because not only do you get more greedy and prideful, but you're probably going to be, become very forgetful. So this is the danger, is that if you spend all your day daydreaming about money and about all the nicest clothes and food and the big house and the fastest car and just all of that stuff, you're going to start to forget certain things that are very, very important. Number one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, this is the problem. This is what shaitan wants. Shaitan, remember, he's our greatest enemy. So he wants nothing more than for us to forget Allah, forget our prayers, forget the Prophet ﷺ. And so what he does is he distracts us by making the world look so shiny and like exciting and fun, 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 that that's all we want. We just want to have fun and just have the best of the best things. So people afflicted with this disease of the heart, this is what they do. They'll just sit home and they'll just be thinking about all these things. But then guess what happens? They forget to pray. They forget the Prophet them, right? They forget Allah. They forget to give charity because they're too worried about making money for themselves. Um, they, they don't want to fast because they want to eat all the best foods and just spend, you know, all this money on, on the best experiences, going to the fanciest restaurants. They forget to go to the masjid. They forget to study and to learn, right? We're supposed to learn every day of our lives. We should be learning something, right? They don't spend time with their parents. They forget to take care of their family, pay their debts, because usually you can't keep this lifestyle. If you have hubba dunya, you start to get credit cards and start borrowing money. And so you get debt, okay? Debt is when you owe people something. So a lot of uh, people with 
this disease also have wantonness, which is the same, which we talked about too, that it makes them go into debt. Okay. Um, they also forget to stay in touch with their friends, take care of their responsibilities, take care of the earth. They don't care about taking care of the earth because all they care about is wanting whatever they want. Right. And that's why uh, they'll spend a lot of money on clothes and other things, not realizing that the more money you spend on things, the more it causes, you know, pollution in the world, right? We, we There's a lot of pollution that happens because of factories and all of the, you know, cheap materials that, that go into making certain products. So as a Muslim, we have to, what, be more responsible with our spending and not just keep spending, spending, spending. And then the last thing, uh, or another thing is death. You don't remember death. And that's the very thing that you should be remembering to protect from this disease of the heart, right? So very important to know the consequences of love of the, of, of the world. Now, um, the next thing to remember is the, you know, the treatment. How do we treat this? Well, we said remembrance of death, right? That's one of the ways that we can treat this. The Prophet said, remember often the destroyer of pleasures, okay? And he meant by that death, that death destroys pleasure. And so all those things that we Taught, uh, that we showed in that picture, they're all things that are nice. Nobody's saying they're not nice. But again, if it takes over you the desire to want those things, and all you care about is having things and, you know, just being uh, seeking out whatever desires you have, then it's a problem. So the best way to remedy that or to fix that is to remember death. Okay. And then also another treatment is being balanced in how to love the world and all that it contains in a way that's pleasing to Allah. Because the opposite of, or the, you know, loving the world is not necessarily a problem in and of itself. It's when you love the world to a point that you love it more than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, more than other things, right? You just keep wanting more of the dunya and you don't want to ever leave the, the dunya because you want to extend your life as much as possible so you can eat, drink, go on vacations and just have a lot of fun, go to parties, wear fancy clothes. That's the problem, right? So there is a way to have a balanced love for the world and that's part of the treatment as well. Okay, and here it is. So first we have to understand that there are five categories of love of the world, okay? So there are things that we have to love, obligatory, wajib, uh, recommended, mandub, permissible, mubah, reprehensible, makruh, and forbidden, haram. So basically what this is, is every single thing in the dunya can fall under one of these categories, right? For example, something that you should love is what? The Quran, right? The book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi things that we have in this dunya, right? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi himself, the Kaaba, there's, you know, the, the Masjid al-Nabawi, uh, basically any house of Allah or any good place, we should love those things, Right? And then there's the recommended, right? The permissible, what you can like, what you can uh, love. It's permissible, for example, to love certain uh, foods or even like we talked about on Tuesday, if you have a love for really nice, expensive things, that's not a problem. It's if you don't have a balance with that love that you would be willing to harm someone to get that thing, right? Let's say, for example, you go to a store and you see a watch and this watch is so beautiful and you're like, oh my gosh, it's the most beautiful thing in the world. I want this watch, I want this watch, I want this watch, okay? Now, if you go back home and you look at your piggy bank or you go and you ask your parents like, hey, mom, dad, I wanna do some chores in the house because I really wanna purchase this watch that I love. Uh, what chores can I do? And then they tell you, okay, you can do this, this, and this, and you start saving your money, right? There's nothing wrong with if you saved your money and you said, I'm going to go buy, uh, buy that watch because it's a nice thing and you worked hard for it, right? But if you wanted that watch and then you thought about it and you said, oh man, it's like $500. I'm never going to make $500. How can I get this watch? What can I do? And then, you know, shaitan will come 
and he'll kind of give you an idea. He'll say, I have an idea. Go to the store and distract, you know, the, the person at the checkout place and just go grab it real fast, right? This is how shaitan works. He comes and he whispers to us things, right? So he might put that thought in your mind and now all of a sudden, astaghfirullah, you have what? This is iniquity, right? This is causing harm because of your desire. The desire is so much, you can't help yourself. You're willing to harm someone or something for it, right? So we have to be very careful of that. But as far as wanting the watch, that's perfectly fine, right? Um, something reprehensible or makru would be, for example, to uh, delay your prayers, okay? We should pray on time. When the prayer comes in, as soon as you know that it's dhuhr, asr, maghrib, you should pray. If you make a habit out of delaying your prayers, this is not permissible, or it's reprehensible, it's makru, it's disliked, okay? It's not haram, it's not, you know, uh, it's certainly not, uh, you know, recommended or permissible, it's makru. So you have to know the difference, that everything in the world falls under one of these categories. And then the forbidden we know are haram. You should not like, you know, alcohol or eating certain foods that you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forbidden, right? That would not be very good at all to, to, uh, to love those things which Allah dislikes. So love of the world is about having balance, about understanding that everything in Allah's creation falls under one of these categories, okay? And then the Prophet said, I'm warned, because remember, we're, when we talk about love of the dunya being a disease of the heart, that does not mean that the answer for it is to hate the dunya. No, no, no. Astaghfirullah. The Prophet actually told us and warned us, do not curse the world. The for God created the world and the world is a means to reaching the knowledge of God. So what he's saying is that don't think that you know, the opposite of hubba dunya is to have a bad view of the world and to be like, oh, I hate this place and I want to leave and I can't wait to go to Jannah. And you have a very bad opinion of the dunya. No, we should have balance. There's good in the dunya and there's harm in the dunya. And we love that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves and we don't love that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't love. That's how we look at the dunya, and that's balanced. People with hubba dunya, they don't have balance. They love too many things that distract them from the worship of Allah. That's why it's a disease of the heart. But to say, I love Allah's creation, I love the sun and the stars and the moon and the parks and the rivers and the lakes and the trees and the oceans and the beaches and the good delicious fruits and the vegetables and the beautiful animals, that's actually very good. We should. We should be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the beauty of the dunya that he's placed us in. Because he could have placed us in a dry planet like Mars, right? Mars is dry. There's no, barely any water there. It's like a giant desert. He could have put us in a planet like that, but he put us in this big huge, beautiful, basically garden, right? That it's so amazing. And there's just so many things that we can uh, appreciate uh, when we look around all the colors that we see and the different variety of animals, as we said, right? And flowers and flora and, and trees. These are all reasons that we should have what immense gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the balance is so important to treat hubba dunya. You have to have a balanced view and the best thing to do is just to say, I'm going to love everything that Allah loves. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is what? The most beautiful and He loves beauty, beautiful things. So we can always uh, love that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. And He He dislikes uh, foul things, you know, things that are not good. So we should also dislike things that are not good. Okay? Very good, alhamdulillah. So that was the second disease. The third disease is called envy or hasad, okay? What is this? This is a huge disease of the heart, okay? And a lot of people are afflicted with hasad. What is it? It is a form of uh, jealousy, which we're going to clarify because sometimes envy and jealousy are used to, to define hasad, but they are slightly different. But before we do that, let's look at what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says specifically about this disease. He, in chapter 4, verse 54, he says, Or do these people envy 
what Allah has bestowed upon them from his bounty. Okay, and we'll again explore what that word means. And then he says, seek refuge from the evil of the envier when he envies, right? And this is, we all know this, uh, this surah, right? قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقْ Right? It, we, inshallah, we all know this surah. This surah is describing the envier, okay? And then the Prophet ﷺ said, stay away from hasad, from envy, for hasad, eats up good deeds like fire eats up wood. So I want you to imagine that, okay? When you go put a fire somewhere, if you've ever been camping or if you have a fireplace, as soon as you put that firewood in and you light it up, what happens to the wood? It starts to crackle, right? And then very quickly you see it, just there's smoke and then all of a sudden there's this roaring fire. If you come back and check on that after a few minutes, part of it will be gone. The wood is turned into ashes, right? So here he's warning us that having hasad, which is a type of jealousy, and again, we're gonna define it in a minute, is so bad that it eats up good deeds like fire eats up wood. So uh, let's understand the difference between envy and jealousy, because like I said, it's usually used a lot the same way. Um, and jealousy or envy is the desire to have something that's not yours. So basically, let's say you go to school, okay, or you're at the mall or you're at the masjid or wherever, and you see someone who looks your age, okay, maybe they're 15, 16, maybe they're 12, 13, but another person who looks your age and they're the same as you. If you're a boy, he's a boy. If you're a girl, she's a girl. You look at them and they're wearing a shirt that you like. Maybe it's got something on it that you like too. Maybe if you're into Legos, the shirt is on Legos, or maybe it's got unicorns and butterflies on it, but whatever, whatever you see this person who's the same age as you wearing, you really like what they're wearing and you wish you had it, okay? Now, it's not yours, right? And you don't want that. So envy is like, you don't want them to have it. It's like, why do they get to have that? That's not fair. I want that. Um, it would look better on me. And you start having all these really, really bad thoughts. That's envy, right? It's spite. It's basically this desire that turns into this resentment uh, towards the other person, okay? Where you just really don't even like that person anymore and you wish they didn't have it because it bothers you. It bothers you that they are wearing it and that you're wearing something that is maybe an older thing or that you've had for a while or what it's not as exciting so you the envy just turns the into your heart into this you know really resentful uh you know uh, thing that that you just can't think anything positive about that person right now jealousy is an emotion right and it typically refers to the negative thoughts and feelings of insecurity fear and anxiety over an anticipated loss of something. So if you're worried about losing something, that can be jealousy, right? Like, oh, I wish I didn't, uh, you know, I, I, I uh, like if you're comparing yourself to somebody else that they have something, but it's not that you necessarily want them to not have it. You just wish you could have it too. Or if you already have it, you're, you know, you wish that you didn't lose it. So there's these it's a different feeling. It's not about the person themselves that you're looking at. It's just about your own insecurity. That's jealousy, right? But envy is actually wanting the other person to lose what they have. So it's not just that you like it and that you want it for yourself and that you're insecure over it. It's that you actually want that other person to not have it anymore. And that's why it's so much worse. So envy is much worse than jealousy, right? Jealousy can just come from, like I said, so many different things that uh, may happen to you. And it may not even involve another person. It's just uh, something that you want, right? Whereas envy is directed towards another person. And that's why it's so dangerous. Okay. So what's the treatment? Well, first again, and we see the same thing keep coming up. If you notice most of the diseases of the heart, the treatment is almost all of it. The ones that we've learned so far is remembrance of death, right? Why? Well, one of our, uh, the Sahaba Abu Darda said, he who remembers death often 
then his delight becomes less and his enviousness of others diminishes. So people who remember death a lot, they just stop really caring about what other people are doing, what they're wearing, how much money they have, what clothes, you know, uh, what kind of car they drive. They don't care because they're more worried and more concerned about the next life right? That's what the remembrance of death does. It makes you focus on what's important and you stop worrying about other people. And you realize like Allah subhanahu wa is the one who distributes. That means he's the one who gives everybody whatever that he wills for them. So for some people, they're going to have a lot of money, but guess what? Having a lot of money is a big responsibility. And if you don't do what he expects of you, you're going to have a lot to answer for, right? So it's not always so exciting if you think of it that way. Uh, for other people, he might have given them knowledge and he expects that they teach and use that knowledge to teach other people, right? So every the, everything is given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He gives to people according to what he wants. And therefore, there's no reason to be jealous because you have certain things, blessings that other people don't have, right? We all have things that not everybody else has. So the best thing to, thing to do is not focus on what other people have, but rather focus on what Allah's given you and be grateful for it. And remember again that death, when it comes, you don't take anything with you except for your qalbun salim, right? That's all we should want to take with us more than anything else. We want that sound heart, right? But nothing else really matters. So that's why the remembrance of death is so good. And then Imam al-Ghazali also said what? And this is to help clarify, right? Because not everybody who has these feelings is afflicted with the disease itself, right? So he said that if someone hates envy and is ashamed that he has it or she has it in her heart, then that person is not really an envious person. So if you've ever felt that way about someone where you might have felt envy, maybe you went to someone's house and their house was bigger than yours. Maybe um, you know you saw someone at school and their car, they came, their mom and dad came and picked them up in a really nice sports car. And you were like, man, I wish my parents could have that. You know, if you've ever had those feelings, but then later you realized, or maybe you're realizing right now, as we're talking about this, that those feelings aren't good to have and you feel bad about it. Like it's, it's like, oh, astaghfirullah, I wish I didn't think that about that person or that thing. That's a really good sign. It means that inshallah, you don't have envy because it's natural sometimes to just see something that someone else has and like it. That's okay. It's, but remember, envy is when you don't want the other person to have it anymore and you wish that they were to lose it. This is where it gets really bad, right? So if that feeling has ever come in your heart, all you have to do is say, Astaghfirullah, may Allah forgive me, and inshallah, try not to have that feeling again. And remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who distributes everything, right? Okay, so uh, one thing to clarify here is that there is an acceptable type of envy, and it's called ghipta, okay? And this is being competitive for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, okay? That's called ghipta, and this is perfectly fine. So there's the harmful envy, which we just talked about, and now we're talking about the acceptable form, but there's two particular things that you have to have a ghibta for, okay? So you can have ghibta, here is the hadith, there's no acceptable envy, okay, ghibta, except for two people. One who has wealth and spends it towards good causes, the other is one who has wisdom and teaches it to others. So what this tells us is that you can have this competitive, good uh, ghibta for a wealthy person because you see them that they're able to do so much, right? They're able to maybe build a masjid for the for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or, you know, give in charity to all these different really important causes. And so you look at them and you're like, oh, yeah, Allah, I wish I could have wealth too because if I had money, I would do this, that I would do that, and I would buy my mom a beautiful home and I would buy my father this and you want to just give your money for good right that is ghibta and that's perfectly fine and then the other type is when you see someone who has wisdom right they're knowledgeable 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them knowledge of the deen, or maybe they went to school and they were able to, you know, do really well in school and they're now working and helping so many people. You can have ghibta for that type of a person because what what you're doing is saying, well, if I had the same opportunity or the same blessing that they had, I too would want to do good works. So everything is connected back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with ghibta. It's not that you don't want the other person to have it. It's not because you have hubba dunya where you just love uh, power and money and wealth and status and all you're focusing on is wishing to have those things. This is about doing good to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that is permissible. So we can definitely have that. Okay, so inshallah, I think this is, yeah, that's the end of the presentation today, you guys. Uh, so let me stop here because I'm going to do about three a day. I don't want to overwhelm you guys. There's a lot of content, okay? So I want to make sure that you guys, you know, have uh, clear answers um, to your questions if you have any. So let's go ahead and use the remaining time that we have for Q&A. So inshallah, I hope you guys enjoyed the presentation today. We talked about uh, iniquity, right? Uh, we talked about um, dunya. We talked about envy, mashallah. So three um, diseases of the heart, but let's go ahead and hear from you guys. I'm going to check the chat box now. Okay. Bismillah. Wow, there's a lot of questions here. That's in here. Is it, okay for one to be is it okay for one to envy without knowing that they are envying? So very good, Bilal. I think uh, you asked that question and I answered it, right? If you have this uh, feeling and you're not aware of it, there's no responsibility on you, right? We're not held accountable for what we don't know. So if you ever had that feeling, then just say, Astaghfirullah, it's okay because you didn't know that you had envy. And now you're asking Allah to remove it from your heart. That, oh Allah, let me be happy with what you've given me and not worry about what other people have and actually be happy for them too, right? Because that is even better. If you are if you see someone succeeding, if you see someone have something, right? The Prophet ﷺ said that you haven't completed your faith, right? Until you love for your brother or sister what you love for yourself. So if you want really strong faith like Iman, and then you want to be happy for when you see someone else have something. Say, Alhamdulillah, that's great. Allah gave them that thing. That shows that you actually understand that it's more uh, important to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to be content with what he's given you than to ever let these feelings of hasad and jealousy enter your heart where you, um, you know, want a'udhu billah harmed on someone else just because you can't control your own desire, right? The desire is so strong that you actually would want someone else to lose it. That's why it's just not right, right? Okay, so let's look at the rest of these questions. You guys have so many, mashallah. Um, okay, so someone asked, and this is a good question because it's important. What if you're scared of death and how to remember death? You know, being scared of death, especially for some of you who are younger, it's perfectly understandable. You know, you're just starting your life and all of a sudden you're being told about death, it kind of can seem like, whoa, you know, that's, uh, that's a little too much for me. And that's understandable. But we kind of have to look at this uh, from a different lens. When we say to remember death, that doesn't mean to get dark about death and just to start thinking about all the scary parts of death. It means to just think of it, death as a, like we're all travelers, right? And that's how you have to really look at yourself is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he created the soul to travel through different worlds. Okay, so before we were here, for example, where were we, right? Before we were born, we were with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then He put our souls into the womb of our mothers, and then we came into this world. So we we are, we've already been traveling, we just don't have a memory of that. So when you think about death, you want to just think about it like it's the next part of your travel, right? And it's not something to be scared about because you're getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as long as you have belief and iman, inshallah, then you'll be okay, right? That's the most important. Important thing, and that's why, alhamdulillah, your parents are doing their responsibility of teaching you your religion, of teaching you who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, of teaching you who the Prophet is, teaching you how to pray, teaching you how to 
uh, have all of these things, uh, to know all these things, inshallah, so that when you go to the next part of your travels, which for most of you, inshallah, is going to be a long, long way from now. So you don't want to think about it like, oh, it's going to happen tomorrow. No, we're just saying that death is a natural part of life. Everything is just kind of the cycle of this world, right? And so it, when the, our time comes, inshallah, it's just the next part of the travel. And then the final place, the final destination is inshallah going to be in Jannah, where we're all going to be together with our loved ones. And it's going to be the most exciting time. And uh, we can't even com- you know, compare anything to it. Nothing we've ever done in the dunya can compare to uh, what's going what's gonna to be waiting for us in Jannah. So you want to look at death like that. Like, well, if I want Jannah, I kind of have to go through this part part of the travel right i can't skip it um but that's it not to get dark about it okay and so i hope that answered your question let's see so there's a lot of good questions here mashallah um okay so very good question about killing a bug if it's annoying or in your house so there's a difference the example i gave was on the street minding its own business or at a park or in this you know schoolyard or in the sidewalk even right That bug is living its life. It's not a pest. But if a bug becomes a pest in your house or you're threatened by it, right? There's some very poisonous spiders, for example, um, and you're afraid. Is this going to bite me? Could it harm me? That's different, right? And in that uh, case, yes, you can absolutely protect yourself if you have to. Um, My boys, they're on the the chat here. We have this uh, plastic bottle. And it's called a spider catcher, okay? Well, that's what we called it. It's really just a plastic container from an old, I think, is it almonds? Maybe Yasin can go grab it. But it's basically just a container that we got from Costco. And uh, once the almonds or whatever was inside of it finished, then we put a label on it and it's called our spider catcher. So what we do is if we see a spider anywhere in the house, we quickly go grab the spider catcher and we scoop it up and we take it outside. That's what we do because we try to be very mindful about life in general. So if we see bugs that are not harmful or maybe that are, you know, that they're not moving fast and flying at you, you could easily scoop them up and we'll do that. But everybody's different. And I know some people are very, you know, they have phobia, right? Arachnophobia. That's a real thing. They can really get like you scream if they see a spider. You know, you have to preserve your life. And if you feel um, scared to that level, khair inshallah, but try to, again, um, if you can, not kill if there's no harm. That's the point of it, okay? As long as there's no harm, especially in nature. Like we should never kill things in nature. That's just really not right because that's not in our home. That's that those things are where there should be. Allah created the world for all of us to be in, right? And it's not fair to say, oh, I'm just bored right now. I'm gonna go squash a bug for no reason. Al the billah. This is actually completely forbidden. Okay. All right. So let's see. Um can you still okay Elizabeth is the first the first one Okay. Isn't a person going to become sad if they think about death? So I hope I answered that question, Aisha, because if you think about death as just death itself, yeah, you might be sad. But if you think about death as really just a part of the journey to Jannah, it's not so sad, right? So it's really the way that you think about death. Okay. But the point is, is when you remember death, what that's reminding you is, Watch it. Watch yourself, right? You're telling your nafs and shaitan, no, I'm not going to, um, I'm sorry, one second. How did that happen? Yasin? Okay. Yeah, sorry, you guys. That got, um, I don't know how that happened, but we are not uh, taking over the cameras, okay? Please, because this is being recorded. So uh, don't take over the cameras. Let's see here. Okay, bismillah. So back to the questions here. Um, my dad, there's a, uh, so I'm just going over because I'm getting some repeat questions here. These real diseases. And, uh, okay, so yeah, we do have someone who said, I'm naturally scared of spiders. Um, yeah, if you're really afraid that it's going to bite you, that's understandable, okay? Um, Okay. 
Yes. If you are, are um, you know, working with an animal and you accidentally hurt it, there's nothing that's okay. You know, as long as it's accidental, things, accidents happen, right? Sometimes you might uh, run into it or poke it and it gets hurt. Just, you know, try to take care of it because animals do have feelings, right? There's that beautiful story of once when the Prophet ﷺ was with his companions, they were out somewhere and he kind of left for a little bit. And what? Uh, and one of the Sahaba, he saw a bird's nest and he just thought, hmm, I want to go take it. So he just took a, a nest full of little eggs and chicks and he put it in his, you know, care, part of the caravan. And then they started walking and the Prophet ﷺ eventually joined them. And when he joined them, all of a sudden this bird from up top started flapping its wings really, really like vigorously, which is means like intense, right? And so he looked up and then the Prophet said, I remember one of his miracles is that he could communicate with animals. Very similar to, to who, which other prophet? Let's see who knows. Which other prophet could communicate with animals, right? But he could, uh, very good, mashallah, Hassan. So he could communicate like um, Prophet Suleiman. So he understood from this bird that, what was happening that someone, it's a mo mother bird, that someone took her babies. So then he immediately turned to his companions and said, which of you has hurt the feelings of this mother bird and taken its babies? And then that Sahaba was like, oh, sorry, it was me. And then he ordered him to put it back where he found it. So the Prophet says in the words that he used, he's telling us what? that animals have feelings, okay? That's really important for us to remember because they do have feelings. And so if you accidentally heard it, I used to have a cat and there were times where, you know, uh, we were playing around and she would scratch me and then I would kind of paw at her and we were playing. But if I ever felt like she, like I did something to her, I'd be like, oh, I'm sorry, Juju. You know, there's times actually she would sneak past me and I'd almost accidentally trip over her, you know, but I felt bad because I, you know, accidentally, I didn't know she was there. So you, we have to remember they're animals. We're going to be held accountable, um, but just to, to be, you know, nice enough to at least say sorry and to try to make them feel better. But as far as uh, it being a haram or a sin, if you do it on purpose, yes, of course, that's sinful. It's haram. But if it's an accident, inshallah khair. Okay? All right. So let's see. Um, very good question. I have a question about baghi. Is it where narcissism comes from? You know, um, potentially, what, you know, it could it could very well come from that. I mean, if you are willing to hurt other people for power, then it's likely that you have, you know, this problem that you, or this belief that you think you are better and more valuable, uh, you know, as a, as a human being than other people. And that's really the root source of narcissism, right? You think of yourself as better than other people and you're willing to hurt other people if you have to. So in a way, inshallah. All right. Um, so very good. All right. Thank you guys. We have come to the end of the session and you guys, a lot of your questions were, um, were very good questions. I think that I uh, thank you all for, for, um, participating. Mashallah. That was awesome. And, uh, we will have, um, inshallah, uh, let's see. Sorry. Let me check the date. The next class we have is going to be next Tuesday. Okay. So one week from, uh, well, no, today's Thursday. I was going to say one week from today, not one week, a little less than a week from today. We'll see you inshallah at the same time from five to 6 PM for the next three, maybe four sets of, uh, of, uh, uh diseases inshallah. Okay, so inshallah, we'll see you guys. Let's go ahead and end in dua. All right, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wal asr inna l-insan la fi khusr illa ladina amanu wa amilu salihati wa tawasaw bil haqi wa tawasaw bil sabr. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdika ashadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. All right, alhamdulillah. Thank you guys again. I hope you enjoyed the class. Inshallah, we will see you next Tuesday. All right. And if you have any further questions, hold on to them for me and come back next Tuesday. I'll, we'll get to them eventually. All right. Assalamu alaikum. Everybody wave. I'm going to go through the whole camera. Yay. I get to see all your beautiful faces. MashaAllah. Thank you for being here. Alhamdulillah. All right.
take care and have a wonderful, wonderful iftar, okay? For those of you who are fasting, and if you're not fasting, make du'a for your families, make du'a for all of us, okay? We need your du'as. Your du'as are very powerful, all right? All right, assalamu alaikum. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya'i wa al-mursaleen. Sayyidina wa maulana wa habibina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ala alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman kathiran. Again, assalamu alaikum everyone. Alhamdulillah, we are here for our third session of purification of the heart. Thank you for being here. I made a few announcements before we officially began to those who were here early, just to again, up to, uh, keep everybody uh, on the same page. We've switched over to the webinar format. So the chat box is open and I invite you to participate via the chat box. Uh, I'll ask you some questions right now because I want to begin inshallah and we'll begin like we did last time with a bit of a little bit of a quiz. Okay. So if you remember from last uh, two sessions that we had, uh, or if you have notes, maybe you want to take those notes out and quickly look them over. Okay. And the first question I have is who can tell me who the original author is of the text, the Arabic text that we are talking about here. Okay. Cause there's, and a person who lived 200 years ago, about 200 years ago. Uh, very good, alhamdulillah. So we have some answers, good job. So I'm just gonna make a slight correction because all of you have answered the same answer. So his name is actually Imam Al-Mawlud, okay? So a, a lot of you are responding Imam Mawlud, which is fine, it's like a quick way of saying it, but the accurate um, name is Imam Al-Mawlud, okay? Just wanted to clarify that, very good. So alhamdulillah, this is Imam Al-Mawlud's text and he lived about roughly close to 200 years ago. Um, who is the person who translated the, the book uh, from Arabic into English? What's his name? Very good, mashallah, excellent. Okay, and what, uh, where does uh, Sheikh Hamza, all of you mashallah who are answering Hadith, you were the first to come in, very good, and Shamina, second, Bilal, third. Awesome, great job you guys. Amen as well. Great job. And Layla, all of you are answering wonderfully. Uh, where does uh, Sheikh Hamza currently live? Where is he situated? What part of the world? Bay Area. Oh, there we go. We got Bay Area and then we got Yassine with the correct answer. Berkeley. Very good. So he's in Berkeley. Uh, does he have a special um, you know, place that he works at? And if so, what's the name of that place? Who can tell me the name of the place? Very good, mashallah. Amen, you came in there. And Hadith, is, Hadith you, you said Zaytuna, but Amen got the full answer for Zaytuna College. Very good. Awesome, you guys. So did Yusuf, Bilal, Yassin um, as well. Awesome. Okay, so next, um, we, we right away talked about the uh, a certain number of hearts. Who can remember the very first heart that we talked about? Okay, there were a certain number. Um, of hearts. You can tell me if you want the number of hearts, but what was the first one that we covered? Very good, mashallah. So Ismail uh, answered eight. Awesome. Good job, Ismail. And then Yasin came with the first heart as the dead heart. You guys are on it. Excellent. The first heart was in fact the dead heart. Very good. And what's the last heart called? If you can give me the Arabic name, even better. The last heart that we talked about. Very good. Amen came in with the sound heart. Awesome. And what's the Arabic of the sound heart? Mashallah. Sali, very good. Shamina, awesome. Great job, you guys. You guys are doing really well. Mashallah, tabarakallah. Okay, so um, we covered a few different, uh, you know, diseases already. Who can remember the very first disease that we covered? The first one. Okay, Yasin came in with miserliness. Very good. What's the Arabic? Bilal, you answered me before I even finished that question. You are awesome. Great job. And Hassan, very good. You guys know the Arabic terms. Awesome. Uh, what is um, the disease of the heart? Now I'm going to switch up the questions a little bit to so try to pay attention to the definition, okay? What is the disease of the heart where you're too, you can't control your uh, excitement and it makes you prideful. It makes you maybe want to spend on things a little bit too much. It's like you can't control it. It's too exciting. And that leads to uh, extravagance. Uh, very good. Awesome. Afnan. Great job. Wantonness. Very good. What is the Arabic uh, of wantonness called? 
Afnan again. Look at you. Mashallah. Very good. That's so exciting when you guys get it right like that. Awesome. Okay. So there's another disease of the heart. I want, I'm going to give you the Arabic term. I want you to quickly, okay. It's like lightning. Uh, you're going to type it out, the English of it. What is the English meaning of the word burud? Who can tell me? Burud. Wow, Afnan, man, mashallah, you are just ahead of everybody right now, huh? You're coming really quick, super fast. Mashallah, you guys are awesome. Okay, next, this is the disease of the heart where you harm uh, people or things for no reason whatsoever. You're just not having a good day and you, you, you feel like you can hurt something. Awesome. Bilal came in with it, with the word iniquity. Very good, Bilal. MashaAllah. Uh, who can tell me the uh, Arabic w w name of that? Oh, MashaAllah. Uh, Bilal, you were, what, you're, you're like right there with me. Huh? You know what I was going to ask, didn't you? Very good. We got Bilal, we have Ihsan and Afnan. You guys, all three of you got the word. It's Baghi, Baghi, right? Great job, you guys. I am so impressed, MashaAllah. Okay, this disease of the heart, the Prophet Sallallahu said in a hadith, he was worried that towards the end of time, we would be like the froth of the ocean. And he said we would have wahan in our hearts. And then the companion said, what's wahan, ya Rasulullah? And he said, this disease of the heart, what is it? Very good, mashallah. Ihsan Beg, awesome. Love of the world, hubba dunya. Now you're on it. See, that's what I love. Ihsan, you went with the English and the Arabic in one answer. Just pay attention, you guys. That's a really smart way of getting the full answer, right? He's showing me he knows both. Great job. Mashallah, tabarakallah. Okay, then we went on to another disease of the heart. This is when you see something in someone and you can't uh, control your desire for it and you actually want them to lose it. What is the Arabic of it? There we go, mashallah, excellent. So Yasin got this, Ehsan again came through, Bilal, Shamina, all of you, you guys got kind of all answered at the same time. It just came rolling in. Amen, Taslim, good job, awesome. Very good, alhamdulillah. Um, this is a disease of the heart that the Prophet ﷺ said, it consumes your good actions like fire consumes wood. What is the name of that disease of the heart? Let's see who was paying attention. It consumes your good actions like fire consumes wood. Is it jealousy? Ah, I kind of tricked you guys there and some of you fell for it, but Shamina, or I'm sorry, who, is the, who did I see? Aisha came through. It is envy, you guys, envy. Remember, envy and jealousy are kind of used, you know, oftentimes, uh, you know, to mean the same thing, but they are slightly different. Envy, you want the other person to lose what they have. Jealousy, you just want it and you're insecure about things, okay? So that's why where it comes from, whereas envy is just really, you know, about having it and wanting the other person not to have it. So very good. And Hasad, very good. Hadad, thank you, is the Arabic ver a word for envy. Excellent. You guys are really doing wonderful. MashaAllah, tabarakallah. Uh, what is, okay, this is the trick question, or not trick question. This is the bonus question. Let's see who can get the bonus. Okay, if you get this one, MashaAllah. Khalas, you're really paying attention. So let's say Ahmed, I'm just making up someone. Ahmed sees Bilal. And Bilal is memorizing Quran, and he's got Juz Amma memorized, and now he's on to the 29th Juz, and he's doing really good. And then Ahmed goes, man, I wish I could be like Bilal. He's got so much Quran memorized. Why can't I do that? I'm going to go find a teacher, and I'm going to do this. What is that called? Yes, Bilal got it, mashallah. How, per how perfect is that, right? Because Ahmed and Bilal, Bilal, you're, you're on it, mashallah. This is ghibta, okay? Ghibta is what? Ghibta is a good form of uh, jealousy, right? It's when you're competing for good things. So when you're trying to gain knowledge, what's the other reason that the Prophet ﷺ said you can have ghibta for? So if you're, it's good jealousy, right? It's good to compete with, with someone for this. So one is knowledge. What's the other thing? Who can remember? Come on, you guys can do it. You, you've been doing amazing so far. Wisdom and knowledge kind of go hand in hand, right? Because you have to be wise, you know, or if you have knowledge, hopefully you're wise, right? 
Um, okay, very good. Afnan, mashallah, it's what you you're gave is, I think, a pretty good answer. And Yusuf as well. Wealth or sadaqa, so the means to, um, to do things, right? So if you see someone who has a lot of wealth, you can have ghibta for that person as long as your intentions are good, right? You want to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so you have that jealousy like, oh, I wish I had that kind of money so that I could do a lot of good in the world, right? Like help orphans, right? This is a great uh, cause, right? Um, or uh, build a masjid. So there's a lot of uh, great great things that you could do with the money. And if you have ghibta for someone who's wealthy, that's okay. Or for someone who has knowledge. You guys are so amazing. Jazakumullah khairan. I love that you guys are paying attention and you're remembering stuff that makes me so, so, so happy. So may Allah bless all of you. Now, are you ready to start our third session? Because we're going to introduce you to three new diseases of the heart. You guys ready? Pay attention now, okay? Or, and take some notes if you uh, want to. But let, let me go ahead and pull up my presentation to make sure that we are ready. So I'm going to first screen share. Bismillah. And I sh you should be able to see my screen. And now we're going to go into presenter mode and boom. Okay, you guys see it, yeah? Inshallah, let me actually pull up the chat so I can see what you guys are saying. Um, so what do you guys see on the screen? You see week two? Alhamdulillah, Sister Hussain looks perfect. Okay, Alhamdulillah. Thank you, Jazakallah Khairan, Sister Amir. All right, here we go, ready? So week two, we had week one last week. We did two sessions. This is where we're at now. So we're going to cover these diseases this week, inshallah, okay? Uh, for today's session, I only did the first three uh, just because I I didn't have honestly enough time to prepare more and also number 10 is a big one And I want to kind of uh, focus on that a little bit more on Thursday So we'll get through the remaining uh, four inshallah on Thursday. Okay, but for today We're going to go over blameworthy modesty, which is hayat damim and then that is holding on to one's wealth uh, Oh, I'm sorry. Did I not? Oh, no I think I unfortunately forgot to um, uh, cut and paste the proper uh, column here on the right. Let me go back to the previous slide. I hopefully have it here somewhere. We're just going to do a quick rewind, rewind uh, to here. This is, uh, where did we go? Not here, here. All right, so we're going to go to number seven, eight, and nine. Okay, so my bad. I forgot. I didn't properly uh, cut and paste this definition part of it, so I apologize. So number seven. Blameworthy modesty is shyness or cowardice that prevents someone from addressing a wrong or inquiring about a need. So what does that mean? It means when you are too shy to act in the in a time where you should act. Let's say you're listening to a teacher like myself, or maybe you're at the masjid and there's a khutbah going on, and they say something that is... Um, not clear. Like maybe I say something too that's not clear. And then you're like, oh, should I ask or not? Should I say something? Should I raise my hand and go, teacher, teacher, I didn't understand that, right? Sometimes uh, our shyness prevents us from acting when we should. So we're going to talk more, but that's just a quick example of that, okay? Blameworthy thoughts. These are thinking about things that are prohibited, okay? Like if you're just letting your mind kind of wander on and you're just thinking about things you shouldn't think about, and we'll talk about what we mean with that, okay? But anytime you have thoughts that are just really pointless or it's a waste of your time, that would fall under blameworthy thoughts. And then fear of poverty. So that is when you're so afraid of you know not having enough food or wealth or material things that it creates this anxiety in you and it almost basically kind of destroys the way that you live your life, right? A lot of people, and it's somewhat kind of could be tied to miserliness because if you have a fear of poverty, it might lead you to become someone who's hoarding their wealth, right? Because it's like, oh no, I can't spend too much money because I, you know, I'm going to be poor or I'm going to not have a home to live in. Or And it, those thoughts can kind of just really take someone to a very dark place where they lose, you know, complete trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we're going to talk about those three diseases uh, today. So let me now fast forward really quickly. Let's see how fast I can go. Okay. And I'm going to click as fast as I can. Okay. But how fast was that? Ah, nope. Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> Wrong one. Okay. So here we are. We are on uh, again, blameworthy modesty. So first, before we even get to blameworthy modesty, let's be clear about what the word modesty means, okay? So Muslims, we know this word. It's a very big part of our 
faith, but sometimes we need to really have a broad understanding of modesty because it's not just about our clothing. Okay, a lot of times when we hear modesty, it's reference to dressing uh, modestly, right? But it's more than that. It's about being humble and not showing off. And when we say showing off, this obviously includes showing off our bodies, right? Which is why we dress, we cover, we dress modestly because we don't show off the things that are private, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us to be modest in the way that we dress. So it's about not showing off our bodies or our good deeds, skills, strengths, whatever gifts Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us, if he's blessed us with, if you're a modest person, you don't show off. Okay, why? Because you're confident. You don't have a need or a reason to be a show off. Someone who shows off, they're insecure, right? They're insecure. They feel like I have to show this because then I get attention. And if I get attention, it makes me feel good about myself. Muslims, we don't look to other people for attention. We look to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's the only one whose opinion of us matters. So we don't feel the need to walk around and strut our stuff and, you know, uh, show our skin because a lot of people in this culture, right, you see them all the blah. And as the temperatures get warmer, they start, you know, wearing inappropriate clothing, right? And when they do that, our job as Muslims, because we don't judge people, right? We do not judge people. We say that, Leave everybody to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I have actually a really good story that, that um, I'm going to share in a moment about not judging people. Um, but but, but when, when we see someone who's dressed in an inappropriate way, we show our modesty by what? Lowering our gaze, right? So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, tell believing men to lower their glances and guard their private parts, right? So you lower your uh, eyes so that you don't see things that are immodest. And you also cover yourself, right? You, you cover your area, private area. That is pure for them. God is well aware of everything they do. And then say to the believing women, oh, excuse me. Ah, where am I? Sorry, you guys. I'm butterfingers here. Okay. Um, ah, <laughs> I'm trying to move this uh, little chat box because it's in the way of the text. So I apologize. Okay. So say to the believing women that they should lower their gaze and guard their modesty, that they should not display their beauty and, um, and ornaments except what must ordinarily appear, right? Our hands, our face, uh, that they should draw their veils over their bosom. So you see where our hijab, we cover ourselves, right? This is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructs Muslim men and women to dress. We dress in a modest way, right? And I'm just going to quickly tell you guys a story that this really actually happened to me. I was once... Um, uh, at an airport, and this was a long time ago, where I was younger and I didn't know a lot of things, and I thought that you know I'm better than people because I was wearing hijab, and so I did. I kind of let my arrogance, self righteousness, which we'll talk about, right? Which sometimes you get a little too, uh, you think of yourself as better, and this is dangerous. It's a disease of the heart. But if you don't know it's a disease of the heart, then you can have it. So when I was much much younger, this happened to me where I was in hijab and I was at the airport. And I was waiting for my ride. And all of a sudden, I see this woman and she gets out of her car. You know, she's, uh, you know, when you're at the airport and you're waiting for people to pick you up, you have to kind of wait there and all these cars are coming and going. So she got out of her car and she was dressed very uh, inappropriately. She was wearing shorts, uh, very short shorts and like, you know, a tank top. And I just looked at her and I judged her. I did. I thought like, wow, why is she dressed like that? It's so wrong. And, and I had all these negative thoughts. And then subhanAllah, she ended up, it was kind of, a, it was a very strange experience for me because I'm just waiting there. I don't know her. She's a stranger, but she ended up closing the trunk of her car and she saw me and then she started walking towards me. So I'm like, whoa, what's going on? Why is this woman who's like a stranger walking to me, right? What is she going to say? And I'm like, you know, so I kind of was like a little like, you know, just paranoid, like what's going to happen now? All of a sudden, she comes and she stands in a very humbled state, very humble. She has her head down and she goes, Salaamu Alaikum. Uh, I know I'm not dressed very appropriately. Uh, you know, may Allah forgive me. I'm a Muslim. I'm a convert. And I'm raising my son to be a Muslim. I saw you and I was so happy because I thought maybe you can help me, give me some recommendations for children's book because I want to raise my son as a Muslim. So she's saying all of this stuff to me, subhanAllah, right? She's not dressed modestly. I'm dressed modestly, but this is where we look at the hearts, right? Her heart was in such a good state because she recognized her mistake. She was humble and she wanted to be better. 
but I let arrogance in my heart, right? I thought I was better and I was judging her. And then Allah, he's the one who made this whole event happen, right? She, I, there's no way I would have ever thought she was a Muslim, the way she was dressed. But Allah wanted me to have that experience because it did, it changed my mind about a lot of things. I, I started to really look at my heart more and say, oh, Sai, how could you have let your heart become so filled with arrogance that you walk around judging people because of the way that they're dressed, right? That's not for you to do. You, you don't judge people. We don't judge people. We, we know what's right and what's wrong, but we leave the, the judgment to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? There, he's the only one who judges. So when we say that, yes, we live in a society where a lot of people are not dressed appropriately, our job is not to look down on them because they don't know. Many pe times people don't know. This woman, she was a convert and she was trying to be better. So, you know, just like Islam took uh, 23 years to complete, some people, they take time getting a good habit. So we just have to leave the judgment alone. But what we do, instead of judging them, we turn our gaze away and we wish well for them that Allah guides them. Okay, so that's what this hadith is telling us to lower your gaze. Don't, you know, judge other people, lower your gaze. And I wanted to share that story so that you have an example of when sometimes it's not black, so black and white. You know, you might see a Muslim and think, oh, they're amazing. And then you see someone dressed like that and think, look at them. But if you really, you know, judge that situation, who was, who was better and who wasn't, right? She was much better than me. And that was a humbling moment for me. And I'm so grateful to Allah that he did that for me because it literally changed everything. My perception of everything was different then. I started looking at the diseases of the heart and realizing I had a lot of them. And that's uh, how I, uh, alhamdulillah, benefited from this amazing uh, science of, of you know purification of the heart. So alhamdulillah. Okay. So now what else uh, do we know about modesty? Okay. Here we have another hadith where Qura ibn Ilyas reported that we were once with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when modesty was mentioned to him. And uh, someone said, oh, Messenger of Allah, is modesty part of faith? And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, what? Rather, it is the entire religion, subhanAllah. So this is a very big part of being a Muslim. Then he said, verily, modesty, abstinence, reticence of the tongue, but not the heart and deeds are all part of faith. They bring gain in the hereafter and loss in the world. What is gained in the hereafter is much greater than what is missed in the world. So why did I put that phrase, reticence of the tongue but not the heart in yellow? Because this is telling us that reticence means when you're holding back, right? You're holding back. Um, we should hold back with our tongues when we, uh, you know, maybe there's a situation and that, that uh, you know, we don't like or, you know, that we, where the judgment might take over, we shouldn't comment, but not in our heart. Our, in our heart, we should be very clear about what's right and what's wrong, okay? And that kind of ties into what blameworthy modesty is. So let's uh, be a little bit more clear here. So again, modesty is something, a whole religion, every part of us, we should, uh, I mean, our part of our faith thing is, uh, modesty is a big part of that. But it, we have to understand that this, um, Quality has to be in balance, right, between one's spiritual heart and one's conscience. So here we have praiseworthy modesty activates the conscience, right, and protects the spiritual heart. It helps one to lower the gaze, protect the heart from being exposed to things that bring it harm. But blameworthy modesty impairs the conscience and by extension the spiritual heart. It prevents one from acting or speaking up when it is necessary, and it invites cowardice into the heart to become a coward, right? That's what blameworthy modesty does. You're, you're not very courageous when you have blameworthy modesty, and this is not part of our faith. We should be people of courage with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? So let's look again at some examples. So for example, as I said earlier, not asking questions about one's deen out of shyness. So if you're ever not clear about something, but because you don't want to embarrass yourself with your friends in the class, or you, you know, maybe in a situation where you don't know all the students, you feel a little awkward about talking, remember this. You don't want to have blame or the modesty. It's much more important that you speak up. And you don't have to speak up right then and there. Maybe after the class, right? You can go to the teacher and say, um, Mr. or you know, sister or brother or who, you know, Sheikh or Sheikha, um, I didn't understand when you said this. Can you please explain it to me? 
but not to be shy in the class. And then even after the class go, Oh no, I don't want to go up to the teacher and, you know, um, and, and have, uh, you know, this conversation with them. That's too embarrassing. Cause then it's like, I didn't know. And everybody else seemed to get it. And I don't want to look like I'm not smart and all of those thoughts. That's what blameworthy modesty is, right? When you sit there and you have this conversation with yourself that you're too worried about how you look in front of other people, um, and it prevents you from learning, right? And so at the bottom, you see this hadith here, Aisha, the prophet's wife, uh, may Allah be pleased with her, said, how excellent are the women of the Ansar? These are the women of Medina, right? They do not allow shyness to prevent them from asking questions and understanding the religion. So she's making an observation here that says what? That look at how amazing these women of the Ansar are. They uh, ask their questions. They're not clear about something. They're not going to go, oh, I'm just going to, that's okay. I'll pretend like I understood it, right? And it, this doesn't have to just be for religion. You know, let's say you're in a math class or you're in another class. Um, you know, you should, you know, have the courage to always, if there's a, some knowledge that's being taught to you and you don't get it, to uh, make that a priority instead of yourself, right? It's not about how you appear because very wise people are okay admitting that they don't know. Imam Malik, who was one of the great four imams uh, of, you know, of the schools of fiqh that we have, he was known to very commonly say, I don't know. When people would ask him questions, he would say, I don't know. And this shows not that he doesn't have knowledge, but the opposite, that he's actually very wise. And he had, I mean, he was very, very knowledgeable. He's one of the great imams, but he had the humility to know when he didn't know, right? And so we shouldn't let our shyness of not knowing prevent us from knowing. That's what blameworthy modesty is, one example. Another is not standing up for someone who's being wronged. So if you see a situation, let's say there's a bully, right? And he's bullying or she's bullying someone and you're just standing there. You know it's wrong, but uh, you can't find the courage to say something, right? Or to do something, to put a stop to it. We find this problem everywhere now in schools and in other places. A lot of um, people, not just youth, but like adults too, they freeze up and they don't say something when they should. And then they watch. And instead, unfortunately with phones now, they're recording it, you know? So it's like, here you watching someone get beat up in front of you. And instead of acting, you're just going to record the video. Like that's really not good. Right. Cause you're, you're not helping these people at all. The one who's doing the, the harming and the one who's being harmed, both of them need help. Right. And that's what Muslims are called to do. The Prophet Muslim told us we help, you know, the oppressed and the oppressor. And we help the oppressor by stopping him from being oppressive. So you want to separate people when they're fighting because, you know, the one is getting hurt, but the other one is also causing a lot of damage. So let's help both of them. If this happens, you know, especially with friends or people that, you know, you should be worried about both not having the courage to uh, stand up to an unjust person. So in the first situation, you're not protecting someone who's being harmed, but in the next situation, it's where you, you're not confronting that person who's doing the bullying, right? And saying, listen, what you're doing is wrong and you need to stop it. This is all, you know, part of, again, um, what, what can take over someone if they have blameworthy modesty. And then also not participating in something worth worthwhile and beneficial out of shyness. So this is similar to, um, you know, what we've talked about, which is you see something either that's harmful that you should address or that's beneficial, but your shyness prevents you from getting it, like the knowledge, right? Or let's say, you, you know, everybody, uh, all of your cousins and friends want to go somewhere and um, maybe you, uh, you're kind of like, let's say they want to go roller skating, okay? And you've never roller skated before. But the idea of it is like, oh, man, I don't want to do it because I, I don't know how to do it. And I don't want to go and embarrass myself. Um, so then you, you don't go. You end up going, no, I don't want to go. All because you let this shyness prevent you from actually benefiting. You're going to spend time with your cousins and friends. You might learn a new skill, but there's a shyness there that prevents you. That's blameworthy modesty. Okay. So hopefully this disease is clear. Now, how can we get rid of it? Or how can we treat it? Well, the first thing is that you put the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before anyone else, okay? You're always thinking, as Muslims, we're always, always, always thinking first, will this make Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala happy or will it not make him happy? That is it. 
with everything that you do from the moment you wake up until the moment you sleep, that should be your thought process in everything. Because everything we know as Muslims, our deen is complete. Allah's given us answers um, about everything through the Prophet's example. But our deen, we know right and wrong. And we know, and if you don't know, that's what you have your parents for and other people, you ask questions. But in your mind, you that's how you check yourself. And that's how you prevent shaitan from making you do things that are wrong. You have that question. Is this going to make Allah happy or not happy? And then you act, right? But this is how we should be. So if we start putting that into practice, you'll find that even if you're uncomfortable with something, if you're thinking, okay, if Allah will be happy with me, I'll do it. Then inshallah, that courage will start to grow in your heart because you're always thinking of making Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala happy with you, okay? And um, I see a quick question. I'm seeing the chat box, but I'm sorry, I'm not able to answer every question. But this one is an important one that I do want to talk about real quick. If you're scared of getting hurt, okay? Now, the word vulnerable comes from, uh, I think it's Greek or Latin, from vulnus, which means to be open to injury, okay? Um, and it, it means to be open to being wounded. Okay, that's why we're when we're ever in a situation where we're afraid to act, yes, that's part of it. We're worried. We're worried that we're going to be rejected or embarrassed or humiliated, all of those things, right? But part of the youth experience is you're kind of in a test phase of your life where you're leaving childhood and you're growing into becoming an adult. And just like every adult before you, all of us went through the same experience. And every child after you will go through the same experience where you have to kind of test things out and, and get better and better. It's like a practice sort of phase, right? So if you want to grow and kind of go through that process uh, you know, a little bit in a better way without too many uh, bumps along the road, then you have to say, you know what? There's a first time for everything and I got to try it. And I have to muster up the courage. And even if I'm worried about everything, it's okay. It's prob I'm probably making too much of a big deal out of it in my mind. Because if there's, you know, adults in the room, inshallah, they're all mature enough. They're not going to laugh at you or embarrass you or anything like that. Rather, they'll probably encourage you, even if things don't go your way. Let's say, like, go back to the roller skating example. If you're going to, if you don't want to go roller skating because you don't want to fall, right? I've, it's happened to me several times, even as an adult, you know, you can either fall and then make yourself feel bad and think, oh my gosh, I'm so embarrassing. And oh, why did I do this? I'm so a uh, failure. I don't even know how to roller skate. I have no coordination and let all those negative thoughts come in your mind or you can say dude I just roller skated for the first time and it's okay at least I had the courage to do it and even if I fell oh well people fall all the time even professional skaters fall there's people who've been at the Olympics and they fall so falling is just part of human human you know experience gravity is a force so it's not that big of a deal and instead of letting you know uh you know, shaitan or, or your own nafs make you feel weak, you want to say, you know what, let's just get back up and laugh it off. It's no big deal, whatever. You know, when I used to do it when I was a kid, I would always like if I tripped over something, I would always pretend like it was a new dance move. So I would just be like, oh, yeah, check it out. That was, that was just me being cool. And I would just say something silly. And then everybody would laugh, right? Because my attitude was I'm not embarrassed by this. I'm a human and it's okay to fall or have, you know, slip here and there. Even if you're talking, like I've been speaking publicly for a long time. Sometimes when you first start off, you, you get nervous and you're like, uh, 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 buh, 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 and you say things like that. It's okay because the more you do it, the better you get at it. And then you look back at those times, you just laugh like, oh yeah, that was me uh, practicing, you know, it was my practice runs and it's okay that, to have those experiences. So you got to get out of that mentality that, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm getting, I'm so scared of being looked at and embarrassed. Strong people are like, you know what? It's okay. It happens. Or, you know, I'm just going to keep trying to um, push forward. Okay. So thank you for that question. Now, another uh, thing to get rid of this is to ask questions when you don't understand something. Force yourself. Get into that habit. I don't get it. I need more clarity because you know what? It's not that you necessarily have a, you know, like you don't, you didn't understand it and you're, there's something wrong with the way that your brain worked. What if it's the teacher? What if the teacher didn't explain things correctly? I'm a teacher. Certainly we are not perfect. There's times where we don't do a good job explaining something. So the students are confused. That's our fault. That's not your fault. So what you want to do is if any time you don't understand something, ask with humility, right? Don't assume that the teacher just failed to explain it, right? Just 
ask with humility and say, teacher, I'm sorry, I didn't quite understand something. But remember that it might not be that you didn't understand it well. It might be that the teacher didn't explain it well. By asking with humility and adab, this is always good, you allow the teacher to correct themselves, right? The teacher will come back and, uh, and hopefully explain it better for you, inshallah. So, but find that courage to be, I'm going to ask that question, okay? And then practice more courage and use judgment when you see something wrong or an injustice. For example, you know, I said about the bullying thing. If you're seeing a situation where there's a physical fight, you don't have to jump in, okay? Uh, what I said earlier about stopping the fight and separating the people, I'm not saying to necessarily get into the fight and hurt yourself or get hurt. You don't need to do that. The judgment comes in to say, this is wrong. And instead of watching it happen and freezing, like, oh my gosh, this is, whoa, this is crazy. I'm just going to watch it. The judgment says, this is wrong. I need to go get an adult. And you, you're the one that leaves your backpack, tells a friend, watch this. I have to go run. And you go get the nearest teacher and say, teacher, teacher, come here. There's a fight happening. That is being a, a wise person because what you're doing is saying, I don't want to just let this happen and unfold and have an injury and someone really get hurt. You know, there's been some really terrible accidents, um, you know, recently, like last year, I remember reading a story about a, a fight that happened at a school and one of the students was unfortunately killed. He actually died because when the, the other student hit him, he fell and on a, something like a cement a piece that was very hard and his head hit it really hard and he was injured and then he eventually died. So you never, God forbid, want to let people in that type of a situation get all the black carried away. But imagine you can save lives just by going and getting an adult. Okay. So that's what courage does. And that's uh, the opposite of this quality of blameworthy modesty. So inshallah, that's the first disease of the heart. We uh, need to move forward to the next one. So let's go ahead. This is gonna. Um, this is about the next uh, disease of the heart. So, did you know? Sorry, let me move this. I don't know if you guys can see all of everything on my screen, like the chat box and everything. But if you can, sorry. So, did you know that the average person? Average person means you know you can't obviously go around um, asking every single person on the planet. So, what we do is we just kind of take a, a, a poll and then determine how many people from that group of people this would apply to. So, the average person has about twelve thousand to sixty thousand thoughts per day. That's a lot of thoughts, right? If you think about it from the moment you wake up until you sleep, you're thinking all the time. Your brain never really shuts off. Even when you're watching something like on TV or uh, playing uh, a game, your well, for playing a game, your brain is definitely active. But if you're doing something more passive, like watching a show or a, a film, your brain is very active because it's understanding everything. It's processing everything. It's taking all those images in, right? So there's a lot of activity and thoughts that are happening. But of those thoughts, this is what's really fascinating. 80% are negative. SubhanAllah. Isn't that sad? This is why is that the case? Why is that the case that 80% more than 50% of our thoughts are negative thoughts, right? They're not good thoughts. Well, we have, we know from our tradition, shaitan is real, right? He, he is the whisperer. He likes to uh, take away good feelings, good thoughts, good experiences, even our prayers, right? When we stand up for prayers, he loves to distract us. And suddenly we're thinking about things that we weren't even thinking about at all because he likes to just put all those thoughts in our mind. So 80% of those thoughts are negative and then 95% are exactly the same repetitive thoughts from the day before. So we tend to think about the same things over and over and over and over again. This is the human being. This is why, you know, we say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us with these, you know, issues and we have to do the work of uh, purification of the heart and of, of the, you know, of the, uh, of the mind and of the tongue and all of the things that we have. We have to purify uh, our thoughts. We have to purify these things and there's ways to do that inshallah. Okay, so let's look here. Next slide. Um, so what are specific things that we shouldn't think about? Okay, because negative thoughts can fall under a lot of different categories, or, you know, we could cover a lot of things, but we're going to talk specifically about two things. First thing that blameworthy thoughts, the thoughts that are not good, are thoughts that are about the nature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, okay? Okay. Um, 
we have Allah Subhanahu has revealed himself to us through the 99 names the asma al husna which are the attributes of Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala and of course we have the Quran which are his words and only his words and then we have the hadith qudsi which are uh, sort of like they're revelations that Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam they're not in the Quran they're in the hadith but all of these things are Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala teaching us about who he is right so for us we only base our knowledge of Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala on what he's revealed to us but sometimes our mind can start wandering and we start imagining things and we think about things that are not good to think about with relation to what does Allah look like and how is he all of those thoughts are we have to turn those thoughts off because there's uh, Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala says laysa uh, laysa kamithlihi shay right which is what there he, there's nothing in creation that is like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, okay? Nothing in creation, which means that no, there's no way that we can try to imagine Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in our mind because everything in our minds is from what we see and what we know in the universe, right? So it makes no sense to try to think about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he's told us that there's nothing that you can even come close to that would be similar to him. So don't even try, but have the hope that inshallah, we're going to inshallah see him in the next world. That's why we want to go to Jannah. The greatest uh, prize that we could possibly have is uh, to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Jannah. Okay. So this is why it's so important that you just Turn off that thought and say, I'm not going to have those thoughts about Allah. I'm going to wait for the great prize of seeing him in Jannah. So that's the first thing that we want to, you know, again, address. And then the other thing is to think bad thoughts about other people, like their faults, right? Um, a lot of times people will just waste their time thinking about other people, whether it's a stranger or someone you know. If you're just wasting your those precious thoughts for 60,000 thoughts and you're thinking about things that you shouldn't, this is the this is the what falls under um, blameworthy thoughts, right? And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said here, he said, there is a tree in paradise reserved for people whose own faults preoccupied them from thinking about other people's faults. So subhanAllah, if you spend more time on your own self and trying to fix yourself than you do thinking about, oh, why does this person dress this way? And they have such a bad habit and look at, you know, or they, you know, they play uh, basketball like this, or, you know, we can get very judgy about what people do, right? We'll pick apart everything about them. Um, that's haram. You shouldn't do that, right? We talked about this a little bit, I think, last time where we said there's ghibat uh, in the heart, ghibat al-qalb, where you actually can, you know, have bad thoughts about people in your heart. And this is ghibat, which is, you know, gossiping and, and, and uh, it's really one of the worst sins. So um, we want to stop that, right? And Allah, the Prophet promised a tree, a special tree in paradise for people who are more worried about their own situation. So alhamdulillah, really important for us to think about. Okay, so... Next slide here. So how do we um, treat the this disease of the heart? What's the way to fix it? Well, we study the 99 attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, commonly referred to as asma al-husna. We should know the 99 names and try to really understand their meanings. And you can ask your parents questions, like maybe one uh, attribute every day, you know, and then uh, in 99 days, you'll know all of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's attributes, or if you want to do more than one, but you can really make it a very good exercise of um, just getting closer in your or better understanding of who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, right, by studying them. And then um, remembering again, as we said, that beyond our abilities as human beings to really capture Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, so we shouldn't even bother. But at least if we try to connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through his attributes, it will deepen our love for him. And it'll help us to, again, follow his commands and prepares us for the hereafter where we hope to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, and finally, all the questions that you have about, well, this doesn't make sense. And I never understood this. You can ask him then, inshallah. You know, we just have to be patient. And then Imam al-Ghazali said, sorry, uh-oh. Ah, here we go. Sorry. <laughs> Imam al-Ghazali said that the way to ward off distracting thoughts is to cut off their source. Uh, avoid the means that could create these thoughts. If the source of such thoughts is not stopped, it will keep generating them. Okay. So there are some things that um, 
and that, uh, you know, or some people sometimes that make you have bad thoughts about other people. And you have to, you know, have, don't have blameworthy modesty, right? You have to tell that friend, maybe, you know what, maybe we shouldn't make a talk about people because it's not good. That's really good. You're showing courage to tell that person it's wrong and you're preventing yourself from falling into bad habits and cutting it off from the source. So sometimes that's what you need to do. There's also other, um, you know, like television can be bad music can be there's bad elements in television bad elements in tele and music so if you're getting thoughts because of a certain show that you're watching or uh, music that you're listening to stop very simple because if you don't then those thoughts will just keep coming back right you just kind of have to cut them off at the source like you know what this is making me not feel good or i don't feel positive after this so i need to really you know stop this stuff inshallah Okay, so that's how we uh, correct this disease of the heart. So the next one is, let's see here, listen to that. Um, the next disease of the heart is fear of poverty. Okay, khawf al faqr. So let's talk about what this is. Well, first, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to us in Surah Al Baqarah, He says, Those who in charity spend of their good deeds by night and by day, in secret and in public, have their reward with their Lord. On them shall be no fear, nor shall they grieve. So Allah Subhanahu is telling us right here: whoever does, you know, good deeds, we spend in charity, and we do our, uh, you know, our good works in in secret and in public. Maybe there's times where we want to show good works because we want to encourage other people, but then there's other times where we just go more inwardly and it's more private. In both of their situations, our reward is with Allah. And he is telling us, we, if you do these things and you do them the right way, the way that the Prophet have taught us, you won't have any fear. There's nothing to be afraid of because you understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always with you, right? And that he's the one who uh, blesses us and, and he, he gives us uh, all of our risks, our food, our water, our clothing, our shelter, our families, all of the things that we have are from Allah. He distributes them to everybody. And until the day, until we leave this earth, we will have our sustenance, our portion, right? Some people get more in this world. There's people who get more, more wealth. Uh, and some people don't, but everybody gets what is what Allah decides for them. And we have to respond by being patient and uh, grateful. That's so important that we're grateful for whatever Allah has given us because all of it is a treasure, right? And so here the Prophet said, charity does not decrease wealth. No one forgives another, but that Allah increases his honor and no one humbles himself for the sake of Allah, but that Allah raises his status. So charity does not decrease wealth. When you are a giving person, um, you should know, especially if you give in charity, that you, you're you not just because the money's leaving your hand, right? It's like, oh, here's $100 and I have to give it to this you know organization or this poor person on the street. It might feel like you lost $100, but you didn't. This hadith is telling you you're actually gaining more and the reward will come. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring that $100 back and more to you at some point. And I've had this happen to me so many times, I can't even tell you, where you know you give for the sake of Allah and then all of a sudden it is, uh, it's, it's, he repays you maybe the same day. Uh, you know, two, three, four times that amount, right? And I've had people have the same story. They've written a check and then in the mail, like the next day, they get the exact same amount for that check. That's happened to people before or twice uh, the amount, you know? So subhanAllah, we should never despair that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always with us and he repays generosity with generosity. Remember that. He repays generosity with generosity. So the next slide here. Remember that when you have khawf al-faqr, the problem is, is if all you think about all day long is money and it's all you see, right? And it's you're just afraid of losing it. Then what happens is you're likely not going to do your obligations to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or your family. You're probably not going to be very good with your prayers. You're certainly, um, you know, won't be good with zakat and giving away sadaqah. You might not even want to go to on hajj because you're too worried about how much money it's going to cost you. Oh man, it's cost like $4,000 to go to hajj. I don't want to do that because what if I, you know, don't have enough money for next year or this, and you start thinking about all these things. So it prevents you from doing good deeds. And even your prayers, because if you're afraid of, uh, uh, you have khawf al faqr you might work overtime. And let's say you work so much that you forget to pray. 
because you're too worried about getting money. So this is the problem with being obsessed with money and not remembering that Allah is the one who gives to everybody and everybody will get the, what they deserve. Nobody will take away, if Allah is destined for you to have something and He, it's written, nobody and nothing can prevent it from coming to you. So you just have to have that trust, right? But this is the danger of letting greed uh, or, you know, a khawf al faqr which can sometimes lead to greed, enter the heart, okay? <clears throat> so uh, another thing to also remember, excuse me, <clears throat> is this uh, verse from the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, take from their wealth a charity by which you cleanse them and purify them and invoke blessings upon them. What does this mean? It means that Whenever we give charity, it actually cleans our wealth for us, okay? So I'm gonna explain a little bit more what that means. Um, where did that, oh, here we go. So this was supposed to be before the other one, but it's okay. So if you see this uh, cute, adorable little uh, boy, I'm thinking, boy, maybe girl, cause she's got earrings on. Hmm. So let's just assume, boy or girl, either way, it doesn't matter. What is, uh, let's, you know, he doing, right? He's washing these, these clothes, okay? He's washing them with his hand. Most of us, we probably have never done this because our parents are taking care of our laundry. They put it in the washing machine. It comes out magically clean, right? But if you really think about it, when we play, right, on the left side, let's read. Sometimes when we play, we get our clothes dirty in the mud. Sometimes when we eat, we get stains on our clothes from food. Or when we work on an art project, right, we get some paint or glue or glitter all over our clothing. When we cook or bake, right, there's egg splatters, oil splatters, you know, flour, and our clothes can get really messy, chocolate, right, uh, whatever it is we know that we have to wash our clothes to keep our bodies clean and the rest of our clothes clean. Because otherwise, if you leave that dirt or that filth on your clothing, it might gonna get on something else, right? So we understand that when it comes to our clothing. Well, with our money, with uh, it's the same concept, that there's parts of our money that we're not always sure, is it coming from a halal source? You know, is there anything that maybe this money was involved in at some point that wasn't clean? Let me clean my money. Let me clean my wealth, right? Just like this boy is vigorously, you know, scrubbing away the, the, the dirt from the clothing. And how we do that is through sadaqah and charity. When we give part of our money for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah says it purifies the rest of our wealth. So whatever else we have saved is clean, even if there was something, you know, that maybe wasn't um, halal in part of that wealth, right? So this is how charity works. It helps to clean our wealth, and it's such an important part of that, right? Um, so let's see here. Uh-oh. So here's the treatment, okay? So how do we treat uh, for fear of poverty? First, we have a good opinion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we remember that he is the one who, again, distributes to his creation whatever he wills, right? And we should have trust in him. Uh, he has no need for anything that we do, right? So even when we give for the sake of Allah or anything, we should remember Allah has no need for any of that, right? And he says here in the Quran, uh, chapter 51, verse 57, he says, I do not desire from people any provision, right? Which is anything, nothing. Nor do I desire that they feed me. So nothing we're doing is increasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is above all of this, everything, right? He's not a human. He doesn't have needs the way we have needs. So when we do something for his sake, we have to put, uh, you know, remember that he, you know, we're not losing anything, right? Uh, we're actually gaining it because he has no need of what we give. And, that, and then the Prophet ﷺ told us that contentment is a treasure that is never exhausted. So we all want treasures, right? Everybody wants a lot of wealth and power and all of these things that we want, want, want. Well, the greatest thing that you can have is to be content, which is to be just grateful. Like, alhamdulillah. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you've given me um, a great life and I'm grateful for my health, for my family, for my, you know, pets, for my siblings, for my clothing, for my toys, for everything. You just start naming things randomly, right? My books, my school, my teachers, right? I'm grateful for my friends. So to be in a state of contentment, it's like this treasure that you just... Wow, there's so much of it, right? But you have to do that as an exercise. You have to think about all the things that he's given you and really sit there and go, wow, I have so much to be thankful for, 
right? Because there's a lot of people who had everything and then boom, something might have happened where they've lost things and they spend the rest of their life saying, you know, I wish I could have those things back. And they might be simple things that we take for granted, things that we don't even realize. You know, I remember like my teacher, uh, Sheikh Hamza, actually, he talked to us about, you know, think about like eyelashes, you know, how many of us have actually sat and thought, subhanAllah, we should be so grateful for eyelashes because they're so tiny, they're so small, and we have them, we were born with them, but they have a huge function because without eyelashes, um, things can get into your eyes. There's a lot of problems and then you can't see very well. There's people who have to constantly lubricate their eyes and keep them moist uh, because they don't have you know, protection from these eyelashes. So there's things that, uh, same with the hairs in our nose. The hairs in our nose are so important because they protect us from having problems when we breathe. But how many of us, you know, look to that and go, wow, thank God I have hairs in my nose, right? Because who thinks like that? But if you actually think about if I didn't have these hairs in my nose and all the green stuff inside of it that traps the dust particles, that's what those things are, right? The B word. You guys know what I'm talking about. People pick at them. It's ugh, gross. But anyway, it's another conversation. But those things are important to our health because if we didn't have those, then all of those, the dust that is in the air would go into our lungs and we'd be coughing all the time. So do you see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us with this incredible machine where if you start thinking about all of its parts, it's like, wow, 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 wow. Amazing. Even the heart, you know, how much blood it, it like uh, pumps out. I don't know how many gallons, hundreds of gallons of blood every day, or maybe thousands. It's a lot of blood that the heart is pumping through our system, but th it's like a machine. It's incredible. So this is what contentment does when you're grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It just opens this feeling of like, I have so much, I have a treasure already. I don't need more. And then you don't have fear of poverty, okay, inshallah. So that is the session for today, you guys, alhamdulillah. Um, those are the first, uh, the three that we're covering today. I want to hear from you. So we have a few minutes left, very few. I'll take uh, some questions if you have. I know there was a lot of conversation as we were going, um, but let's see if there's any questions about what we've covered. If you want to retype your question in a few minutes we have, I'm happy to um, to answer your questions, okay? Bismillah. And then just a heads up about next week. I think I have, um, let me see. No, that's, so next week we will go over, I'm not, sorry, not next week, on Thursday. Ooh. We'll go over ostentation, relying on other than God, displeasure with divine decree and seeking reputation. Heads up, just for FYI. But let me go ahead and stop screen share here and we can now talk, um, inshallah. Okay, so let's see here. Uh, questions. I'm going to get back to the chat box. How many sessions will we have, inshallah? Uh, well, thank you for asking, sweetheart. We have Thursday, next Thursday, uh, this Thursday, and then the following Tuesday and the following Thursday. So that's one, two, three more sessions after today. All together, six sessions. And if for whatever reason, um, we may need to add one more because we don't finish them all. I'll let you guys know uh, if the possible seventh session, but for now, three more sessions, inshallah. Okay. Okay, so quick questions here. Uh, what if you're terrified of losing something other than money? So very good question. Um, you know, if you're afraid of in this world, you have to remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if, if you ever lose something of value or important to you in this world, inshallah, you have the hope of, you know, be patient with that loss because there's, you know, nothing happens in vain, which means there's always a wisdom of why things happen to us in this world, always. And you have to remember that Allah knows what's best for you. So maybe in that loss, uh, something really good can happen, right? For example, I'll tell you, um, there, you know, there's that organization called uh, MAD, Mothers Against Drunk Drivers, right? There was a, a mother, I'm assuming, I think it was a mother, but she, her, she lost her child in a car accident because of a drunk driver. So what did she do? She took that energy, right? 
that terrible loss. It was a horrible thing to lose a child is the one of the worst things that a person can go through. But instead of, you know, doing just being in a state of sadness for her whole life, she said, I am going to make sure nobody ever experiences what I went through. And she started this organization called MAD. And now it's international, I think, or definitely national, but everybody knows it. And it's to prevent people from drinking alcohol and driving. So she took that loss and did this amazing thing that's helped millions and maybe billions of people in the world. So you can turn loss into something positive if you always have a good opinion of Allah, that if he took something from you, there's a reason for it. And inshallah, with your patience, he'll replace it with something better. And he'll use you to do a lot of good with it if you're patient. But if you think like, oh no, I've lost it and now the world is over and I, I'm going to fall into a state of depression, then you're forgetting that Allah is, uh, you know, he, he can uh, give you anything you want and you have to turn back to him and just ask him to give you patience with that loss and to replace it for something with something better for you in this world or, and, re or, and reward you in the next world with it as well. Because, you know, some things are hard on us, you know. Um, uh, I lost, for example, my pet, uh, a, a f uh, how many years ago, maybe nine years ago. And I think about her all the time I, and it hurts. It hurts because I loved her and it was a difficult circumstance, but I'm hopeful that inshallah, she's going to be with me in Jannah. I really do. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helps uh, bring her to me in Jannah and I get to see her. So I always hold on to that hope. So if you have a loss of something, always remember Allah will inshallah reward you with, with your patience. Okay. Um, let's see. What if it's cyberbullying? So I'm assuming that has to do with, uh, um, blameworthy modesty. If it's cyberbullying, you should also speak up. If you see, you know, someone on social media, you know, treating other people poorly, you can talk to them directly and say, hey, you know, I've noticed that you're leaving really mean comments and trolling people. Um, if you know them, like let's say it's a school classmate or something, you know, have the courage to say something. But, you know, if it's a stranger um, and your, you know, account, you're, you know, I would always say be careful because uh, some of you are really young, but if you do have social media presence and your name is visible and people can easily find you, you want to kind of watch how you engage people online because there are a lot of bad people online. But I think if you're a young person, I would just, you know, take it to your parents and say, listen, I have, you know, this person or this whoever that's, I think they're being mean and they're being cyber bullying. What should I do about it? And talk it through with your parents. They'll help you figure out if that's something you should get involved in or not. Okay. But be, be cautious just because again, the digital world, we don't have full control and there are a lot of uh, evil people out there. Okay. So let's see, mashallah. Can you continue this class? I love this. Oh, how sweet. <laughs> I just, thank you. That is such a sweet comment. I love doing it. Wallahi, I, I wish I, we were all in one together, room together, because it would be even more engaging, but I love that you guys love it. That uh, really fills my heart. So thank you for that lovely uh, comment. Um, yes, it's called Blameworthy Modesty. Okay, so the class is called Blameworthy Modesty. Um, mashallah. Very good. <laughs> okay, awesome, you guys. Well, I think I answered all of your questions that I can see. Um, oh, wait, what have you turned? Oh, yeah, no, how many sessions? Yeah, I think I've answered all of your questions. Thank you for being here again. You guys are awesome. May Allah bless all of you and protect all of you. Have a wonderful iftar if you're fasting. Remember me and my family in your du'as, okay? And remember to study, because remember, I'm going to quiz you guys on Thursday with the rest, okay? And talk it over with your family. Teach them. Be the teacher. You know, if your parents weren't uh, listening, say, let me teach you about some diseases of the heart today, okay? And take it from there. All right, you guys, have a wonderful evening. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum, bismillahir rahmanir rahim, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al anbiya wal mursaleen, Sayyidina wa Mawlana wa Habibina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa ala alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam, Sliman Kathira. Welcome uh, all of you to the fourth session of Purification of the Heart. Alhamdulillah, um, we are going to go ahead and maximize our time as much as possible and jump right into the uh, first part, which is the review, right? We do a bit of a review. Um, and I do that by actually asking you guys some questions. I'm hoping that you remembered what we covered last session on Tuesday. Uh, and I'll go ahead and ask you. Who can tell me? And remember, these answers are coming to me only. Okay, so I'm the one that is able to 
see exactly uh, who is providing the answers and I will list off the, um, the answers as they come in and uh, make sure to recognize, uh, you know, the order so that those of you who are, you know, doing what we should be doing. Ripta, remember we talked about Ripta, which is uh, competing for good. It's a good thing to do. So I like healthy competition and I'd like to see you guys jumping into the chat box and answering right away. So the very first question is, this is a disease of the heart that prevents you from speaking up, from acting when you should. If you see something unjust or you have a question about something, you get, you know, you're, you're, you don't have the courage to speak up. What is that called? Very good. So, mashallah, Amen and Uthman, I don't know which of you answered. Maybe you guys can uh, put A or O first, uh, so that way I know who to uh, address. But great job. You guys answered first, mashallah. And, oh, Amen, you came back with the um, with the Arabic as well. Hayad Damim, very good. So, blameworthy modesty or Hayad Damim is the modesty that prevents you. It's being shy, but not in the shyness that's good, right? We have shyness and shyness is a beautiful quality. The Prophet said was shy. And it's a wonderful quality for us to have, but blameworthy modesty is when the shyness actually prevents you from doing the right thing, right? And the right thing is making sure that if something's not clear that you're being taught, that you get clarity because you don't want to walk away confused. Or if you see something bad happening in front of you, that you speak up and you say, hey, that's not right. And I'm going to defend or speak out against this thing. So good job. All right. Um, you guys are not going to be able to see the answers because the chat box is not open to everyone. Okay. We are controlling the uh, room for many reasons, but primarily for security reasons. Okay. So the answers are coming to me and I'm seeing them. So don't worry about your friends uh, or other people seeing your answers. I'm seeing them and I will make sure to acknowledge who is saying what. Okay. All right. So good job. So the next um, question I'm going to ask you is, let's see here. I got to look up my presentation. Um, how many thoughts roughly do we have every day? If you can give me the range and tell me about how many of them are negative. I know this is a big one, right? Um, and how many of them are repeat thoughts from the previous day? So first question was, how many overall thoughts can we have? What's like the maximum, that, that number? I gave you two numbers. I said anywhere between this number and this number of thoughts every day people have on average. Who can remember? Oh, Mariam, mashallah, excellent. You came right in with the full range. So people can have anywhere from 12,000 to 60,000 thoughts a day. Excellent job, Mariam. And Zakaria, mashallah, you came in answering 95% are repeated thoughts. Excellent. And you also said, Zakaria, uh, that 80% are negative. So great job. You distinguished between the two, which is so important. So when I when we're asking questions, make sure to be clear, right, in your response. So Zakaria actually wrote 80% negative, 95% repeated. Awesome. That's the kind of uh, focus that I want to see attention, right, that you're paying attention to the question I'm asking you and your answer reflects that. Because if you just give me a number, I'm not sure what you're an answering, right? And um, I'm making it a little bit challenging because I don't want it to be too simple. I know some of you are, mashallah, too quick, and I, I got to give you a challenge. Otherwise, it's not going to be fun, right? So great job on answering that question. All right. Um, let's see here. Hmm. What other question can I ask you? Okay. This is again, I'm, I'm, I'm getting a little tougher with my questions because I see that you guys are too sharp, mashallah. This is the treatment for, uh, or the treatment for this particular disease of the heart is to know the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, okay? And if we study the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it helps to control something. It helps to control this particular disease. Who can tell me what the disease is in English and Arabic? One answer. So it's, I want the full uh, answer in English and Arabic. And they, this, by the way, is not, is from last week's or on Tuesday's session. So we're only focusing on those three diseases of the heart that we covered on Tuesday. Some of you are giving me answers from far uh, back, but nope. Uh, we're looking at, again, 
uh, thoughts. For, I mean, excuse me, uh, the last three sessions. So let's hear. I have, oh, mashallah, Afnan, excellent. Afnan, you came through, you gave me exactly what I wanted. You gave me the English and then you gave me the Arabic. Excellent. The disease of the heart that is treated by studying the 99 names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is called blameworthy thoughts in English, khawd fi mala ya'ni, right? Which is um, blameworthy thoughts in Arabic. So Afnan gave me both answers. Awesome. Great job. Afnan, next time, just to, for your sake, because I don't want anybody to beat you to it, try to type them all in one answer because you gave them to me separate, but I want you to do it fast, but do it also consolidated, okay? So that way you get, boom, both of them in. Great job. So khawd fima la'iyani is uh, is when you have thoughts that are blameworthy, uh, you shouldn't have them. And a way to control your thoughts is to, one of the treatments is to remember the 99 names of Allah's brother. Very good. Okay, um, let's look. Um, this uh, is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said will clean and purify um, our wealth. What is the thing that cleans and purifies our wealth? It's something that we all do. Very good, Zakaria and Zoya and Dania, mashallah. Both of you answered correct answers. Zakaria, you came with sadaqa, which is awesome. And then uh, uh, Zoya and Dania, you guys came with zakat. So both of those aren't correct uh, answers, right? Sadaqah and charity is both giving. So that's why you both got a great job. And um, that we covered under what? We covered under which disease of the heart when we talked about the importance of charity, right? Uh, and the Prophet Sallallahu he actually said that uh, contentment is a treasure that is never exhausted. He was speaking really about being in a state of gratitude and when you're in a state of gratitude, it helps to protect from this particular disease of the heart. Again, we're talking about the ones we covered on Tuesday. So which hadith or which um, disease of the heart was that in reference to? Very good. Amen and Uthman. You guys got it. Mashallah. Excellent job. Fear of poverty. Khawf al-faqar. Very good. So when you're afraid of being poor or becoming poor, it's a disease of the heart. And the way to treat that disease of the heart is to increase in your gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're uh, showing your gratitude and you're content. When you have contentment, rida, it means you're very happy with whatever Allah gave you. So that's one of the ways. Awesome. Okay, you guys, you did fantastic. May Allah reward all of you. Very proud of you guys. You all did great. So we're going to go ahead and move on to today's lesson, okay? Let me quickly pull, um, do the screen share, and hopefully we'll get this going right away. Inshallah, I'm going to present. Just give me a minute. Present, and here we go. Okay, so uh, also let me open up the, queue, the chat box so that I can see what you guys are saying. All right, whoa, uh-oh, there we go. Um, let me drag you over here. So hopefully you guys can see everything, right? So here we go. We are beginning week two. This is the second week Thursday's lesson. So let's start with a quick summary of the disease of the heart that we've covered this week, okay? So remember, Tuesday we did blameworthy modesty, blameworthy, blameworthy thoughts, fear of poverty. Today I said we're going to go over the next four. We have ostentation, which is riya. We have relying on other than God. We have displeasure with divine decree. And we have seeking reputation, sumat. So this is what we're going to cover today, okay? So let's go ahead and start. So ostentation, okay? This is a very, I know it's a big word. It's kind of like, huh? Austin, what? Ostentation, okay? Everybody should say it. If you're home, just say it to yourself. Ostentation. What is ostentation? This is, the Arabic of it is riya. This is when you show off or you, you're doing things to get attention and praise from other people and not for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, okay? Um, it's dangerous because it means that you care more about uh, uh, people and what they think about you than you do about pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So ostentation, right? Um, and this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that in the Quran that everything we do will be rewarded appropriately. 
okay? And that means according to our intention. So whatever your intention is, then Allah will reward you. And so there's a hadith, a famous hadith, where there's three people that in this dunya, they achieved things and they did things because they, they made a claim. They said it was for the pleasure of Allah. But on the day of judgment, Allah reminds them, no, you didn't do it for me. So the first person is the knowledgeable person who went and you know became very knowledgeable. And they said that they did that for the sake of Allah. But Allah tells them on the day of judgment, no, you went and got knowledge so that people could call you uh, the most knowledgeable and, and, and praise you for your knowledge, right? It wasn't for my sake. Uh, the other person is a wealthy person who gives you know, their money for, they say they're doing it for the sake of Allah, but Allah really knows what's in their heart. And he reminds them and he says on the day of judgment, no, you didn't give money for my sake. You gave it so that people could say about you, you were so generous, such a generous man that man was. And so Allah tells them on the day of judgment, you get the reward for what you did, jaza'un wifaqa. That means that you get your, this is your, you already got your reward. You did it for the praise. So you got the praise, right? And then the last uh, uh, category is a man who goes to jihad, right? They fight for the, in, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a war and they die saying that they did it for the sake of Allah. But Allah reminds them, no, you did it so that you could be treated, you know, hailed a hero. Like, oh, what a heroic man he was. He fought with such valor and strength. You did it so people could praise you. And that's the reward you already got because people praised you. So you got your reward. So ostentation is really dangerous because if your intention isn't for the sake of Allah, then this is what happens is you actually end up losing the reward of what you're doing. Uh, and whatever your intention was, that's going to be what your reward is. You won't get the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? So um, that's why we have to remember. And yes, thank you. As Taslim says, this is why we're taught in Namal A'malu bin Niyat, right? That every single thing that we do is based on our intentions. So if our intentions aren't right, we are not going to, uh, we're going to get whatever our intentions are. And that's why it's so important to always make sure your intention is for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, so let's look uh, more at this disease of the heart. So, um, Riya is so dangerous that the Prophet ﷺ actually gave it a special name, okay? So this hadith, he said, Indeed, the thing that I fear for you the most is the minor shirk, which is associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, okay? So when we associate partners, that means we say that Allah has, you know, help, like he's got helpers. Um, and people, you know, who have uh, the wrong idea about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say certain things about who those helpers are. We, of course, Allah does, needs no help. Uh, he has no helpers. He is one, right? That's a very big part of being a Muslim. So he's saying here that he he's uh, fears for us the minor form of shirk. So that his companions were like, wait, what? What's the minor shirk? Because they understood that shirk was just saying that Allah has partners, he, they didn't know what, what a small, minor means small, right? Major is big, minor is small. So they were like, what's minor shir shirk? And he said, riya, riya, showing off. So there's two forms of shirk. There's one which is saying that Allah actually has partners. And then the other is, is doing things for other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Whenever we do anything that is not for the sake of Allah and we're doing it for the pleasure of other people, then it's kind of like we're making those people partners with Allah, right? It's not the same as worshiping them, but it is making them so important that we start doing things for uh, their pleasure instead of looking at the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, okay? So, and I see some questions, you guys. I will get to your questions, but we'll have to wait till the end. So don't exhaust yourselves right now typing too much about the questions. Wait, save them and, and uh, wait for the end, okay? So in another hadith, uh, this is actually a really good hadith because it's giving you an example. Uh, the Prophet gave the example of someone who is making the adhan, right? And while making the adhan, they think, wow, I bet the people think that my voice is beautiful, right? And so that is an example of riya, right? And another hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said that riya is so dangerous, it's sneaky, that it's like the black ant on the black rock in the night with no moon, right? It can sneak up on you like this. So, 
you have to pay so much attention to your intentions. Otherwise, these thoughts will come inside your heart. Like, let's say, you know, you're at the masjid and you're, you're taking a class, right, with a teacher. And then the teacher looks at you and says, if you're like, if you're an older boy, let's say you're a teenage boy, 15 years old. And the teacher looks to you and says, Ahmed, I want you to lead the prayer today. Okay, it's Maghrib prayer and you have to lead it. And you're like, what? Me? And the teacher says, yeah. And you know, alhamdulillah, you know Quran, you've been studying it. And then as soon as he tells you to do that, you kind of get this thought in your head. Oh, wow. I'm going to get to now recite in front of everybody. I'm going to, you know, get on the microphone and the whole masjid is going to hear my voice. Wow. Everybody's going to think I'm such a good reciter of Quran. That is riya. It's entering your heart. It makes you want to kind of show off, right? So you want to be very careful because if you're ever asked to do something like that, it's a responsibility, right? To lead people in prayer is a huge responsibility. So it should kind of be heavy on your heart, not like, ooh, I can't wait to show off, right? And that's not how you look at it, okay? So let's look at this. I like this example of the ant, okay? So if you look on the left, okay, I have this ant. It's in broad daylight, right? You can see ants when they're in day, can't you? Um, you can see them. If they come on your counters in the kitchen or if you're walking even on the sidewalk, you'll see a trail of ants in the daytime. But if it's nighttime, if it's super dark, right, and the, you know, the, there's no moon out, um, and you, let's say you're sitting outside, if you've ever gone camping or you're just kind of in nature, if you're sitting somewhere and you, there's not a whole lot of light, right, then if an ant comes up on you or a trail of ants, you might not see it at all, right? That's why the analogy is important to kind of reflect on, that you, if you're not paying attention, th this, uh, this disease of the heart can creep up on you just like an ant that's in that's dark itself it's a black ant on a black rock in the middle of the night can sneak up on you so think about that whenever you have anything uh, that you have to do always question your intentions ask yourself why am i really doing this is it really because i want allah to be happy with me or is it because i want people to praise me and compliment me and make me feel special and i want to make i want to look my I look at myself better right than other people or i want uh you know i want excuse me i want other people to look at me as though i'm better maybe better than my cousins or my siblings or my best friends or my classmates i want my teachers to think i'm better than them this is riya so we have to be so careful okay very important thing all right, so next um, we're going to talk about the treatment. So how do you get rid of this? Well, the treatment that Imam al-Mawlud talks about in purification of the heart is that you should increase your hidden good deeds. So the things that you're doing in private, you should start increasing those deeds. Like if you, let's say, for example, you feel like really grateful to Allah. Like some, maybe you're lying in bed and you're like, Ya Allah, thank you. Thank you so much for giving me my family and my home and this life that I have. You know, I, there's so many people that don't have a home. They don't even have their parents. Even the Prophet said, he didn't know his parents, right? I mean, he barely knew his mother. He never met his father. His mother passed when he was six years old. So there's so many kids your age who don't have what you have. A lot of them have been through really difficult times. So if you ever feel that great sense of gratitude, right? Um, the next day, for example, you could come and go, mom, dad, you know, last night I was in bed and I felt so much gratitude to Allah and I just was praising him. And I was, you know, you start sharing what you did, right? And what you felt you could do that. And then you, and you could say, I'm going to go and pray to rakat and, you know, you know, do this, or I'm going to go give sadaqah. You want to do something right to show your great gratitude to Allah. You could do that in front of everybody, in front of your brothers and sisters and everybody listening. Or you could say, this feeling I have is for Allah. It really is. And I don't need to share it with everybody. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to maybe when everybody goes to sleep or, you know, right before Fajr, if I can wake up, because now most if you guys are waking up a little bit early for suhoor with your families, then maybe you go and you wake up a little early and you pray, you make wudu, and then you go to a private place in the house and you just pray your two rakah and you have your moment with Allah and you don't really need to 
share it with other people. You don't need to come the next day and broadcast, right? Broadcasting is like announcement, everybody. I just prayed two rakah or I prayed 20 rakah or I did a thousand dhikr. You, know, you don't need to do that because when it's truly for Allah, he already knows. He, he sees it. He knew that you were going to do it before you even thought of the idea. So you just have to be happy that Alhamdulillah, Allah knows that I did this for him. And not worry about what mom says, what dad says, what your brothers and sisters think of you or your teachers. You know, you don't come the next day to school and report it to your teachers. Oh, guess what I did? You know, just keep those things hidden. So you want to increase your hidden actions because that will make you less likely that you have this disease of the heart, Ria. And then here is, you know, uh, an example of the Prophet I'm actually making dua for protection from Riya because it's such a sneaky disease that all of us, we have to be so careful of getting, right? Even he made dua for it, subhanAllah. Because back before, um, you know, there were, before Islam, the uh, Quraysh, the people of Mecca, they used to make Hajj. But in that time, it's called the period of Jahiliyyah. It's called the period of ignorance. They didn't know they weren't Muslim. What they would do is when they would make the Hajj, because remember, the Hajj was, you know, uh, in honor of Prophet Ibrahim, alayhi salam, and Ismail, alayhi salam, they created the Kaaba. So they were, a lot of the people in that time, they would still do the, the Hajj to honor them, right? So when they would do it, they would be very arrogant about it. And they would make it a big show, like, I am going to go do the Hajj. And they would, you know, kind of brag about it. So the Prophet Sallallahu did not want to do anything like those people. So he actually here, he asked, oh Allah, I intend to perform Hajj. Uh, please free free me from ostentation and seeking fame. Like I don't, I'm not doing it so that people can say, oh, I made Hajj, you know. I'm doing it for you. But he himself would make dua that Allah protects him from that. So we should certainly make dua that we um, that Allah removes that from our heart, that we don't do things to show off, okay? So that's the treatment for uh, ostentation. And of course, we should be humble and always know that whatever we're doing is uh, is because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He loves us and he's drawing us closer to him. And he doesn't like arrogance. Those things are not good to have, showing off. He doesn't like those qualities. He loves humility, right? And he loves things that are done in hidden secret for his sake. So increase your good deeds that way, all right? So the next disease of the heart, this is, right? Yatawakkal ala ghayr Allah, which is relying on other than God. So this is a disease of the heart because if you get too used to relying on people, you can easily forget that Allah is the one that he is the one who gives you every good deed, right? Or every good thing, excuse me, every blessing you have is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even if it comes through your parents, your grandparents, your teachers, your, you know, aunts, uncles, whoever, if you recognize, or if you always remember that all good deeds, no matter what, come from Allah, then you learn to also put your focus back whenever you have a need, you go back to Allah. You don't go to people with your needs, right? So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, he says, do not call unto any beings other than Allah. These are, uh, these are capable of neither benefit nor harm, right? So anybody else other than Allah, they are not capable of benefiting you or harming you, right? It's just don't go to them, right? To do so is therefore guilt, is, uh, guilty of wrongdoing. When Allah afflicts you with something, no one can remove it except him. So basically, this ayah is telling us, Turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for everything, right? Uh, for good, when you need something and when you're being tested, go to him for help. Don't go to people because people can't benefit you or harm you, right? And then he also says here, seek your livelihood from him and worship him alone. Reminding us again, don't go to people for your needs, but only go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, okay? So... This is an important point because one of the things that Muslims don't do is beg, okay? We believers don't beg people. When we have a need, whatever that need is, we go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first and we ask Allah for help. Ya Allah, you know, maybe you're worried, for example, about money or you're worried about your health or you're worried about your someone you love, right? And that you... Um, you know, you, you, you want protection from them, that Allah protects them from harm. 
So if you have some need that's heavy on your heart, you go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first and foremost, and you ask him, please help me, help my parents, help my loved ones. And you make those du'as. Very important to always do that first. Then, of course, you can look to see in your life if there is a place that you can go to seek help. Because begging and seeking help are not the same thing. Begging is, and we'll talk about the difference, uh, right? But begging is is where you... Uh, you're not asking Allah for help at all. You're just turning to someone and saying, please, please, please give something to me, right? That's not the same as actually looking to places or people that are there to help you, right? So there's people, for example, in our community, excuse me, some of them have a hard time with making enough money to pay for rent and food and clothes. And so that's why we have zakat, right? We have zakat through the masjid because we are supposed to look out for each other. Allah gives to some people more than he gives other people. So th those of us, alhamdulillah, who he's given a lot to, the, our job is to... So that's why... Path, right? And it's Sister Jose, your video has paused. Um so let's wait just one minute, everybody. Sister Husay will be back up. Uh, it just is a little bit of an um, internet issue. It will be resolved. Exactly. Apologize uh, for that, but I was saying that we don't beg in Islam because begging, a lot of times people who beg, what happens is people can be so cruel and they end up humiliating them. They kick them out, they spit on them, they kick them. And this is, Allah doesn't want that for us. He doesn't want us to ever be treated that way, right? And so we, uh, he tells us not to beg because we should have an honor in the way that we uh, we conduct ourselves. And so if we need help, we turn to the masjid, we turn to different places that offer support and services, hospitals, clinics, if we need certain things. Um, and we, we get help, right? But we do not uh, beg. And here, look at the Prophet and what he says here at the bottom. He says, by the one in whose hand my life is, right? He's talking about Allah. It is better for one of you to take a rope and carry firewood on his back than for him to go to someone and beg, who will either give him or refuse to give him anything. So here the problem system is doing the same thing. He's protecting us. He says, go get rope, go get some firewood and sell that. That's better for you. Even though it's heavy labor to go get rope and collect firewood, chop down wood, you know, you might get splinters, you might cut yourself, but he's saying that's better. It's better to work hard and earn your money than to go and beg other people, right? Who can either give you something or may not, and may actually end up humiliating you and refusing you. So he's also protecting the honor, uh, our honor by telling us this. So let's talk about this a little bit more. Look at these people, right? I like this example of carrying um, the, the back, right? Because it's showing you that working for our needs is more pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Even if it's difficult, right? Uh, because we're putting our trust in him and we're not making it difficult for others. When you go and beg someone else, you're actually putting that person in an awkward situation too. Because it's like, oh, okay, sure, here, I'll give you my money. What if I needed the money, right? What if I was, what if I had like $10 in my pocket and I needed it to go buy something important. But now that you've put me on the spot, I feel weird and I have to give you my money and all because you didn't want to work for it, right? So when you work for it and you actually are willing to do something as strenuous as taking firewood on your back and look at this lady in the middle picture, right? This, she's probably an older woman, 
But this is what people of, you know, belief and, and integrity and they, you know, have strong work think is when you do something right which is very important in islam um they'll they're willing to work uh, even into their 70s and 80s you see some people mashallah working because they don't ever want to beg people so you have people all throughout the world they understand this we should understand it too and begging right is making it easy for yourself but you're making it hard for other people and that's why it's discouraged so we don't turn to people for our needs we go directly to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, okay? And so I hope that's clear. This is the part of relying on other than Allah, right? So the treatment for this is get in the habit of first and foremost, if you have any need whatsoever, um, to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And sometimes people think like, oh, you know, as a kid, let's say, what are your needs? You know, maybe you want to go to some vacation, you're excited about summer break because you want to go somewhere. That's a want, right? You have to know the difference between want and need. But even those wants, if you really, really want something, you go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and ask him for it, right? My boys, for example, they love Legos. They could do Legos all day long. And so, uh, you know, if they really, really want Legos, they should then go to Allah and say, Ya Allah, please put it in my parents' heart to get me this Lego set that I want. Please, Ya Allah. And maybe something will happen. Maybe, uh, you know, their parents might not uh, necessarily get it for them. Maybe their grandparents will surprise them with an Eid gift or, or a birthday gift. This happens all the time, right? Where a child or someone will really want something, but that if you turn that want into a dua and you go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you start to realize that all good, everything that you ever want is always from Allah anyway, no matter who it comes through. So why even bother asking a person about it? I'll just ask Allah for it and he will inshallah find a way to get it to me. So always do that first, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first. And then the other thing is also to start to lower your expectations from people. Because to be honest, as an adult, you know, you, most of you are young, you'll see that a lot of people are gonna disappoint you in life, right? And it's just natural because not everybody can always think about everybody else. So what happens is sometimes, you know, people are there for you. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes you call your friend or your sister or your cousin or your brother and you say, hey, I need help. And they go, sorry, I'm doing something else. I have my own family. I have my own obligations. And it gets kind of hard to hear that all the time. But if you stop asking, right, people. You stop turning to people and you just start becoming more self-sufficient, which is, you know what, I'm going to just start learning to do things on my own because it makes me not depend on people. And I'll also ask Allah for help. Like Allah, send me the helpers. You know, I am not going to bother other people. I need help, but I'm going to rely on you to bring me that help, right? This is a show of great Iman. And so we should get in the habit of doing that as opposed to depending too much on other people and then dealing with disappointment and dealing with, you know, so many problems that come when someone says to you, uh, for example, I'll be there. Let, let's say you, you're moving. I mean, this happens to people, you know, and you have to move your whole house. OK, packing up your boxes and lifting up heavy furniture by yourself isn't easy. Right. So there's sometimes people who've called up their friends and, you know, whoever, and they say, hey, can you help me? I need to help. And then they're like, sure, I'll be there. But then moving day comes along and all of a sudden, uh-oh, there's nobody, like two people show up or not even maybe one person shows up out of all these people you called. And everybody's texting you that day or calling you the night before, sorry, I have to go somewhere else. And I didn't even know. And I had an appointment and my mom needed this. And so now you're sitting by yourself going, I rented a moving truck and I don't, I don't have any help. And it just gets really hard, right? But if you start saying, I'm not going to do that. Rather, Ya Allah, give me the means and the ability to just get things done, then you can maybe uh, hire someone or, you know, someone that when you pay people, it's a little different, right? People will show up. But, uh, but the point is, is Allah will open an opportunity or a way for you to get what you need because you use the means that he gave you. If he gave you wealth, you can, like I said, call up a service and ask them to help. Um, or he can maybe, you know, send someone your way that is also in need uh, of work. And now you're both helping each other out, right? So Allah will do that for you, inshallah, but turn to him first. This is how you treat this disease of the heart of relying too much on other people. Okay? 
inshallah. So alhamdulillah, I hope uh, you guys are, is everything clear? And quickly check the Q&A, make sure there's no issues with my screen or anything or my volume, right? It's good, right? All right, so let us, um, bismillah, go to the next one. So, Sakhat al-Qadr, this is a displeasure with divine decree. All right, this disease is when you cannot accept when something happens or has already happened and you keep thinking, why, why me? Why did this have to happen to me? Okay, so let's say, for example, you lose your wallet, okay, or you break your iPad or your phone, you're playing and then boom, it crashes, or an accident happens and your brother does it or your sister does it, they break your toy, okay, very easy to let your nafs react and get mad, that's a normal response, okay, and we're all going to do that in our lives until we learn better, right? So it's okay to do that because you're a human being and you're reacting. But when you look, think back after your emotions calm down a little bit, if you keep thinking, why did that have to happen? Why, why, why? And you keep going like just over and over whatever it was and it replays in your mind and it really bothers you that it happened. This is when this disease of the heart is manifesting, right? It's coming out. Because if something, if Allah, if something already happens and Allah decreed it to happen, which means it's his will, then you just have to accept it, right? Because we don't always know what's good for us and what's not good for us. That's really the bottom line. We really don't. And that's why this ayah in the Quran says what? It may be that you dislike something, though it is good for you. And it may be that you love something, though it is bad for you, and God knows and you do not know, okay? So this is a really good uh, time to just kind of talk about this, because as you guys grow up in life, you're going to have to do certain things that you might not want to do because you think, you know, you're looking at it from a physical or material perspective. For example, let's just say medicine, okay? There's some medicines that are bitter, all right? Um, and when you think of even taking them, you're like, oh gosh, it's so disgusting. I don't want to put it in my mouth. I'm going to throw up and And you're just making it seem like it's the worst thing in the world. But that medicine is healing for you. So if you take the medicine, it's going to help you some way or another, right? That's there's certain things that Allah's made in this dunya like that, that they're not, they don't sound good, they don't taste good, your nafs isn't gonna like it, but in actuality, it's really good for you. The opposite is also true. For example, uh, there's certain things that if you eat too much of it, it will have the opposite effect, but the nafs almost pushes you to do that. How many of you have ever eaten way too much sweets? right? Because it was so good. Whether it was ice cream or it was candy or it was cookies or it was birthday cake, right? You've eaten something because you're like, oh my God, that looks so delicious. It's and you end up feeling sick. Your nafs is telling you to keep eating it. Your taste buds are like, oh, ding, 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 because the sugar and so keep eating it, but then unfortunately what happens, give it 10, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and boom, that stomach ache comes in, and the stomach ache causes so much pain, right? Um, sorry, did you guys hear what I said? I'm getting messages that it froze again. I don't know what's up with my internet today. I'm so sorry. I was talking about the ayah that says it may be that you dislike something, though it's good for you, and it may be that you love something, though it's bad for you, and you don't really know, Allah is the one that knows. So the example we gave was about medicine that's bitter, but really good for you, or candy and sweets that's good and tastes good, but too much of it is bad for you. And sugar, just generally speaking, can cause a lot of inflammation and problems in the body. So when we eat it, we have to be controlled in how we eat it. Otherwise, it's a lot of problems, right? So this is how the world is generally. There's going to be a lot of things that are not always pleasant to do, but 
it's good for you. Even fasting. Some people are not that happy fasting because it's like, oh man, I can't have my cereal in the morning or my coffee. And, you know, they kind of get caught up in all the things that they can't do. And they forget that fasting is amazing for your body. Your body is like this machine. And when you fast, it helps to heal itself. There's all this repair happening, right? So fasting is incredible. But yeah, if you're letting your nafs uh, you know, think about fasting, it's not going to like it very much. So Allah knows better. So when he tells us to fast, that's why we fast, because he knows what's better for us. And so when we, if something happens, we have to just accept that our Lord knows better. And we have to be happy with whatever he wills for us, right? Willed for us, if it's in the past. Uh, obviously, thinking of the future, this is different because it hasn't happened yet. So you can make dua like, oh, Allah, protect me from this and don't let this happen to me. We don't want, obviously, bad things to happen. But if certain bad things happen already, then you have to be willing to let go instead of letting shaitan make you replay it over and over again with why, 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 right? That's what we're talking about. And so another really important point to hear is to know that all people in the world are in four different situations at any given time. And sometimes you can be in more than one at the same time. But let's look at, let's understand this. The first is that you're in blessing, okay? So if you're in blessing, that means everything's kind of going great for you. You have, alhamdulillah, family, you have money, you have education, you have a lot of good things in life and things are pretty good, right? Alhamdulillah, you have a lot to be grateful for. So what Allah expects from you, if you're in that state of blessing, is that you continue to be grateful, right? That you're continuously, alhamdulillah, thank you, Allah, and you are sh- you're using those blessings for good. So if he's giving you wealth and money, that you help people in need. If he's giving you knowledge, you teach people. If he's giving you a skill or a talent, you do it for good, right? You use that talent for the good of humanity. You don't use it to destroy uh, people and to cause harm to people, right? That is how we express our gratitude to Allah. The second is that you're in a state of bala or tribulation, which means that that you're being tested, that there's some difficulty that you have. It can be with wealth. It can be with your relationships. You know, it can be with your health. But there is a problem that Allah is testing you in. And what is he expecting from you is patience. Are you going to be patient with me because you're going through this difficulty? Or are you going to react and be you know, not happy. And this is what displeasure of the divine decree is because sometimes people are tested and they have a hard time accepting Allah's will. And then shaitan comes along and says, yeah. And they start, you know, he, he starts putting all these bad thoughts in your heart and it can cause problems. But when people have the right understanding, then they know that when they're being tested, like prophet Ayub alayhi salam, right? He was tested. He lost all of his children. He got very sick. He lost his home. He lost everything, 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 everything. And though he responded with what? Sabrun Jamil, beautiful patience, right? So did uh, Prophet Yaqub, right? With when his son Yusuf was taken from him. These stories that we learn about the prophets teach us about beautiful patience. Even the Prophet ﷺ himself, look at his life. As we said, he didn't know his uh, father. He lost his mother lost his grandfather, his uncle. He buried his, his beloved wife, his first wife, Khadija, radiallahu anha, or the mother of the believers. He lost her. And then he lost five of his six children. He had to bury them himself. And he went through famine where he was, you know, he, him and the Muslims were starving. They were persecuted. There was so much that done to them. But through all of it, did he ever complain? Did he ever say, why me? I'm the prophet of God. Why are you doing this to me, Allah? Never, never would he ever say those words because he had so much Iman in Allah and he understood that everything, even the hardships are always good because we don't know what's good for us, right? So beautiful patience is the response. The third is if you're guided. Alhamdulillah, we have guidance. We're Muslim. Allah loves us. He's drawing us close to him. 
And so we have to know, though, that though we are praying and we're fasting, we should never let arrogance enter our heart and become self-righteous. When you're self-righteous, you start looking at yourself as better than everybody else. So that's the response that is expected of you. If you have guidance, Allah wants you to realize that it's from him and not to become arrogant with that guidance. Don't think you're better than people, even non-Muslims. You don't go around treating people like your neighbors or people in public like you are better just because you're Muslim, you wear hijab and you fast or you have a beard. None of that matters. What matters is the heart. The heart. Only known to Allah. So, hello? Sister Husay, you froze just for a minute. There okay. you're right now. Yeah, my internet is not supporting us today, unfortunately. Maybe if you have two or three people uh, attending the session right now, maybe one of them can log off and that will Oh, help. you know, that's a good point. Um, Yasin or Ismail, I'm going to ask one of you guys to get off of the iPad. Okay, get off and share because... Uh, it's possible that too many people are using the uh, internet in this house and we're weakening the, the signal. Okay, so get off of it, please. All right, so if you're again in guidance, um, what is what does that mean? It means that you should be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because as we said, there are people who may be drinking alcohol today, but maybe in five, 10 years from now, they've made tawbah and, and they're now hafal of Qur'an. Maybe they've become a half of the Qur'an. How do you know? You don't know what their future is. So you always want to look at everybody as, you know what? Not my place to judge. I'm just going to be a good person and do what I'm taught by the Prophet ﷺ, which is always want good for people, want guidance for people, instead of thinking I'm better than anybody, right? And then the last uh, disease of the heart, or I'm sorry, the last state, excuse me, I'm getting so many messages, my, my brain is, ah, okay. So the last state that people can be in is disobedience, right? And so people fall and they fall by, by you know, not uh, doing what they're supposed to do, right? They make mistakes. That's another way of saying they're making mistakes. So people sin, they don't do sometimes what they're supposed to do. And if that happens, then the response is to keep going back to Allah, to make tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness. That's the, the response that you should have. So anytime you make a mistake, don't think like, oh, I'm so terrible. Allah will never forgive me. Never think that. That's from shaitan because he wants you to, to flee away from Allah because, you know, he's making you feel bad about yourself. Rather, just think Allah is the most forgiving. And like he says, even if your sins are like the, you know, the foam of the ocean or they reach the sky, keep coming back. Because the more we come back to Allah, he will, uh, you know, the better it is for us because we're we're showing him that we love him and that we know he's so forgiving. And so that is the response of someone who's in that state of disobedience. So, so it's, again, so important to remember if Allah wills something, you let go, okay? And so the treatment, again, of, div of having this is that you remember that really Allah subhanahu is the only one that knows what's good for us. We do not know, right? And then to reflect on the life of the Prophet Sallallahu think about how much he endured all the things we talked about. He lost so much, but he never, ever complained ever about any of it. Not even once he understood that all of it was from Allah and he accepted, accepted it. And then also remember that whatever happened to you, whatever the thing was that you're not happy about, it could always be worse, right? Um, and, or it could, you know, it, alhamdulillah that it happened in, in, in some material thing, right? It was like a thing that you could replace. You can replace a bike, you can replace a phone, you can replace things like that. Um, and it wasn't in your deen because having a, a problem in your deen is far worse, right? So if Allah is testing you in a material thing, not a big deal, right? So we just are grateful that alhamdulillah, it's in that and nothing else. And then that it's in this world and not the next world, because we don't want to be tested in the next world, right? We always ask Allah for protection from that, you know, from any punishments in the next life, rather for whatever mistakes we've done or things that might have that aren't good, let us, you know, deal with those things in this dunya instead of the next life. So this is how we treat this particular disease of the heart. Okay. And now we're going to in the oh wow, we got to uh, speed it up because I want to answer your questions. 
So seeking reputation, Suma is the last disease we're going to cover today. We did four. Usually we've been doing three, but we're going to try to squeeze in this four. And if we go over a few minutes, it's okay, inshallah. I hope your parents are okay with that. But seeking reputation, this is a really important one because you guys are growing up in a time where social media is everywhere, okay? You see a lot of people, even young kids, your age or younger, there's people who have YouTube pages and Instagram pages and TikTok and Snapchat and Twitter and Facebook, they're everywhere. And what's happening to them? They're getting very, very famous and they're making a lot of money. So a lot of kids tend to think, ooh, that sounds so cool. I want to be like them too. I want to be famous. I want to be known. But it's a disease of the heart to ever want to be known to people um, and to, to start sharing your talents and good deeds and bragging about your what you do, that's a disease of the heart, okay? And so we have to be very careful um, about letting that, just because, again, it's something that we're seeing everywhere, that we end up also falling into this behavior. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one who exalts people, exalts bringing people up, right? Making them special. So Allah is the one. He's You exalt whomever you will. Only Allah does it. And you debase whomever you will. Debase is the opposite. So if he, exalting is to make someone important and, and you know, give them that, that status, to debase is to lower them and humiliate them. That's only in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's the only one who can do that, right? Um, indeed, you have power over all things. So we recognize that we shouldn't look for reputation or fame in, with people, though it's it's pointless. And we're going to talk more about that in a second. But also, here's the hadith, whoever seeks reputation, whoever wants to be famous in this world, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will expose them on the day of judgment. So this is a very serious thing. If you want fame in this world, then that's the risk you're taking, that Allah will uh, humiliate you and expose you on the day of judgment to everybody. And we don't want that. We never want that. We want our intentions always to be pure for his sake. And we don't want fame because fame is quite dangerous. Okay. And here I'm going to explain Pursuing fame, there's a phrase called chasing the carrot, okay? Chasing the carrot is something that um, they used to do back in the days. These poor horses and animals, right? They would have to sometimes travel and do a lot of physical labor for human beings before we had cars and all of these other things. So they would, these owners would, got, you know, they thought, hmm, how can we get these mules and donkeys and horses to keep moving, um, what, how, what incentive can we give them? What reward can we give them that will make them keep moving instead of stopping in their tracks and resting, right? So what they did is they would tie a, a carrot to a stick and they would put it on the wagon or they would put it right here like on, in this example and it would hang in front of the poor donkey or the horse or the mule and the animal doesn't know. It's thinking it's within reach because if it, something is hanging in front of you, naturally you think I'm going to walk towards it and then get it, right? So that's how they would trick these poor animals to keep working, keep working, keep working. But that phrase, chasing the carrot, also applies to fame. That what the pursuit of fame is, it's like chasing a carrot. It's you're never going to get the carrot. The poor animal never really got the carrot until the end, right? Maybe when they arrived, finally, after miles and miles and miles, hours and hours, maybe they would get a carrot. But um, that's what fame is like, is that you work towards something that's never, you're never really going to get. And you see a lot of people working so hard to be famous, but they end up actually destroying their relationships, losing a lot of money. There's so many people who think like, you know, someone will come because there's something called being scammed, right? A lot of, there's a lot of scammers. Scammers are people who are very good at tricking people. So they come around and they'll tell you, oh, I'll make you famous and I'll make this for you and you'll get a show on TV and you'll be known by the world and you'll make millions and millions of dollars. Just give me $5,000 and I'll do that for you. So you think, Wow, for $5,000, sure, if I'm going to make millions and millions, I'll do it. And so you are innocent, right? You're pure hearted. And a lot of young people fall for these kinds of tricks because they don't have life experience, right? Unless they have parents and people who are teaching them these things. But some kids end up getting scammed a lot because of false promises. And so it's like this. It's like they're just making you chase that carrot 
but in actuality, you never get the reward that you that they promise you. And that's why it's sad because so many people end up getting hurt um, and losing a lot of things for fame. And so we never seek fame with people. We only seek to be known by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the treatment of Suma, like Riya, right, um, which is to show off, Suma enters the heart because of something called ghafla. Ghafla in, is the Arabic word. It's actually a disease of the heart we're going to cover soon, but I'll just introduce it now. It's heedlessness. It's when you forget the priority, like what's more important. So when you have ghafla, it will lead to riya and suma, both of them, ostentation and wanting reputation, wanting people to hear about all of the good deeds that you were doing, okay? So um, heedlessness is where it starts. It's because you forget that Allah is more important than anything and anybody else. And as soon as you forget Allah, then you start thinking about fame and wanting to be popular and wanting to be known and uh, thinking that good is gonna come from people. No good comes from people, right? No good, all good comes from who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So don't give up or don't forget him because once you forget him, then other people are going to start taking you away and distracting you from him. So um, hiding your good deeds and not sharing them with people, similarly to, uh, to Riyadh, right? Is a really good way to prevent Suma from entering the heart, right? And again, um, this is a hadith, whoever displays his good deeds to others, Allah will display his bad deeds on the day of judgment. So, so important that we understand not to show off. So if you're memorizing Quran or you've got some knowledge or you did something really nice, maybe you $50 of your sadaqah or your gift money, maybe grandma gave you a lot of money and now you wanna take some of it and you wanna give it to a charity. You don't go around and tell people those things. Keep your good deeds hidden. They're between you and Allah, and he doesn't need you to announce them. He already knows, right? And then know that no good can come to you from people, but all good is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you should seek to be famous with Allah, right? Seek fame through him, not through people, because people don't do anything for you. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you make him your number one priority, then he will exalt you, right? That ayah, that that ayah that we talked about before, he will make you important to people because you made him important. And that's also a hadith. Whoever makes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala priority and puts in his pleasure before the people, Allah will be pleased with them and he will make the people pleased with them. So this is also a very important message. And the opposite, the hadith says that whoever makes you know the pleasure of people before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will not be pleased with them and the people will never be pleased with them. So if you put the making people happy before making Allah happy, nobody will be happy with you. There will always be haters, right? I'm sure you guys know that term, uh, who are always uh, saying negative things about you. So people will never be happy with you. And then Allah will also not be happy with you. So it's like you're the ultimate loser. Not a good plan, right? So alhamdulillah. All right, you guys. So that is the final... Um, presentation for today. I'm opening it up now to questions. I'd love to hear from you guys. So I'm going to go ahead and stop. I'll come back here and you guys can see me now, right? So let's look at the Q&A and see what kind of questions we have. Any questions? Go ahead and let's, I know it's six o'clock, but I'll, t uh, I'll go a few more minutes because we had those interruptions and we also added a disease today. So we went a little bit over, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you have, inshallah. Okay, anything at all? Oh, some of you have to leave. Okay, well, thank you for being here. Um, Salaamu Alaikum, Rahil and Ehsan. Thank you for coming. I know it's six o'clock, so you guys have to leave. But again, anybody else? I'm looking at the, uh, oh wait. Oh, you guys are on Q&A, oops. I'm on the chat. All right, let's see here. I was looking at the wrong thing. All right, give me just a second. Um, okay, I'm gonna get rid of these answers that you guys put here. Uh, someone's asking how many more classes do we have? We'll meet inshallah next week and we'll see on Thursday of next week if we need one more class, okay? Um, oh, okay, so some of you are unable to access the uh, chat, but that's okay. If you can't access the chat, message me on the Q&A. 
Um, I'm still going through. I just joined. How do you know if anyone comes talking to you? Um, okay, Bismillah. Hey, can people see my questions? Your video is freezing. <laughs> you guys are so cute. Um, which one of the four diseases is the worst? Huh, Captain. I don't know who Captain is. Um, interesting name there. Asked which of the four diseases is the worst? Well, you know, all of them are bad. All the diseases are bad. But I think you have to really look at which one is affecting you, right? For each person, it's going to be different. For some people, you know, uh, we, we likely, most of us have a lot of these diseases, right? It's something that we all have at different degrees. Some people have riya more than they have you know, displeasure with divine decree. So it really depends on each individual person to look inside their heart and go, man, maybe I have uh, suma. Maybe I, I do like for people to know my good deeds and I do have riya. Oh no, this is not good. And so you got to work on that, especially when we remember, right? Riya was what the Prophet told us. He was most worried about that for us because it's a form of shirk and shirk is the worst thing that you could ever do. It's one of the most, you know, it's the thing that Allah says he does not forgive to associate partners with him. So, you know, if you're asking me from all of these four, surely ostentation would be up there. But I think individually, it's going to differ from every single person. You have to look into your own heart to determine which one is really the worst for you. Okay. Um, okay, so we're at, getting a question about bribing. Does it mean when someone bribes someone that's ostentation because they're willing to bribe for their approval, better scores for some test rigging competition? I mean, that's just fraud. You know, if you're uh, bribing people um, to basically get something that you didn't earn, that's fraud. That's that's really bad. And yeah, if you're doing it because you want to show off um, and you want to act like you've earned something you didn't earn then sure, it's all of those things, but that's a really terrible thing to do. Um, okay. Marshall, I'm getting really nice comments here. Uh, okay, so we're getting a question that says um, that harm can only come from Allah. What if someone has a gun? <laughs> well, okay, so let me explain. What we mean by that, of course, human beings are the ones that enact bad things on earth. Allah is not doing those things, right? However, it's by his permission that he allows us to do things, right? He's given us free will, right? So it's by his permission that human beings can act, right? So if he didn't give us permission to act good or bad, we wouldn't be able to do things. So when we say that it's by the will of Allah that something happens, that's what we're talking about. But the one who's doing the evil act, they're the ones who are causing the harm not Allah. He's not causing it. It's the evil person with the gun who's doing that, right? And so, um, but even that, if you want, you know, protection uh, from something like that, you have to turn to Allah because he's the only one who can really protect you from those types of things. Is the Q&A a new thing? Um, it's a feature on this webinar. Uh, yes. How about showing off to our family members? Maya, very good question. Yes, showing off in general is not a good thing. Whether it's to your family, to your friends, um, to your grandparents, it doesn't matter. It's a quality that you don't want to have. Now, um, it, getting encouragement is different, right? If you are starting something, let's say for the first time, and you're just trying to get better at it, and you like to be encouraged then your parents or your teachers or the elders in your family, they should know that it's okay to maybe give you a little bit of attention in the beginning when you're starting off something, right? Like when you first start to pray or you first start to memorize Quran or you take a class or you're working on a talent, um, a skill, art, maybe a, an instrument you're doing or a sport that you're playing. It's perfectly fine for uh, you to maybe want a little bit of feedback, some validation, because you're just starting off, you're insecure, right? We're all insecure when we do something for the first time. We're not sure of ourselves. So sometimes you might want people to know that you did something like, you know, and you might share, but this is about making it a habit, right? If five years into something you're doing and you still like to brag about it, this is a disease of the heart, right? So you want to make sure that you know the difference because encouragement from family members 
like maybe you want to share with grandma what you did or your aunt or uncle or someone, that's fine. But if you're doing it because you just like the attention and it makes you feel proud of yourself or you like to make your other uh, kids or that you, that are your age feel less than compared to you, this is when it's definitely Ria. So I would say, watch out. It's a disease of the heart. And remember, it's like that sneaky, sneaky ant, right? That little black ant. It can crawl up on you. So you want to be very careful, okay, to not let it um, enter your heart. Um, okay, should you still try to learn from knowledgeable Very good question. Should you still try to learn from a knowledgeable person who doesn't have good intentions? Now, I'm not sure who, uh, how you would know what their intentions are, but if their intentions are bad, you shouldn't learn from them. Okay. Um, you should try to seek out. I mean, if they make their intentions bad to you, you should definitely not, you should stay away from people like that. Um, because they're, that's not good to encourage them. Uh, we would say this is enabling, right? If you see a Muslim who's doing something they shouldn't be doing, if you look over it, like you gloss over it, like, Oh, okay. I'll, it's not a big deal or okay. I'll just go along with it then you can, you're kind of enabling them to do that. But if you say, wait a second, but that's not a good intention. You shouldn't do that. That's haram. That's wrong. Then you're reminding them also. So you're protecting them. You don't want them to be in trouble with Allah, right? So I would say if they make their intentions known to you that they're not good intentions, then don't enable them, make dua for them, guide them in a good way and look for maybe a teacher who's got really good intentions, inshallah. But if you're thinking that their intentions aren't good, that's suspicion. And you shouldn't have suspicion from uh, because you don't know what's in someone's heart. So unless they tell you that their intentions aren't good, don't go by what your suspicions are. That's not right. Okay. All right. Oh, I have someone who said, I love your classes. Well, thank you, anonymous attendee. I love you too. <laughs> and I love doing these classes. So sweet. Um, yes, the Google form you can get for signing up for this class on the MCC uh, Facebook page, website. You'll see it there, inshallah. So please check that. Um, what if you're doing something for the sake of Allah, but you also want a little attention? You know what? So that's a good, I hope I answered that in the previous question. Wanting a little bit of attention for, um, you know, just to feel, like I said, encouraged is good, but don't get dependent on that because it will become a habit. And now you're not even sure, am I doing it for Allah anymore or for I'm doing it for the attention? But if you just, in the beginning of trying something new, like I said, you just want to get kind of used to it and comfortable with it, that's okay. But pull back as soon as you start seeing that you're doing it, that that's the first thought that comes to your mind. Ooh, someone will notice me. Ooh, I hope they know that I got, you know, a really good test score and that I'm going to, you know, that my teacher was, you know, or I got a award at school. I hope my mom tells them. And I hope, you know, my dad says this about me that I won my soccer game. You, you like, you want people to hear all the stuff that, you know, that, that, that where they're bragging about you. That means that you like the attention too much, right? And so you shouldn't do that. You should say, you know what? Allah knows everything. And as long as he knows and he's happy with me, that's all that matters to me. And I'm not going to um, build my self image based on what people think, because people are always, there's always going to be some people who come and they'll have something to complain about. It's like, you'll never really satisfy people. Whereas Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, just by doing something with the right intention, um, he is already happy with you, right? And so that's why making sure that we please Allah before anybody else is so much better than wasting your time trying to make people happy because there are always going to be those people that are not really ever happy with you. Aw, thank you, Kinza. You're so sweet. You guys are so sweet that you're asking, uh, giving me all these lovely compliments. Jazakallah khair and may Allah reward you guys for making the time to be here. That's a great honor for me to teach you. Um, so how do you know if Allah is talking to you? Very good question. So obviously, you know, we are in this world and Allah, uh, when he, when we say that Allah communicates to us certain things, it's not like the way a human is talking to us where we actually are talking to them, but rather it's inspiration. This is called khawat, that it's a, it's a feeling that you get. And so whenever you're uh, uh, feeling to do really good things where you're feeling like you should be doing worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you're getting or getting really good dreams that are, you know, some people are dreaming about amazing things like the Kaaba or they see the Prophet them. 
those things are gifts from Allah. So there, that's a form of communication that Allah is, is speaking to us, right? So you have to listen to your heart. But anytime you are being drawn closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is a way where Allah is speaking to us, inshallah, through the khawatir, through that inspiration, that, that uh, you know, telling you to get up and do something, go read the Quran, right? Go pray extra prayers, those extra ibadah that we do. And we do them in secrecy. We do them for Allah. Those are all ways that Allah is drawing us close to him, alhamdulillah. So thank you for that lovely question. Um, and then, is complaining the same as a displeasure with the divine decree? Excellent question, Bilal. Thank you. What a great question. Complaining to Allah is perfectly fine, okay? Because he's the only one that is in control, right? So it makes sense if something happened and you're not necessarily happy about it. Let's say, for example, you have a pet, okay? I used to have a, I mean, I've had pets before, but I used to have a pet that I loved. She was very special to me. And I lost her under a very difficult situation. I won't go into the details because we don't have time. But the way that I lost her was hard for me, right? But I had to accept it the way whatever happened, it happened. And let go, right? Um, but my pain that I was feeling, I you can't just turn it off and on. We're human beings, right? It's not like a switch. So you take that pain and instead of being angry that it happened, right? Like, why did I have to lose her? You say, Ya Allah, my heart hurts, but I'm patient with your decree. I have trust in you. And then you keep remembering that this world is, you know, only for a short time. The next world is forever. And in the next world, Allah will give us whatever we want. So yeah, my dua is that I will be inshallah reunited with my beloved Juju in Jannah. You know, I lost her in this world. It was, you know, not a good situation, but I accepted it that it was, it happened uh, not by my planning, certainly, but my hope in Allah is that he will reward me for my patience and then give me her in Jannah. And that's where you take your complaint. You, you can certainly not always be happy with something that happens that Allah wills, but it's that beautiful patience that says, oh Allah, this is painful for me, but I love you more than this thing. And I will never lose hope in you. That is true Iman. And so do that. Always remember, Allah never puts you through something for without a reason. So even if you're being tested with some difficulty, that there is always a greater meaning to it. Have sabrun jameel with Allah and watch what will happen. He will replace uh, your loss or your pain and he will increase you in blessing and he will remove that pain and distance you from that pain, inshallah, because of your beautiful patience. But the opposite, if you just become grumpy and upset and angry and you have displeasure with the divine decree, this is all from Iblis because he wants you to be stuck in bad feelings all the time and depressed and angry. That's not from, from our tradition. And uh, alhamdulillah, we're, we're Muslim and we have, we have belief in our Lord, right? Okay, so I think I've answered all of your questions. We have gone over 15 minutes. Oh man, I'm so sorry. But thank you to all of you for your, um, oh, it was a cat. My pet was a cat. Um, that's who I lost, my, my cat, Juju. Um, but thank you all for your amazing questions. I'm sorry for the screen issues that we had, but thank you for your patience. Next uh, Tuesday, we'll come back for week three, more diseases of the heart to cover. Um, and I'm uh, looking forward to that. Inshallah, remember to study and go over your notes because there will be a quiz. Inshallah, and I, I look forward to seeing you guys. And thank you so much. And have a wonderful iftar. Keep us in your du'as, okay? Make du'a for me and my family and everybody at MCC for making these classes possible. Sister Humera, who's also um, here uh, facilitating. Make du'a for her and her family. All right. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Um, I'm so happy to be here with you again. Uh, we're this is week three already, huh? We're coming towards the end, but we still have a couple sessions left, so we've covered a lot, mashallah. And let me actually um, pull up. Sorry, one second. Go through the presentation so that we can get to some of the questions, which you guys know, right? You know all of this. I've quizzed you a lot about the author of the text, which is Imam Al Maulud, and the translator of the text. 
which is Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, right? You know all of this, mashallah. Um, but, and we've co covered all the eight hearts, right? So here we're just going to quickly go through them. We've covered all this stuff. Last week, we talked about um, three different diseases. And we, um, I wanted to actually quiz you on them real quickly. Uh, so let's just see here. I want to make sure I'm in the right one, right list. So we have 13, 14, 15. Um, okay, so we covered last week a disease of the heart that talked about when you do something, but your intention isn't for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to see you, but rather for someone else to see you. What is that disease of the heart called? Hmm? <coughs> Alhamdulillah, excuse me. Allergies. We have the windows open today. So my allergies have been up. So anybody want to tell me what's the disease of, oh wait, let me check the chat box, sorry. Um, it was kind of behind there. So the que the question is when you good mashallah yes mean you got it awesome A ostentation is the disease of the heart where you are trying to get attention uh, with your good deeds from other people right you're you're doing it for that niya. What is the Arabic of the word ostentation? Let's see who knows that. Hmm. Very good, Rahil. Awesome. So, uh, Ismail, you got it confused. Riya is, um, uh, wait, hold on. Did I read it wrong? No. Okay, I'm sorry. You got it right. So, Rahil and Ismail, you both got it right. I, I read it wrong. So, Riya is, yes, ostentation. Excellent. And we got Lala Haidara. Very good. So, three of you came in with the answer. Awesome. Mashallah. And then Rahil is coming in with the next uh, uh, disease of the heart, which I was about to ask you. You already jumped the gun and gave me the answer. That's awesome. And you gave me the Arabic. Very happy. But let's see if others can remember as well. This next disease of the heart is when you put your trust in people, right? You're not, you're, you're looking too much at the people in your life and asking their help for everything. Um, and you forget that all help or all assistance really comes from one source, which is, of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what is that? Very good, Zoya. Excellent. Relying on other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when you put your trust or you rely on other than God, that is a disease of the heart. And uh, mashallah, like I said, um, Rahil gave us the Arabic. Can anybody else give the Arabic? I want to see if anybody else can um, can come up with it. Anybody else? The Arabic. Very good, mashallah. <laughs> Excellent. Layla, Rahil, of course, came in first with that answer. And then uh, Lala, excuse me, not Layla. And then Ismail, you said ala ghair something. You know, <laughs> you'll get some points for that. Uh, so excellent, mashallah. Um, and then the last one, I, I saw some uh, people also giving the answer for it. But those of you who don't know, because I'm the only one who can see the answer, well, myself and Sister Hamara. So those of you who don't know yet, what is the disease of the heart when you are not happy about something and you're kind of like, why me? Why did this have to happen to me? Right? What is that called? Okay, awesome. So again, mashallah, Rahil came with both the English and the Arabic. Excellent job. Displeasure with the divine decree. This is a disease of the heart. And that's Sakhat al-Qadr. Very good. Zoya and Dania as well. You guys are coming through. That's fantastic. Mashallah, you guys are paying attention. I love it. So great job. We have so much to cover, you guys, because there's quite a few diseases of the heart left. So um, inshallah. Oh, and then, yeah, we did another one. Oh, Rahil, you, you reminded me. I forgot. Whenever you're trying to, to, so there's ostentation is showing off, but when you want people to hear about your good deeds and you want to be popular and famous, um, that's also a disease of the heart, which we covered, right? And that is suma or seeking reputation. Very good, you guys. So I forgot that we did four last time. Great job, but we do have quite a lot of content to go through today. So let's go ahead and get into the presentation. I'm gonna quickly go through um, the 
presentation from last week because we covered all of this. Uh, we did Khawf al Faqr, oh no, that was the week before. So, thir- on, I mean, Tuesday. So, Thursday is where we did these four ostentation, relying on other than God, displeasure with divine decree, and seeking reputation. So, now we're going to go to week three. Okay, and I have a slide. Where is it? It's coming. Here we go. So, week three. So, Alhamdulillah. A lot of content left. So for today, we're going to cover these three uh, diseases of the heart, false hope, negative thoughts, and vanity, okay? Tul al-amal, su'al al dhan, and then ajib. And uh, the definitions are right here, and we'll go over each one separately, okay? So let's go ahead and jump into it, inshallah. Um False hopes, the first one. So false hopes is the belief that you will live forever, okay? And that belief that, oh, I have all this time makes you heedless, which is careless. Like you're just not really caring about uh, your responsibilities. First and foremost, as we talked about, the most important responsibility we have is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if you start, you know, becoming heedless that means you won't pray on time or you miss your prayers altogether or you just kind of you know don't really care about uh, doing good deeds as much because you're too busy thinking oh I have homework and I have to go I want to watch this movie and I want to listen to this uh, song or I want to play this video game or you get caught up in life and then you keep thinking it's okay I'm young or I'm this I'm that later on in life I will you know, do more good works. Why do I have to do it now, right? I'm a young kid or I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a youth. I have all this time in my life. So that is actually a disease of the heart because nobody knows how much time we have and whatever time we have, we should use it in good deeds, right? We should use it first and foremost, again, to worship Allah subhanahu wa and then to be good to his creation. So a person again, like this, they just, they waste their time a lot. They, who have this disease, they waste their time because they think they have this false idea that they have a long time to live. And so Allah subhanahu wa says about such a person that when death comes, they're going to suddenly wake up and they'll say, man, I wish I had sent ahead some good for my life. Like I wish I did more good deeds because now it's too late once we die right it's too late and then imam ali told us he said that uh, you know most people people are asleep and then when they die they will wake up so what does that mean right what does it mean to to wake up after you die well the idea that people are asleep is something we should uh, kind of better understand that there's a lot of people who are walking around us in a sleep-like state right? Because when you're asleep, what are you doing? You're dreaming, right? So there's people again who are in a dreamlike state. They're walking around, they're talking to people, they're uh, going to work, they're eating, they're just doing a lot, but they uh, think that this world is, you know, going to go on forever. And because they're walking around in a dream-like state, they are forgetful that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expects them to do certain things and they have to do those things. And that also death is imminent, which means it's always around, right? Death is around us and people are dying every day, every minute of every day, even within seconds. I don't know the exact statistic, but every, we could probably say maybe every few seconds someone is dying, right? So we have to be realistic. And then also that the day of judgment is real. So when someone, when we say someone is asleep and then they wake up when they die, that means that all of a sudden the dream of the world is over and they realize like, oh, now I wish I had more, done more good deeds. So it's a very dangerous state to be in. Okay. This, uh, having false hope. So how do we treat it? Well, you have to, as we said, remember that death is real and inevitable and that no one and nothing escapes it. And then understand that life has phases. So a lot of you who are youth, right, you're in a phase of uh, learning, of having fun. It's a very exciting time to be a child. But once you get older, as you get older, you're going to get more and more responsibilities. 
And those responsibilities are important. And you have you can't let that fun of youth uh, start to affect your responsibilities. That you just keep wanting to play like a child for your whole life. All you care about is fun, 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 and entertainment. That is not right. And that's not to say you can't have fun. Of course, we should have fun. Allah made the dunya uh, enjoyable for us, but we should not live to have fun. And that's the difference. So if you want to play with your Legos or you want to play on the computer with a video game or you want to play a board game or you want to do art or play an instrument or anything, a sport that is something that you can do once in a while just because it's enjoyable. But if that's the only reason that you, um, you know, l- like to wake up in the morning or your all your day is just that thing, then you're going to forget a lot. And a lot of people, that's what happens to them. They'll get so caught up in a movie or a video game that they completely uh, forget to, to worship Allah. And I'm going to tell you like how these things can be so addictive. I watched a documentary, which is like a movie last week, about the dangers of you know certain things about the internet and video games. And part of that documentary said that there was a group of people, I won't mention the country, but there, there's a country where the people are so addicted to video games. And I want you to think about this because it's real. And they actually showed, um, you know, a room full of people on their computers playing video games. But they said that it's very common in that country that the people are so addicted to their video games, they actually wear diapers. They will wear, these are adults. They're not children. They're adults who, because they don't want to break from the game, they think that it's okay for them to wear, sit in their seat and just wear a diaper uh, so that they can continue playing their games. I mean, that's a level of extreme that we should all say, astaghfirullah, we should never want that. But this is the danger of thinking, uh, getting careless with your time and thinking, oh, it's no big deal. You know, I'm just going to, um, I have plenty of time when I'm older and then I'll do things. So let me just keep having fun, fun, fun. No, when you reach the age of adolescence, which your parents will talk to you about, hopefully, if you don't know about it yet, but it's the age where a child starts to become more like an adult. Well, in Islam, when that happens, then you are considered what balik, which means that you are now accountable. So you have to uh, start doing all of the same things. You have to start fasting and praying. You are treated like an adult. And so you can't just think, oh, because I'm still in school and I am treated like a child, maybe by other people, that I shouldn't do my responsibilities. No, we have responsibilities to Allah and we should fulfill those responsibilities. And then we also know that we worship Allah and the real fun is in the next life. Jannah is where we're going to have a lot of fun and we don't have to worry about going to the bathroom in Jannah. So there's no need for diapers. Uh, We can eat and we can enjoy life and everything is great, inshallah, okay? So that's what the treatment is to keep your mind focused. Death is always near. I shouldn't think I have that much time and I should remember to prioritize and worship Allah as he deserves, inshallah. So this is the Treatment for the disease of the heart, tul al-amal, false hopes. So let's go ahead and go to the next disease. So negative thoughts. This is su'adhan, okay? So su'adhan is a very serious disease of the heart because it's just having suspicion or bad thoughts about someone without really any evidence, right? There's nothing at all that you would that would tell you that someone is a bad person or that you shouldn't like them except for your own thoughts. So it's not like you saw them do something bad or you believe that they were guilty of something bad because there was evidence. You just have a suspicious mind or heart and then you start to think really bad things about them. Well, this is not permissible. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, oh, you who believe, avoid suspicion for some suspicion is sinful. So when you have, you let your heart become suspicious of people, it's not good to do that unless that person, like if someone comes and they have, uh, you know, they're, they have, let's say their hands in their pocket and one, and and their finger looks like 
you know, or, or something looks like maybe it's a gun or a weapon, that's not being suspicious without evidence. You could look at them and go, that person looks really suspicious. Why are they walking around with their hands like that? Is that a gun in their pocket? Oh my gosh, that's, and you could, you know, protect other people because you're acting on that thing, thought. But that, so that's not what we're talking about. This is just having a bad thought about someone for really no reason at all. And that's why it's not permissible. And then the other thing is that we have to remember when you have negative thoughts about someone for really no reason, the danger is that it's usually going to not stay inside of you. Those thoughts want to come out. So you want to wait till your friend comes or your sister or your brother, and then you want to say, oh, look at that person. They look so weird. And then you start both of you mocking them and making fun of them. And I bet you they're like this. And I bet you, you know, you start talking really badly about a person and they're totally innocent. They've done nothing. Thing. So this is the danger is that you start to what lead to bad words and then you got another person involved too and now whatever they do is also on you right so negative thoughts are 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 problematic in so many ways you they they're just showing that you have a suspicious heart but then also leading you to gossip and to bring someone else into sinful behavior with you. Because when you gossip, you need someone else there with you, right? You're doing it together. So this is why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam warned us that he who believes in Allah and the last day must either speak good or remain silent. So this is a warning about speaking good, but of course, like we said, negative thoughts, if you don't stop them, they'll lead you to not speaking very good. And so... It's a disease of the heart that can cause so many problems. And so this is also another really important hadith to, to remember. Every day when we wake up in the morning, our limbs, right, uh, which are different parts of our body, as is in this picture here, they actually all go to the tongue and they say, oh, tongue, fear Allah, like fear Allah, tongue, because the tongue gets us in trouble and it's connected to negative thoughts. Like I said, if you have a bad thought about someone, it's not going to stay inside you. Eventually it's going to want to come out. And then now you're lying maybe about someone, you're gossiping, you're spreading slander, which are all like, you know, really haram. They're not acceptable. So this is why your body aware of the danger of the tongue asks the tongue, like fear Allah. And then it says, why? Because we're going to be punished or rewarded based on what you do. So if you're straight, which means you speak the truth and you fear Allah, then all of us will be good. But if you're not, then you get all of us in trouble, right? So your hands, your feet, your uh, eyes, your ears, all of it is like basically telling the tongue, stop getting all of us in trouble because you can't control yourself right and but again the tongue it doesn't act on its own it acts on what's going on in the heart and in the mind so this is why you have to be careful of those negative thoughts because it will eventually lead to negative actions for the whole body right so very important disease of the heart for us to know so the treatment this is the process i'm telling us very clearly what not to do First, you stop being suspicious of people, okay? Then you don't look for faults in other people and you don't spy. Stop trying to find someone's problems. You know, some people, they, that's all they do. They just watch people all day long and look for things that are uh, the flaws in them or faults in them. Um, or they, you know, like you'll be in a classroom setting or in a meeting or at the masjid. And there's people who just like to watch other people uh, do something that's going to embarrass them, that they can laugh at, that they can mock. And then they go and tell their friends or whoever, oh, yeah, this guy in the masjid, he did this. And then guess what happened? Then he did this. And then you're just looking for, you know, it's not a good thing to do because all you're doing is spending time, uh, wasting your time, actually, and speaking ill about another person who's totally innocent, they came to worship Allah or do something, you know, whether you're at the masjid or somewhere like the library or a restaurant or anything, people are there to do something. And now you're just making fun of them. You know, it's really wrong. So you don't look for faults. You don't spy. You don't watch people, right? You're, you, and he also says, do not be jealous of one another because sometimes negative thoughts come from jealousy and hasad, right? Which we talked about before. 
Do not uh, desert, which is like uh, to cut your relation with one another. Don't um, cut off ties and do not hate one another. Oh, uh, and oh, Allah's worshipers, be brothers, Allah has, which Allah has ordered you to be, right? So all of these are ways that we can protect ourselves from having negative thoughts. They start with those suspicions, right? Don't have suspicions in the first place and don't actively try to find things that you can talk about someone else about. Don't get yourself involved in that type of uh uh, deed because it's a bad deed and it's haram and it usually like i said it's uh, it, that kind of stuff says suggests that you're likely jealous or you have envy of the person or you're just someone who likes to waste your time doing things that are wrong so in every case it's uh it's uh, not uh, acceptable and that's why the prophet is warning us not to do these things so this is how we inshallah stop uh, those thoughts. And to remember that the angels are recording everything, right? All of our good deeds are being recorded. So nothing will be forgotten. You want to be very careful that if your negative thoughts turn into negative actions, that Allah is counting all of that. And that's what you're going to be held accountable for on the day of judgment. So don't think it's just going to, you know, nothing's going to happen, right? Be very careful. So that's the uh, disease of negative thoughts. Um, now, the next one is, let's read this one here. Did you know that there are some people afflicted with this next disease and they can't help but see themselves as very, very special? They actually walk around very proud of themselves and often looking down on other people. They completely reject the fact that every good that they have is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in this picture, you see, uh, I'm sure you can see what they are. They're just a bunch of eggs, right? But if you look at this egg on top, it's got some special things, right? It's got a shiny color and it's wearing a crown and it looks at itself as better. And that's why it's walking actually on top of these other eggs. And they're definitely not happy about it, right? But there are some people that walk around this way because maybe they Allah gave them wealth or they gave he gave them beauty or he gave them privilege and power. Maybe they come from like a family that has a lot of power and whatever it is that they have, they become very uh, what arrogant and 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 vain about it. And we're going to talk about this word. OK, vain. What does that mean? So vain or vanity ajab, is a disease of the heart where someone is so full of pride for their, for their blessings um, that could be about their appearance, which is the way they look, or achievements. So you could be vain about your, your schoolwork. Let's say you got really good grades, you know, and your teachers, you were top of your class and you won some awards at school. That can make you vain, where you start to think that you're really good and you're better than other people, right? And when you get stuck on thinking that it's coming from you, this is the disease. Because to say that, alhamdulillah, Allah gave me a blessing, alhamdulillah, I'm so grateful for that blessing, there's nothing wrong with recognizing the gifts that Allah has given you, okay? But when you think that you are the reason for those gifts, like you're giving credit only to yourself, and then you treat other people a certain way, this is clearly a disease of the heart because Allah is the source of all of our good. And we're going to talk about that in a second. So the Prophet here tells us, eat and drink, give charity and wear clothes, as long as that does not involve any extravagance or vanity. So what he's telling us here is enjoy the blessings of your life, right? Eat and drink. Allah's given you a life where you can enjoy good food and good drink. Um, Alhamdulillah, that's great. And give charity, wear clothes. So you can actually wear nice clothing and be a charitable person, right? Be a generous person. But don't do it in a way that makes you feel like you're better than other people or with extravagance, which is you're going over the top, right? If you eat and drink and let's say you only eat at the best restaurants, okay? 
I can't ever eat at this restaurant because it's not, you know, it's not clean enough for me or it's not uh, this enough for me. And you just kind of are very boastful about the fact that you want to eat a special kind of food and it's, you know, very decadent, which is like rich and maybe it's a very expensive meal, but that you walk around and you just carry yourself like, look at me, I'm so better. I only eat at the best restaurants, right? And that's all I put in my body. Or when you wear clothing, you also do the same thing. You only wear brand name clothing and, oh, I would never shop there, right? I would never go to that store because I don't, their clothing just is so below my style. I need the best of the best. And so this kind of attitude that you are better than other people, and even that can happen when you're being charitable. There are people who are very arrogant, even when they're giving to other people, they're acting like they're, you know, so generous and you should be so thankful that I'm even looking at your direction and giving you money or giving you food or whatever that they're giving. So here, this is a clear warning, like do things because we're human and we live in this world, we can do certain things and enjoy those things, but make sure you do not do them in excess, which is what extravagance is, where you're going over the top and you're just being really a little bit too much, too extra, as they say, or you're doing it with vanity, where you think that you are so special uh, that you're better than other people. And you know we're going to explain a little bit more about this. So now arrogance is very closely related to ajib, okay? The difference is that arrogance requires two people. So if you're an arrogant person, and that's coming, it's one of the diseases we'll cover soon, boasting and arrogance, it's coming. But if you're an arrogant person, you need other people, right? To uh, display your arrogance too. Like, so you walk around, Again, treating people like they're less than you and not good, right? Good enough. Vanity doesn't need another person. Uh, Ajib is really just about a person being so full of themselves, thinking that all of their good is from them, that there's no mention of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that you know, they're not, not really thinking about all of the great the gifts that Allah's given them and they don't make gratitude to Allah, but rather they attribute all their good deeds to themselves. So what Ajib and how they're different in, is, is the attribution, right? That, uh, well, they're, I'm sorry, they're both attributed wrongly, but they're, it's also the audience. For Ajib, you don't need an audience. It's, you're the only audience. It's, it's, it's you. It's you thinking that you are good looking because you, you know, have great genes or, you know, your uh, skin is, you take care of your skin and you, you have a great, um, you know, sort of a makeup routine if you're if you wear makeup or your hair is so nice because you take care of it but you constantly keep again putting the focus on yourself right and then kibbutz or arrogance which we're going to again talk about soon is where you think all of these things and then <clears throat> excuse me you actually treat other people like they're less than you and you uh, puff yourself up in front of people. Both of these qualities are interrelated, uh, inshallah. Okay, so, um, and inshallah, I'm sorry, we'll, we'll talk about it uh, more when we get to boastfulness uh, and arrogance, but it's important to understand that they're very, very closely tied. And then, you know, the danger again of, of vanity and arrogance is that it, it allows this pride and arrogance into the heart, right? And the Prophet ﷺ told us that no one who has the weight of a seed, of a single seed of arrogance in his heart or her heart will enter paradise. This should make all of us never want to ever have ajib or be boastful, show off, right? We talked about ostentation, riya. We talked about suma. We talked about all these diseases of the heart, which really is about showing off and, you know, being and allowing these things because they kind of all work together eventually, right? You start to develop all of these diseases of the heart. But at the root of it is that you deny that the good that you have is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And all that matters is that he is pleased with you. And instead, you start focusing on other people and trying to show off to them. And then you start thinking you're better than them. So this is how it all works, right? So it's a trap of shaitan. 
And so, um, you know, in this hadith, when the Prophet ﷺ said that about the weight of a seed of arrogance in his heart, someone was like, but what if like a man loves to have beautiful clothes and shoes, right? So he's worried because he's like, "Uh oh, I don't want to have uh, arrogance, but I, at the same time, I like to have nice stuff. What about that? Is there anything wrong with that, right? And then the Prophet ﷺ replied, he said, what? Verily, Allah is beautiful and he loves beauty. Arrogance means rejecting the truth and looking down on people. So this is not about not having nice things, okay? Um, you can definitely like nice things and have nice things. It's about your attitude when you walk around in those nice things or when you're, um, you know, again, getting certain attention for things. How do you see yourself with regards to other people? That's what this disease of the heart is talking about. So let's again explore this just a little further. So here's this hadith again, the same exact hadith, right? Um, so I want to make it clear. Um, the seed that we're talking about. Look, at these are seeds. These are multiple seeds, okay, in someone's hand. Now, when he tells us that the weight of a seed, he didn't say a lot of seeds. He said a seed, right? One seed of arrogance. So you can see how tiny a seed of arrogance is. And he's telling us, if you have that much arrogance in your heart, you will not enter paradise. Audhu billah. We have to make a lot of toba from this disease of the heart if we have it and ask Allah to remove it from our hearts and to ask him to protect our hearts from it because we don't want to ever think of ourselves in a way that is arrogant. Whether that means we just are so prideful of what we have and we walk around even within our own hearts and go, oh, like, I have such nice eyes and my uh, teeth are so white and my hair is so beautiful and my skin is so this, you know, like whatever the thought is that comes to you that makes you feel prideful is a dangerous thought because you're not uh, remembering it's all from Allah and he can take it away any minute. There are so many people that had, you know, a lot of good and khayr in their life and everything was going well and it was taken away. A lot of stories, like if you ask your parents to tell you the story of Prophet Ayyub, uh, alayhi salam, and see how he was tested, he had everything. He had a great life and then Allah tested him uh, and took everything away and see how he responded. But that can happen to someone at any time in their life. So if you start to uh, think these things, that's the danger is that you can have them taken away from you. Instead, always say, Alhamdulillah wa shukrulillah. Thank you, Allah, for all of the blessings you've given me, for my health, for my wealth, for the parents I have, just constantly remembering it was all from Allah. It's not from you. And even if you go further, like in school and you get into a good college and you get a great job, eventually, inshallah, that'll happen for all of you where you will succeed. You want to always remember that every part of that success is from Allah, all of it. Even if you did the hard work, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> Even if you uh, stayed up late and you worked on a bunch of projects and research uh, research papers and, and did a lot of work on tests and exams and you did all the work yourself, you can't say that it's your work that led you to that success. All of it is from Allah because Allah is the one who gave you the means to do it. He gave you the brain, the capacity, the time. All of that comes from him. And if he didn't give you those things, you wouldn't have been able to achieve any good in your life. So this is how we push back against those, those thoughts is no, it's all from Allah. And I'm just going to always say, say thank you to him instead of letting my heart get puffed up and thinking uh, of myself as something special. Because, you know, a lot of, um, you'll find that adults and other people in your life They'll start to compliment you more on certain things. And this is how some of these diseases can take root because those compliments feel good. It's nice to have someone say, wow, you play basketball so good. Or, oh my gosh, you're such a talented writer and you speak so nicely and look how well you're dressed. And, oh, I love your hair. And, oh, you know, and they just throw all these compliments at you. It's very natural for the human being to like those things. But you have to remember, if you start to believe that those things are from you, and then you let that to make you feel 
special like that egg in the beginning, there's definitely a problem there. Okay. So back to the Hadith. Now you see the different pictures here, right? This, the man was worried about all the, he loves to have beautiful clothes and shoes. Nothing wrong with that, right? Allah loves when we take care of things and uh, we, we beautify things and we have beautiful possessions because he himself is beautiful. So to be uh, to love beautiful things is not the problem. It's when you let those beautiful things make you feel that you are what better and you look down on people. So if you look at this picture, this is kind of how you want to imagine someone who is full of arrogance, uh, whether they are arrogant, uh, have arrogance or vanity, because they both can have the same attitude of feeling superior to other people. Okay, they just feel like they're more special, extra special, and they see the world in this way where it's like, I am so big and important, and I matter, and you're just this tiny little person, and you don't matter very much. This is safrullah, big problem, big disease of the heart. We should all ask Allah for protection from. Okay, and so how do you treat? vanity. Well, first, as we've been saying, you have to realize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the source of all good and you have to be grateful to him always. Never stop in your gratitude to Allah. And you have to remember that he's aware of everything we do. So those thoughts that you're having and, you know, don't think that you can hide those thoughts. If they're there, he knows they're there. Uh, he knows everything. And so Remember to check your heart to, uh, you know, go inward. Like when you're having a thought about yourself, it, um, you know, let's say, like I said, you're in uh, a competition, you know, at the masjid, or maybe you're in the Boy Scouts or the Girl Scouts, or maybe you're in something else, uh, you know, that, that's happening at school. If there's some type of a, uh, you know, competition going on and you start thinking of yourself as like, you know what, I'm going to win. I'm really good at this. I'm so, um, you know, better than everybody else. And I'm, I'm so much smarter than everybody else. I've got this, you know, even if it's a thought in your own mind, right? You have to stop and go, Astaghfirullah, why am I thinking that? All good is from Allah. I shouldn't ever think that about myself, right? And just uh, ask Allah, if you want to win, you can certainly compete, but don't do it with those thoughts, right? You want to check yourself. And then to remember, uh, or the, Allah tells us here, um, above all those who have knowledge is the all-knowing, that is God, right? Allah knows everything. And what comes to you of good is from Allah. So every good thing that you have is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And every bad thing that happens to you is from your own self. That's the, the rest of the ayah. Um, but anyway, so uh, the other thing is also you never walk around with arrogance in your heart because of the way you're dressed, your accomplishments, education, work, wealth, your lineage, if you're cultural, you know, some people are very culturally proud. You know, they, they like to say, well, I'm from this country and I'm this and where I come from this family. None of that matters to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What matters is what we talked about in the first session, qalbun salim, that beautiful heart that you take to Allah. That's what matters more than anything not all of these other things. So you don't want to let those things make you feel arrogant towards people or vain. So here is another hadith that's an important one um, because it clarifies something here. So when the Prophet was teaching people, right, he said, uh, whoever drags his garment out of pride will not be looked upon by Allah on the day of resurrection. So what that means are there's some people in this world uh, especially in that time, and even there are places where they still do this, like royalty or people who are who see themselves as very uh, high bred, which means like they are, um, you know, come from a very high family, and um, you know they see themselves as maybe they have power or wealth or name or status. They will sometimes wear clothing that drags on the floor. And a lot of celebrities actually do this too. If you look at some of the big awards that celebrities get for movies or music, um, you know, or even just other uh, big events that celebrities go to a lot of times, uh, most of the stories about the event are with the clothing that they're wearing. And they'll go on the runway or the uh, the red carpet, sorry, not the runway, the red carpet, which is where everybody comes before they go into the event. There's like hundreds of 
cameras, taking pictures of these people, and they are uh, coming out of their cars. Sometimes some of these people, because their outfits are so uh, like this, they, they're, they, they're very long, they have uh, assistants, like people who are helpers, carrying their dresses, like women and sometimes men too, if they're wearing like a long coat or something, but they'll have like people that work for them behind them carrying this long train and it's just dragging on the ground but they do it to say i'm so wealthy i have so much money that i can wear a dress or a suit or a coat or whatever and it can just drag all over the floor behind me and everybody will know that i have come into this room because i'm so important this is the attitude that a lot of people have when they uh, dress this way. It's a very arrogant attitude. So when Allah says, whoever drags his garment out of pride, right? Um, they won't be looked upon on the day of judgment. What Abu Bakr, who was his best friend, right? Uh, and he worried, he got worried because he's like, what? Like dragging the garment, like my, sometimes my robe, you know, they used to wear certain clothes that were, uh, sometimes it would fall to the ground or slide down. So he was like, oh my gosh, am, I, I don't want to have, be part of this group of people. So he panicked and he said, uh, one of my robes slides down if I'm not cautious, like if I'm not paying attention, what do I do? And then the Prophet said to him, what he calmed him down and he said very clearly verily you are not doing it out of pride so this hadith tells us first what we shouldn't do but also to remember it's the attitude that it, we're talking about it's not just the action because allah the prophet taught us right innam al-a'malu bin niyat which is every action that we do in this world is judged by our intentions so allah is looking at the heart of the person who does this because some people maybe it's their culture like for example someone's actually asking about wedding dresses in the comments that's a good point because in many cultures the wedding dress should have a train it's kind of like part of you know being the bride so is the intention of that bride to walk around saying i'm better than everybody no, most brides don't think that, you know, most people are good people. They don't have that arrogance or a lot of people, but when you, uh, so that's like a cultural thing, but if it's done with the intention of pride, this is where it's really wrong, right? And this is what we're talking about. Vanity, where you walk around and, and, and even though this hadith is talking about dragging the garment, you also want to look at wearing certain clothes but still feeling prideful because as you get older and then you guys start working and getting your own jobs and money you might want to buy some really nice clothing and you might want to start getting some things that you could you know couldn't afford when you were a kid uh, but now that you're making your own money you want to buy maybe a purse or a wallet or a car or anything where there's something that makes you feel really good being wearing that thing but check your heart and check your intentions. Because if in your heart, you start to think like, look at me, I'm so cool. I have this, you know, uh, name brand name purse, or look at my watch or my glasses or my hat or my car or whatever. I'm so much better than everybody else. This is what we're talking about. It's a, it's a disease of the heart of being overly vain and thinking that you, um, you know, did it, uh, that it's all, because of you, that you have those things and you forget that Allah is the one who gave it to you. And then it leads to arrogance, which is you start to think about other people that they're less than you. And all of this is completely uh, wrong in our faith. We do not engage in that type of behavior. So we stop it at the root, which is Alhamdulillah wa shukrulillah. Thank you, Ya Allah, for everything you've given me. And I recognize that just as you gave it to me, you can always take it away from me. And I'm just grateful to have it. And that's it. You don't, you know, go beyond that. Okay, so that is the last uh, disease of the heart that we're going to talk about today. And then we will have our next session on Thursday. So let's go ahead and go to questions, inshallah. I want to hear from you guys. Who has some questions, some comments? Who wants to know more about 
these diseases of the heart as we've been talking about. Let me look up here. Someone said, okay, there was a celebrity at the Grammys who dressed that way. Um, yeah, they had a long dress. Oh, I see it all the time with celebrities. A lot of them will have their, uh, their dresses just trailing behind. What if you're holding the trail? Well, if that's your job, you know what? You're just doing your job. You're getting paid. Some people need work. You know, you don't want to tell that person that they're a bad person. Um, a lot of these people, like I said, it's just their job. They have no choice. They have to do it. But <clears throat> so Lala's asking, is a wedding dress with train okay as long as you're not doing it in vain? Well, I think, again, because it's a culturally accepted tradition, I don't have a clear like fatwa or anything that says, yes, wedding dresses are okay. But we can take the meaning from this hadith that says it's really about the intention because sometimes you might, um, you know, have a garment that just is made a little longer than maybe you would have liked, but you needed to wear it at a wedding or some event. Can we say right away that that person is arrogant and, and or prideful? No, it's about the intention. But it's preferred to try to avoid any type of display that could maybe make people think that about you, you know, that you are that way. So if it's avoidable, you can avoid it. But I can't, you know, I don't, I don't uh, have a clear answer as far as are certain dresses okay because they're culturally accepted. It's more just to say that the intention is what we're looking at, inshallah. Okay. Someone is asking, you only talked about hating on people. So are you allowed to still hate on things? <laughs> so I think this was referring to the su'adhan. So it's a good question. Uh, I mean, I think it really depends on the situation. To have negative thoughts in general, to be a negative person is really not a good quality. Um, you're likely not going to have a lot of friends if you're always, they call them right, the Debbie Downer, for example, uh, which is like a term that's referred to someone who's always down, who's always like just negative energy, right? Negative Nancy. I don't know why they're always women names. We need to come up with negative Ned. There is actually negative Ned. So it's not always women, but the names are just like, like they're just names that describe people that sometimes have way too much negative energy. So you should not make it okay to say, oh, I'm not going to have su'adhan on uh, people, but sure, on everything else, I'm just going to walk around being negative. No, try to have a positive view of things, right? Try to be balanced. And if something is, is you know, bad, sure, you can think badly of it because it is bad, right? You don't have to think positive about, you know, a swamp or a sewer, you know, that's gross. It's dirty. So you can be like, Ugh, to something like that. But, uh, you know, when it's just things in creation or objects, you don't need to walk around with a negative attitude. Okay. Uh, let's see. We have a lot of other questions here. Can you wear expensive clothes? We did talk about this in previous sessions. There's nothing wrong with wearing uh, nice clothing, but it's really a matter of uh, how much, right? Like if, if you are insisting on only wearing a certain brand or a certain type of clothing and you refuse to wear like normal clothing that other everybody else wears, then there might be, you know, something you want to look at there. But if you like to have some nice things and you're looking at quality, because sometimes more expensive things are made really well, they're tailored and they're made like with better stitching and, you know, better fabric. Um, and you like to keep, there's nothing wrong with that at all. As long as, again, you recognize that these are gifts from a lot and you're not extravagant. Extravagance is like where you're doing it too much. It's not balanced. It's, and, and it's likely again, because you think of yourself maybe as better. And so there's other problems there that you want to look at. If that, if, if it leads to behavior where, you know, you just want to go. And like I said, you are exclusively only wanting to wear a certain type of clothing. And there are people like that, that are very kind of snobby when it comes to these things so that we want to avoid that. Right. Um, so, oh, good question. <clears throat> Can you compare, for example, with your friend that you have a better voice than Quran? Would that be a good competition or bad? That's a good uh, question. You know, 
if you're both like studying to be uh, reciters or you're both in a Quran class and the teacher is helping you both on your skills to become better reciters and know more Quran, there's nothing wrong as long as it's a healthy competition, but you shouldn't, you should want your friend to also succeed, right? So this is where want for your brother, what you want for yourself really matters because just, you know, being in a competition with someone that you, um, that you're friends with is, is fine. As long as the spirit of the competition is, uh, full of love and it's not, uh, you know, something where it's like, I don't want you to succeed because I want to win. That's, you know, not good. Like they call it sportsmanship. Sportsmanship is to say, may the best person win and really truly mean it. So if you're in a competition with your friend and you're both working really hard, you succeed, he succeeds, you should want him to succeed or her if it's a girl. And you should keep going until the judge or whoever it is, your teacher decides who the winner is and be happy for them. <clears throat> but if it's like you're competing to the point where you really don't want them to win because you have to be on top of it and that makes you feel better, that's definitely a problem. You know, so there, that's not a form of healthy competition. Healthy competition is wanting good for everybody and celebrating like just the excitement of the competition, you know, like, oh, we just, we got to compete with each other. It was fun. And then letting it go because at the end of the day, especially with Quran, there is nobody who loses, you know, if you, uh, you're a winner in, in every case, if you won the competition of recitation, according to the judges or not, you're a winner with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because for you to spend your days practicing and trying to become better at the book of Allah, already you've won, you've won more than you could even imagine. So just don't make it a big deal. Like, oh, I have to win this title or this award or this thing. No, when Allah sees, a, especially if you're a youth and you are so connected to his book, you're already a winner, right? So Alhamdulillah. Um, okay. We have a few more minutes left. I'm, I'm scrolling to see these questions, making sure I don't miss, because I always hear it. Well, at least for my kids, mommy, you didn't answer my question. <laughs> Is hating on cigarettes bad? Sure. That's a great question, actually, because when we hate something, hate is a very strong word, first of all, right? But when we hate something, it should always be tied with whatever displeases Allah. So you can hate things that you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet didn't like or they hate it, right? So sure, any type of a intoxicant or drug or you know, like alcohol, things that are harmful, Sure, you can hate them because they 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 have no benefit. It brings harm to the world. It brings harm to people, right? So that's perfectly fine. That's a good question. Thank you for asking. Um, let's see. Thank you, sweetheart, uh, Rahil John. Thank you so much for your very sweet comment. Uh, they have to leave. I appreciate your um, your taking the time to thank me. And your very uh, kind message. Khudafis, assalamu alaikum to you and your brother. Let's see. Um, I have another question. So I have a question that says, what if someone was wearing really nice shoes and then his friend was wearing like ripped shoes, right? So the shoe that his friend is wearing is not in a good condition. And the guy with the nice shoes says, mine are newer and better right? Is this permissible? Well, you guys, I hope you know the answer. If you're going to make someone else feel bad because their clothing or what they have is not as nice as you and you want to show off and say mine are better and nicer, that is not good at all to do because as we just said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may have blessed you with nicer shoes, but your character isn't very good, right? If you do something like that, that's not having good character. Good adab is not ever making someone feel bad or looking down on them and mocking their things uh, and making them feel like they are less than you. That's bad adab. So even if your shoes are good, the bigger issue is that you have bad character. And that means that you're probably not in good state with Allah. So you should ask Allah to remove that from your heart, that I don't want to ever make someone feel bad uh, because of the way they're dressed and then comparing with my stuff because I have nicer things. 
no, that's not uh, humble. You should have humility. And as we've been saying, know that whatever good Allah's given you, he can always take it back. So, uh, and the quickest way for that to happen is to show arrogance, right? If you show arrogance, you the blessings will be removed from you. And the opposite is true. If you show gratitude and humility and you're kind to other people and you do good deeds, Allah will increase you in your blessings. So it's up to you. What do you want? You want to risk losing all the nice things you have or you want to keep them, right? Uh, so inshallah, you shouldn't do that. Um, oh, thank you so much, mashallah, Sister Shaisa, for your very nice comment. Um, Oh, mashallah. Okay, I think so. I'm trying to jog my memory. I think so. I need to know how old you are because this is a youth class, so I'm not sure if I'm talking to a youth or an adult. But thank you, Sister Shaista, for your lovely comment. I hope to meet you again. Um, what are your okay? So I have another question. What if you're trying not to make them feel bad, or the person says something mean back? You know, if someone is being like petty and they're mocking you, don't go down to their level. You know, be above it. Just look at them and say, "I'm not gonna do that because you're, you know, you're wrong, and Allah is not happy with you." If I say the same thing back to you or I give you a comeback, then I'm the same as you because. You said something rude and not nice. And now if I'm trying to defend myself and do the same thing, how is that any better, right? So when you have people that are mean and rude, it's just better to just let it go um, and not to make it make give them the importance, right? Because if you sit there and you go back and forth and back and forth, you're telling them that uh, I'm going to give you my time, but your time is very important. And you should say, nope, I'm not going to waste my time on that. And that sends actually a much stronger message to that person because they want you, you know, sometimes people are incite you. They want to make you angry. They want to make you mad. So if you're like, uh, -uh I don't, I'm not doing that. I got better things to do than waste my time on, on that. It'll, upset them even more because they're like, oh, I really wanted them to, uh, to get a reaction out of you. So that's actually a more powerful position to just say, nope, not having it and to walk away instead of giving in, fighting, arguing back and forth. And then everybody's kind of like, okay, this is pointless and either or that, or it could turn into something heated and you end up causing a bigger problem, right? So why do that? Just walk away. You're in a position of power and control. And the other person is just left there by themselves with nobody to complain to. So you win. Okay, mashallah. So, um, so I get another question. This will be the last question, then we'll end it. If someone has nice shoes and another person has a nice shirt, is it okay to tease each other? So whenever you're competing and it's all out of love, um, you know, it's all good. If it's, if it's out of love and there's a spirit of, um, of you know, just happiness and, and teasing in, in a gentle way, there's nothing wrong with that. But it's when it starts to get really mean and you're looking down on people and you're letting that into your heart. That's when, when it's a problem. Okay. All right. Alhamdulillah. So thank you, everybody, for being here. Jazakumullah khairan. Uh, inshallah, we will see you on Thursday. Okay, so come back for our, what is it, fifth class? No, sixth class is on Thursday. All right, uh, inshallah, we'll go ahead and then thank you. Jazakallah khair and thank you, Amen. And please say salams to your family as well, all of you. Thank you, guys. Inshallah, we'll see you Thursday. We'll end in dua. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa la'asr inna l-insana la fi khusr illa ladhina amanu wa amru s-salihati wa tawasu bil-haqi wa tawasu bil-sabr. Subhanu rabbika rabbil izzati amma yusikun. Wa salamun ala al-mursaleen. Wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Alhamdulillah. All right. Jazakallah khairan. Salam alaykum, everybody. Take care. Okay, alhamdulillah, bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya'i wal mursaleen, Sayyidina wa Mawlana wa Habibina Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam, tasliman kathiran. Thank you, everybody, for your patience. I am sorry for being a little late today. I actually was recording another class uh, that went over uh, a few minutes, and so I am... Um, quickly messaged uh, Sister Romero. She messaged me actually, uh, and I let her know that I'll be a little late. So I appreciate your patience. 
Um, I want to uh, get started with, uh, as we have been, doing a little bit of a review. So let's talk about uh, some of the diseases that we covered last week, inshallah, okay? So uh, let me actually open up the chat box, make sure you guys are all listening and paying attention, inshallah, okay? Uh, oh, you guys are so sweet with your comments. Thank you. So the uh, first uh, disease I'm going to ask you about, okay? This is when you, um, when you think things that aren't necessarily true and one of the hadith that were taught about this is that the tongue will wake up every morning and tell the body to fear Allah. Uh, what disease of the heart did we learn that talks about negative thoughts and you know this uh, ability of the tongue to take you into that um, direction? Okay, there we go, mashallah. So we got Afnan and Bilal. Very good. Both of you, Afnan and Bilal, uh, message pretty much the same time with the correct answer. So negative thoughts, I kind of gave it away in my, um, I, I subtly put that in there to see if you guys are paying attention, but you answered before that anyway. So negative thoughts is a disease of the heart, and this is called su'adhan or su'adhan, okay? So when you have, basically, there's no evidence, there's no proof whatsoever, you just have a a bad idea of someone, right? So that is called so then. And okay, so great. I'm glad you guys are on it. Now, um, this disease of the heart uh, has to do with, let's see, I'm going to try to keep it a little uh, not so predictable because I see some of you think you're already putting in answers before I ask. So that tells me you think I'm too predictable, <laughs> which I probably have been. Um, but okay, so let me see here. Um, for this, okay, let's see, this, now I'm going to get you. This, when we talked about this hadith, we related a hadith or a saying, I should say, a quote by Imam Ali, uh, radiallahu an, and he said that people are asleep and when they die, they wake up. Which disease of the heart related to that, to that quote? Awesome. Mashallah, Zoya and Dania, you guys got it right away. Great job. False hopes, tulal amal. Okay, so uh, thinking that you're going to live forever, right? That's the problem with it's a disease of the heart. If you think that you're going to live forever, it makes you careless and heedless, which we're going to talk about today uh, in this world. And it's kind of like you're walking around asleep. You're not really uh, awake to the world, right? You're you're in a dreamlike state because you're not paying attention to what's really going on in front of you. So very good awesome you guys okay uh now this disease of the heart um had to do with suspicion and not being suspicious of people right having thoughts about people for no uh reason right just thinking uh or wanting to um uh, look into prying right prying behavior being suspicious you're trying to find out information about people with really no reason um so let's see who got this very good so rahil excellent negative thoughts i went back to the same one i'm not going to be predictable you guys <laughs> okay, good job. You got it. So you might get a question uh, or m multiple questions on the same disease. Okay, so this disease of the heart has to do. And the Prophet Sallallahu taught us that it's very much related to kibir. Okay, so this disease is related to kibir, and which we'll talk about soon. But um, the Prophet Sallallahu taught us that no one has the weight of a seed of of this particular quality in their heart will enter paradise. What is it? Okay, very good. So Amen uh, and Uthman, you gave us the English, which is vanity. Very good. Um, and Bilal also gave us the English. But uh, Lala Haidara, she came with both answers. So great job, vanity and ajib. Okay, so uh, anytime you're vain, right? Being vain is... is uh, being consumed with self-adoration. Adoration is like you admire yourself, you adore yourself, you love yourself. That's vanity. And so it's really about the individual and themselves, and you're not giving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala any credit for anything. You're just, oh, I love myself. I'm so smart. I'm so talented. I'm such a good basketball player. I'm such a good tennis player. Or I can play the piano. Or I dress so nicely. I have such nice hair. So you're just constantly very focused on all of your qualities, but you don't 
give credit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that is ajab. Um, and then kibir, which is what the Arabic word for one of the diseases of the heart, which we're going to talk about next week, is arrogance, right? And arrogance is um, is requires, so it's different in that it requires other people. So a, a vain person is just very consumed with their own feelings of importance. But an arrogant person is not only vain, but they also look down on other people. So that's the way that you tell the difference, that uh, vanity doesn't require people. Arrogance does, but they both can sometimes affect each other or one can certainly lead to the other. If you are vain and you keep, you know, increasing in ajab, you're likely going to develop arrogance, right? Where you start to look down on people. And so that's why we talked about uh, that hadith. Very good. Um, okay. And so another question, and this will be the last one, and then we'll continue. Um, let's see here. This one, uh, let me give you a good one. One that is not so predictable. Hmm. Okay, so the Prophet said, and we talked about a hadith here uh, where, where um, he taught us that he who believes in Allah and the last day must either speak good or remain silent. Which disease of the heart was that about? Which disease of the heart did we cover when we talked about that? Anybody know? Very good. Okay, awesome. So Ahsan came with the answer. So the negative thoughts. Yes. To uh, have negative thoughts, remember the danger of it is that it often leads to false speech or wrong speech. And so uh, that's why we related this hadith is because usually you can't keep negative thoughts to yourself. So it actually is, is dangerous in and of itself as a disease, but it also leads to other diseases like gossiping and backbiting and speaking ill of people. So that's why this hadith is remind, it's a reminder for us that whoever believes in Allah in the last day, if you're a Muslim, but just speak good. Don't speak uh, ill of people. So it stops the negative thoughts from, from leading into even worse. Um, okay, very good. All right, so let's go ahead uh, and pull up the presentation. Uh, one second, I just needed to do something. All right, so get your, um, if you have notes, or if you're taking notes, I don't know if you are, but this is the time to get it because we have a new presentation. And let me get that ready. Bismillah. So we are on week thir three, Thursday, and here we go. Screen share, boom, share, and present. Okay, here we go. All right, so you guys ready? So today, as we talked about last on Tuesday, I told you guys we're going to cover these diseases this week. So we already covered the first three, false hope, negative thoughts, and vanity. And now we are going to cover the next three, fraud, ghish, anger, ghadab, heedlessness, ghafla. So we got the Gs today, okay? Today is the day of the G diseases, okay? <laughs> For Arabic anyway, or ghain, not G, I should say ghain. So ghain diseases, okay? And we'll talk about what each of these are. Let's go ahead and get started. So the first one, fraud, ghish. This is a huge one, okay? Huge, because a lot of people, uh, when they, you know, uh, think about, you know, making money or just getting ahead in life, they, shaitan will come into their hearts and tell them, you know, to do things that are not right, just because the greed or the desire for that thing just overtakes their heart. And this is the problem with fraud is that it, it leads people to do things that are haram. For example, if you're, let's say you're selling something, right? Um, and some of you may know, for example, there's a, a website called Craigslist, okay? And now we have a lot more websites, but this is just a popular website, okay? That a lot of adults um, use to sell things that they don't want. So they may sell like junk, you know, but it's the way that they take the picture or describe that thing. Let's say it's a piece of furniture, okay? Let's say it's a couch and um, a person will take the nicest picture, filters, you know, make it look super amazing and they'll take the front of that couch and it looks like a decent couch and they set the price. And now you have all these people going, Ooh, that sounds nice. Okay. I'm interested. And, um, 
And someone may even come and say, I'm going to pick it up. And then that person, if they're, if they have a rish, what they'll do is they'll do a few things. Okay. First of all, they're hiding the problems in the couch, which may be the back of the couch. Maybe there's marks that they've painted over uh, with, with paint or there's gashes. You know, sometimes couches, if they're leather or fabric, they can have, you can, you know, things can happen and they get cuts. So this person may have completely hidden all of those things. And what they'll do is if they're really crafty, they'll say, you know what, um, pick up time. You can only come at nighttime. Okay. Come at like after uh, the sunset and the, the the buyer has no idea why right the buyer's like oh, okay if that's the only time that works for you that's fine so they go and they go and at nighttime they're dragging this big couch from the garage or wherever onto the car so they're not even able to properly inspect the uh, couch right this happens a lot and then they they make the money transfer they give the cash and now they go home and they go on their couch and they're thinking it's going to look just like that picture, right? It had, uh, it looked really nice and comfortable, but they suddenly sink in the couch, couch and all of a sudden the cushions collapse, right? The cushions go down and there's all these, you know, maybe noises. And then they're going, what, what's up with this couch? It's not even comfortable. And then they go around the back or they turn it, flip it upside down. And all of a sudden there's all these holes and problems and maybe even, you know, cobwebs, God knows. It might be just, like I said, a piece of junk that this person took so much time to present as something that it wasn't. So I just, you know, that's a piece of furniture, but people can do this to a lot of things like a car or even a house. There's people who scam, right? This word scam, you should know. To be scammed is to trick someone, to uh, have someone sell you something that is not real or not true or not as good as they're making it seem. So there's a lot of scammers that will scam people out of big purchase things, right? Cars, homes, jewelry. So you'll go to the jeweler and it'll, uh, this has actually happened before, which is very, you have to be very careful if you, if you ever get jewelry or like, you know, uh, especially gemstones or, or certain stones to be careful who you take that jewelry to, to clean it. If it's a real diamond, for example, there are some jewelers who are known to do this. They will um, take your ring and go, oh, I'll clean it, but my tools are in the back, right? And you're just standing around waiting for them to bring you your diamond all polished and nice and shiny, but they're thieves. They know exactly how to remove that diamond really well. And then they'll go in the back and they'll replace it with like a totally different false, you know, stone, uh, cubic zirconium. There's all these different stones that can be um, mistaken for uh, a real diamond. And if you don't have a, a jeweler's eye or a tool, uh, I forgot what they're called, to actually look at the diamond, you would have no idea that that was not your diamond because it looks just the same and it fits perfectly into the ring or the necklace or whatever it was, the earrings. So there are people who do things like that. They trick, they scam, they steal, and they justify it because they're greedy and they have desires for material things that take over them. So you have to be very careful. And that's why, uh, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns people, woe to those who give less than what to do. So this is a perfect example of someone who has rish. So if you go and, uh, you know, in, in many world markets, and even in some markets here, like if you've been to Sprouts, right? Um, they have those scales that you can uh, go and weigh your, uh, like if you want to get certain treats or even beans and rice, you can weigh the, the item, right? Um, and then you, uh, you, um, you go and purchase it. Well, in other places, they have scales and have similar things, but they might not give you the full weight uh, of what you paid for, or they might take some off, or they might not give you the best quality of what you want. And they justify this because it's like, oh, I don't want my you know uh, food to go bad. I have to sell it. So it's old. Let's say it's like meat or it's something that's been sitting out for a couple of days. They will mix stuff, uh, good stuff, bad stuff with the good stuff. And you don't know until you get home. And then you take out, let's say it's like a bag of fruits, right? right? And you take it out and you're like, what? There, why are all these rotten fruits in here? How did this happen? Well, that seller, they tricked you, right? So this is a perfect example of a rish, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is warning 
never to do that. There's no justification to trick people. It's haram. You cannot do that. And so there's actually a very famous hadith um, where the Prophet ﷺ was once passing by a pile of food uh, and he put his hand into it and his fingers touched something. So he was in a market, you know, and he he saw some food and he, he put his hands into it and he asked the person, he said, what is this? And the man said, it got rained on because he the Prophet ﷺ touched um, the wet part, right? And so when he touched the wet part, he was wondering why the seller, you know, why it was there in the first place. What was this wet thing? And the seller said, oh, well, rain got on it. And he said, why didn't you put that wet part on top of the pile so that the people could see it, right? Because if you see food that is dry from the top, but then the middle of it is spoiled or wet, you probably would not want to get the middle of it. But if you're just scooping it up quickly and you're not paying attention, it looks like all of it is dry, right? So he's telling the man, why didn't you do that? And then he tells him very clearly a warning. He who deceives does not belong to me. And then another report is he who deceives is not one of us, or he is not one of us who deceives. All of them are saying the same thing, which is if you trick people, to deceive people is to lie, to trick people, you are not counted as part of the ummah of the Prophet ﷺ. He's telling you, you're not in my ummah, you're not part of me, you're not part of my this belief, this faith of Islam. Clear warning, we as Muslims do not trick people, it's haram, okay? Such an important disease of the heart and we should uh, ask Allah to free us from it because shaitan can make someone justify this, especially if they're desperate for money, you really need something, you might think, oh man, it's okay. They don't need to know that, you know, this phone, let's say you, you're trying to sell your phone or your computer, that it has all these problems and that there's a virus on it and that, you know, it's missing a button. I'm just going to sell it anyway. You know, don't do that. You can never do that. You have to p tell people everything that's wrong with the item uh, up front. And if they still want to buy it, that's on them. But you trying to deceive them into buying it is totally forbidden. Okay. All right. So the treatment for Rish is to realize that Allah subhanahu wa is all knowing and all seeing and every single thing that we do, we're going to be held accountable for. And nothing that you get, no money, no food from fraud is worth it. It actually is haram. It's, it's, it's going to cause you harm. Okay. Anything that you get that's uh, that you get from a haram source or because you did something haram, there's no barakah in it. And it, it can actually cause problems for you. You could, if you bought food with that money that you just cheated someone out of, it can make you sick. Um, there's so many problems that could come from that money or whatever you got from this transaction. So that's why there's no barakah in it whatsoever and there's no point to do it. You actually could invite harm on yourself. Even if you think, oh, I'm going to make so much money and I'll do good with it, part of it. No, the fact that you got it to tr by tricking another person all of it is ruined, okay? So you don't want to uh, ever justify um, that kind of stuff. And then also remember that the words of the Prophet said him that, you know, to st for him to say that you're not from among us or from me is such a clear warning, the Billah, that we would not even be considered a Muslim if we do something like this. So you want to say, is it ever worth it? You know, even if I'm going to make some quick money and I really want to get something else, um, it, or in, or I think that, oh, it's okay, There, this person doesn't need to know everything. These are all the whisperings of shaitan. He wants you to do something wrong, and then he wants you to be, uh, you know, hurt by that thing. So we have to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for protection. But that's the first disease, it's rish, okay? All right, so the next disease. This is a big one, okay? Ghadab, anger. Uh, we all know what anger is. Even young children can get angry, right? Anger is a human emotion, and it's something that can be easily triggered based on a lot of things. Sometimes we get uh, hangry, for example. If you're fasting in the month of Ramadan and you've ever just gotten annoyed or short-tempered, 
um, because of, for really no reason, it's likely because you're hangry, you're hungry and you're angry at the same time. So anger can come from that, or it can, can come from someone, uh, provoking you to provoke someone is to, you know, push their buttons, to get them annoyed, to be a pest. And you're just trying to make them angry. Right? So there's a lot of things that can make us angry, but when we when anger is a problem, it's when it's for other than the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because there's good anger, which is necessary, right? There's anger when someone is doing something wrong and it's a clear uh, you know, uh, you know, wrong action and, and an injustice towards a, a person or a group of people, you we should that should anger us for the sake of Allah. We should not look uh, at that as, as something light. And then that makes us uh, call, I mean, it makes us uh, act, right? So so when you see someone, let's say, being bullied in front of you and you know that it's wrong, if your response is anger for the sake of Allah, then you go in there and you try to stop the injustice, right? So that's a form of healthy anger. Anytime, or, or anger towards things that are, are haram, right? Like, for example, uh, the existence of certain things in the world should anger us, like alcohol, Alcohol, there's no benefit to it whatsoever. It destroys lives. Um, so many people, innocent people, have died from alcohol. So the fact that alcohol exists and that people drink it and that it's in restaurants and it's in stores, that should anger us. When we do walk down the aisle of a, a grocery store and we see bottles and bottles of disgusting alcohol, it should fill our hearts with anger for the sake of Allah. You know, not anger where you're just letting your emotions out, but just like, astaghfirullah, why are people doing this? This is so bad for you. And it ruins, uh, you know, uh, people's lives. So anger is, uh, is something, again, that when it's for the sake of Allah, it's healthy. But if it's for other things that are not tied to the sake of Allah and it gets out of control, and you start to not just be uh, experience anger, but you become anger. That that's all you are. You lose your 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 sense of uh, calm. You don't know how to. You, you don't have adab. You start to maybe say very hurtful things, uh, abusive things, or you start to get physical. Right? There's people who, when they get really angry, they lose so much control that they may physically uh, react. And that could be hitting something or someone, pushing something, throwing something, breaking something. So all of those are examples of when anger is out of control and it can be very dangerous, right? And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet throughout the Quran and the Hadith, we have warnings about those who are quick to anger and that let forget themselves and that they uh, completely get overtaken by anger. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes, he says, those who spend in the cause of Allah during ease and hardship and who restrain anger and who pardon people, who forgive people, and Allah loves the doers of good. So he's describing for us who the doers of good are. The people who do good are the ones who restrain their anger, who forgive people, and who uh, spend, uh, you know, for the sake of Allah, whether they have ease or hardship. So these are all great qualities that people should have, especially restraining your anger. Another um, two hadith that are really important to know. A man once came, asked the Prophet, I said, what was the worst thing that one incurs concerning God? What that means is, you know, what is the worst thing that could happen to someone uh, to make Allah upset, right? Um, and the, and the, or what could, what's the worst thing that someone could receive from Allah? And the Prophet I said, said, his wrath. And his wrath, uh, you know, of course, is, is, is his chastisement, his punishment, right? So the man asked, how can we avoid it? I don't want ever to see the wrath of Allah. I don't want to ever be punished by Allah. And he said, do not become angry. So he's telling us that if you don't want to see Allah's anger and wrath, do not become angry as, as you know, people where you're just walking around 
always mad and you're uh, pushing people and hurting people and just being cruel because that's what angry people do. They start to just be very careless and uh, just hurt people, right? So um, he's telling us clearly, don't become angry. Then we have another man. He came and asked the Prophet, so said, give me advice. And so he's asking the Prophet, like he, in, remember the Prophet could say anything, anything to this man. The man just said, give me advice. But the first thing the Prophet said is do not become angry. So the man's like, okay. And he, um, you know, he hears it. And then he says, um, well, what's next, right? Because he's kind of like, okay, I got that. Don't be angry. So he asks again, and the, and the Prophet replies again, do not become angry. And then he asks a third time. And again, the Prophet says, do not be, become angry. So this is huge because the Prophet is really trying to get a message across that if you want good advice, the best advice, this is the advice to live by. Do not become anger such that all people see is your rage and you lose control because that control that you lose can lead to a lot of harm. People have died because someone's lost their control. You know, this is, happens all the time in this world where someone lost their control, their anger got the best of them, and then they, uh, they killed, right, because of that. And so there's so many stories throughout, uh, you know, the seerah of that happening as well. And even the the story of the sons of Adam, you know, Habil and Qabil, if you study the story of the sons of Adam, that, you know, uh, Qabil is the one who killed his brother out of anger and jealousy. So this is very powerful uh, reminders for us that human nature, if we don't control these emotions, a lot of uh, damage can be done, right? So you always want to think about not losing yourself to anger. There's nothing wrong with having anger as an emotion because it's a human emotion, but it should always be for the sake of Allah, inshallah. Okay, so let's look more at this because this is certainly not over. One of the um, scholars or scholars have uh, said that, that anger is similar to a hunting dog, okay? So if you look at this picture here, here's a man and he has, uh, I believe it's a hawk maybe. It's a bird of prey. I don't know exactly what, maybe it's a, I don't know, my sons might know, uh, but it's a hawk or some bird. And then you have these three dogs. And if you see, what is the man doing? He is holding them all by a leash. He is restraining those dogs. Those dogs move by his command. When he tells them to go, they go. When he releases the leash, they, he, uh, they, they go. And when he tells them to come back, they come back. That's the relationship that a man, a hunter has with his dogs or his animals that hunt for him. They're trained. They know exactly when to act and when to stop back, right? Step back. So anger, the uh, scholar said, is like having a hunting dog, right? Without training. And if you have a dog that can hunt, but there's no training, it's never going to go and get what you need it to get, and it's not going to point you in the right direction. So it's of no benefit to you. The dog that is trained will benefit you. When you hunt and you, let's say, you know, you're, um, there are people who hunt for food. You know, they don't have grocery stores like we do. They actually have to go outside and, you know, bow and arrow or gun or whatever they're using, they hunt for their food. And what they do is <clears throat> uh, they rely on animals to go and gr capture the food, right? These sharp, uh, they have sharp eyes, right? These birds of prey, uh, the falcon, the hawk, uh, whatever it is, it will be able to, the eagle, it will be able to, uh, you know, basically uh, fly around the, the area of where that animal was, was uh, hunted. So if a, a man, you know, uses his bow and arrow or a gun and he shoots down an animal um, from a far distance, 
this hawk or this bird will be able to let the dogs know where to go, right? So they all work in this amazing, uh, you know, sort of synchronicity together. But the dog is important because he's the one or she's the one, if it's a female dog, that is going to go and get the animal that you just hunted and then bring it back to the hunter. But if that dog isn't trained, it will have no idea what to do. It's going to go running around all over the place and playing a game of fetch. And you're standing there going, that's my dinner. Can you please go get the animal I just hunted? If you're really, this is your lifestyle, right? So you need a trained animal. So anger in a similar way, it's only useful if you have control over it and you've trained it. It's actually harmful and doesn't benefit you if you don't train it. So, so important. What a great analogy that our scholars gave us. So inshallah, think about this next time you get angry. Is your uh, hunting dog out of control? And is it benefiting you at all if uh, if you can't call it back? Because if you can control your anger, Similarly, like blowing a whistle or maybe calling the name of your animal, it will come back to you. But if you have no control and that animal doesn't answer to your call, then that's what anger can become if it's not checked, okay? So a really important uh, disease of the heart to understand. Now, there's a few different cures, okay, or ways to, uh, to treat this. So <clears throat> first and foremost, Imam al-Mawlud, he talks about this uh, in the book, but um, also other scholars have talked about this, is to remember that extensive praise and goodness associated, um, oh wait, did I, did I cut and paste the wrong thing? Hold on. Uh-oh. Sorry. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. No, no, no. I read it totally wrong. I apologize. Okay. So the first cure is to remember that there's a lot of praise associated with being a forbearing person and having humility. To be forbearing is to be patient, that you're able to, uh, you know, not give into those emotions and just have a really stable presence. So we know that there's so much praise for that. So remember, it's really good to have those qualities. And then, um, <clears throat> Sidi Ahmed Zaruk, which is another very famous scholar, said that the main reason that people get angry is because they're filled with themselves. Their egos get in the way. So you, our egos, our nafs, when it is uh, very, um, you know, too strong, it gets in our way, right? So we have to just kind of let go, not allow that every word someone says to us or everything that they do that may bother us, that it pushes our buttons and that it makes us... Uh, triggered, right? Uh, that we suddenly feel all these uh, this anger towards them, because um, people are. That's just life, you know. This world is uh, full of a lot of people. We have eight billion people, and some people you're going to get along with, and some people you're not um, going to get along with, right? And so some people are going to make you happy. Some people are going to make you mad and angry, but you have to be in control of your emotions and not just, you know, go this way or that way. You have to say no, unless it's for the sake of Allah, I'm not going to just let people constantly make me angry. I need to use my own brain, right? So very important. Now, uh, the next cure that Imam al-Mawlud uh, recommends is, re- is recognizing that nothing takes place without Allah's permission. There's no power or might except with Allah. So remember that, and to also remember, right? So that everything, what that means is that everything that happens is because Allah allowed it to happen. And so if you're being tested in a moment where someone or something is upsetting you, it's an opportunity for you to be the best Uh, form of yourself, right? And so look at it as a test from Allah. Instead of focusing on the individual or the person who's bothering you, look at it like, why did Allah put me in this situation in the first place? Uh, What am I supposed to learn from this lesson? And then you act, right? Um, And so, and he also shared that, remember that um, there, whatever we do in this world, Allah will also do that to us. So this is called reciprocity. If we are people that are walking around angry and not nice uh, to people and, and you know ha- have that, Allah will show us the same. He will show us his anger. So we have to be very careful. We don't ever, 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 ever want to see the anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we should not 
be, as the Prophet warned us in the hadith before, we should not be people who are angry and who are uh, so that we don't get Allah's wrath, right? So these are just some of the things to think about. There's a few other things that we can do. So we're taught, the Prophet ﷺ taught us that when we are angry, of course, there are certain things that um, we can do in the moment, right? And in the moment, we should learn how to respond. So the Prophet ﷺ taught us that if we're uh, you know, angry and we're standing up, we should sit down. Okay, so sit down immediately because just by changing your position can sometimes change your mood, right? You can be a little bit more relaxed. Plus, if you think about it, when someone's angry and they're standing up, it makes them feel very powerful because you're big, you're puffing yourself up, and sometimes you're, you know, standing a little taller and looking a little bit more aggressive, you know, when you're when you're uh, t say, uh, talking to the other person who's upsetting you. You might even um, go closer to them to look more scary and intimidating. Uh, or maybe even if you lose your control completely, you'll, you'll want to push them or do something, harm them, right? All of that can come because just because you're standing up and you're feeling like that, right? So when you change your position and you sit down, it can calm your state. Now, if you're sitting and you're angry, then you go into a lying down position. It's really awkward to be super angry if you're lying down. Okay. Uh, and I don't uh, want you to, um, to, to do that, uh, like intentionally, but maybe it just for practice, just to try to see how it feels when you're lying down to pretend even to be upset with someone. It feels awkward because lying down is such a relaxed position, right? So. Um, that's what we should do. And then we should seek refuge in Allah, right? We say, Al Billahi mina shaitan al rajim. We uh, try to stay quiet. And then we're told to make wudu. A wudu is very powerful because it has a cooling effect. Anger is, uh, it gets us hot, right? It's our blood pressure actually goes up. Our temperature goes up when we're angry because the heart is beating faster. So there's a lot of physical uh, things that are happening. So once you go and you make wudu, that cooling effect of the water just calms you down and suddenly you're able to maybe think better about what you said and you know you kind of just have a better response or maybe you're calmer so make will do and then ultimately the best thing to do is to pray you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for guidance for control for forgiveness because if you said things that you didn't mean or regret you need to go and ask for forgiveness from Allah first and then from the person or the people. So all of these are ways that we can be in the habit of practicing our uh, to get uh, down from that state of anger and also breathing. I didn't write it here, but breathing is very important, right? Um, when you're in a state of heightened emotion, when you're really, really angry, just take a deep breath, hold it in let go. That can immediately calm you down. Just forcing yourself to change your position and everything you're, because otherwise your words are just going to keep coming. And like I said, the anger is my, it's like a flame. It just grows more and more. So this is a way of calming all that down. Okay. Um, so here we say, um, okay. Now, this is a, I know, a little interesting image I found, but I thought it worked perfectly with this hadith. Once a man grew angry, and the Prophet ﷺ noticed how when the face shows extreme anger, it resembles shaitan, right? So he said, I have a word. If spoken, will remove it from him. It is, I seek refuge in God from Satan the accursed, which is the English for "Audhu billahi min shaitan rajim So this picture I thought was perfect because he's a man, but look at what's happening to him. His face is turning red. Look at the veins in his forehead. He has steam coming out of his ears. His teeth uh, are looking sharp and quite scary. He's even frothing at the mouth, right? Um, which is, yeah, someone said it 
look so ridiculous. Um, I agree, but this is what some people look like when they're really, really angry. And, um, you know, if you've ever, uh, you know, been in this state, one of the ways to really rethink about your, you know, your anger response is if someone were to videotape you. If you ever, uh, you know, are in a situation like that, um, you know, it's maybe something your mom or dad can do where they just videotape you for a little bit and you can see yourself later. And you might be shocked, like, what? That's how I talk and that's how I look? Yeah, because when you're so angry, you're not aware of yourself. And that's the problem. You lose all control. So you can look really weird or like this person and just very, very uh, intense. But this hadith, the Prophet ﷺ is telling us, if we want to remove uh, the effect of anger, remember, where does it come from? It's Iblis, right? Iblis is, um, is the one who angers us. And that's uh, why we seek refuge in Allah from him. So someone's asking, smoke doesn't come out. Yeah, our smoke doesn't come out. We don't have that, but we do get hot and sometimes, uh, you know, sweaty. So that's kind of what it, it's like, you know, when you think of smoke from a boiling pot of water, right? It's, it's heat. Uh, so think of it that way, that we have heat that's coming out of us, right? So, um, but very important uh, hadith to remember. Okay, so... How do we, oh, so that, those are the treatments, excuse me. So now we're going to the last uh, one, which is ghafla, heedlessness, okay? Ghafla, this is a very uh, crucial one to understand, okay? A lot of the, some of the scholars say this is actually one of the root diseases to, um, to uh, all of the diseases of the, of the heart. So ghafla is purposely turning away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, and it's it's forgetfulness, but it's it's like you know, but you're just not. You want to do what you want to do, and there are people who remember we have will, we have free will, we have the choice, right, to do right or wrong. This is the test of the human being. So if you know what is halal and what's haram, and you know what's right and what's wrong, but you don't follow or, or obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you want to just do whatever you want to do, uh, this is ghafla, right? It's completely um, giving in to your own desires and turning away from Allah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, many warnings about, um, about this. He says, and be not of the ghafilun, right? The heedless ones. And then he describes them. They are those upon whose hearts, hearing and sight, Allah has set a seal. And they are heedless. So because they turned away from Allah, Allah has turned away from them. And we never, may Allah protect us all from ever being amongst those who Allah ever turns away from or who we turn away from him, right? So, um, here is another really, uh, I think, powerful image because it teaches us the difference between those who remember their Lord. They're not forgetting Allah, right? They're remember remembering Allah. He says what? The Prophet ﷺ said that the example of the one who remembers his Lord in, in comparison to the one who does not remember his Lord is that of a living creature compared to a dead one. So when we look at this image, we see very clearly there is a living, vibrant, beautiful, life-giving, because trees give life, right? They give life to all the insects that are living on them. They emit oxygen for us to breathe. We give them our carbon dioxide. Uh, they're benefiting creatures. They're benefiting the earth. They're, uh, people find shade under the tree, right? Uh, all these animals. Uh, so much good comes from a living a tree, right? And that is the believer, the believer that remembers their Lord. So much good comes from them. Uh, they're beneficial to the world. The one who is not remembering Allah is basically like a dead tree that is in a desert 
and that really there's no benefit whatsoever from, all right? There's no benefit. Um, there's no shade, there's no fruits, there's nothing. It's just a dead uh, structure that stands in the middle of, a, of an arid, dry landscape. And um, it, it actually may even invite uh, the attention of vultures and snakes and other creatures that really are harmful. So all of this is to tell us that ghafla, which is the when you forget Allah, this is what it does. It makes you like a person uh, that is just of no benefit. You are actually even harmful uh, in many ways, right, to people and to the creation of Allah. So you are, uh, you have the choice. What is it going to be? Where would all of us rather be? And if we could go into this picture, on which side would we rather be on, right? That's, I think, very clear. So um, this is, I thought, was a good visual for us to, to understand ghafla. Now, um, how do we treat ghafla? Allah subhanahu wa says, uh, warn them that on the day of regret, which is the day of judgment, when the matter will be concluded. On that day, everything's done, right? Uh, while now they're in a state of ghafla and they do not believe. So one of the treatments is to remind people that on the day of judgment, you know, that's it. You're, there's nothing you can do at that point. So, you know, you need to wake up from your sleepy state and uh, start to make toba, go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ask for his forgiveness, uh, and, you know, start doing what you should be doing and warn people, you know, in this world before it's too late in the next. And then um, also remember that our prayers, our du'as are not answered, okay? So uh, here the Prophet ﷺ said in a hadith, call upon Allah with certainty that he will answer you. Know that Allah will not answer the supplication of a heart that is negligent and distracted, heedless. So the heart of a person who has ghafla is in this state where even their du'as will not be answered. Um, and so very important. You want to be free from that. And so, again, there are people who will say they're Muslim, right? And I just want to explain. There are people who are, will say that they're Muslim, but then they do not pray. They may uh, drink alcohol. They may gamble. They may do things that are explicitly haram. Uh, eat, you know, uh, non-halal uh, foods. So these people, they know right from wrong. Um, they still say they're Muslim, but for some reason, they do not um, uh, prevent, or they don't do what they're supposed to do. They fall into sins, and they uh, become forgetful of their obligations to Allah. So this is the group of people we're talking about, right? That they know right from wrong, but they ch still choose to do wrong. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for protection from all of these diseases, that he protects us from ghadab, from uh, uh, ghish, from ghadab, and from, uh, from heedless as ghafla, okay? So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us all. But this is uh, the class for today. Uh, we have one last class on Tuesday where we're going to be going over the rest of the diseases, and it's going to be a lot, so we're going to have to move very quickly next week to cover six diseases instead of three, double the amount, uh, but some of them do kind of overlap So with things that we've talked about before, so inshallah we will um, you know, just try to move as quickly as we can. But uh, are there any questions? So I'm going to go ahead and stop the presentation, and now we'll get to your questions inshallah. Let's see, any questions? What about, very good questions. So I love this question. Thank you, Eamon, um, for asking. Eamon asked about fixing broken, broken things and selling them. There's nothing wrong. We call this refurbished. So if you have a refurbished item, that means it was broken, there was something wrong with it, it was old, but you went and you tried to uh, fix it, enhance it, make it working again. Um, as long as you are clear with the seller that this is not a new product, 
right? That it is something that you yourself maybe, or you had someone repair it, but that it's that when it was broken and you've repaired it, that's there's nothing wrong with that. The point of rish is that you're trying to hide those things. You're actually not being clear with people. You're purposefully hiding the flaws because you're afraid that if they know that it was broken, they won't buy it. So you're just not even going to tell them in the first place. That's when it's fraud and that's when it's haram. Um, what was the treatment for fraud? Did we, did I not go over that? I don't remember now if I, did I miss that one? I hope not. Um, let me see. I thought I went over it, but I think we talked about, yeah, knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees all that you do, right? That nothing escapes his knowledge um, and that there's no benefit in ever taking uh, something that, uh, you know, consuming something that was bought or, t or, or uh, that you got from fraud, that it actually causes you harm. Okay. So if you, like I said, let's say you made $10,000 selling a, a car that had uh, engine, you know, damage that you didn't tell the buyer, you know, maybe it was in a car accident or there's a you know category of cars that are called salvaged. Okay, a salvaged vehicle is a vehicle that was in a car accident, or it was um, taken by the government for some reason. But it was it, there's something wrong with the car that it's not. It's what we call a clean title. It's not you know it has damage or prior history of damage. Those cars, when you sell them, if you're the seller, you have to let the buyer know. Oh, by the way, this car was a salvaged car. I, you know, I didn't get it from the from a car dealership brand new. I didn't buy it from one owner with no previous damage. This is the history of the car, and so um, you have to disclose that information because if you don't and you sell a car because from the exterior the car looked nice. Uh, and the person is like, oh, wow, this looks like a great car for this price. I'll get it. And then they go home. And then a month later, all of a sudden they're having engine problems. And now they have to spend thousands of more dollars to fix it. That is totally haram. And it's your fault because maybe had you told them, oh, by the way, this car had damage, they would have said, you know what? I don't think I want to buy it because I don't have the money in case it has more problems down the line. I need a good, reliable car. And then they go buy another car. So you have to just be honest, inshallah. Okay. Um, so we have, what if you judge someone, but you don't uh, mean to, but you accidentally always do it, but you don't mean to. Very good. I love that you asked that question, um, Captain, because anytime you have a disease in the heart that you don't uh, want to have and you are repulsed by it and you hate that you have it, this is a good sign. And so Allah will not hold you accountable for thoughts that you're trying your hardest to push away and that you're not happy about. So don't worry. That's not, that doesn't mean that you're a judgy person or you're a bad person. It's when you like to think about badly about people and you like to make judgments and you kind of just you let your mind go off and on and on. That's when it's a disease of the heart. Okay. But if you're really struggling and you don't like it, but a thought keeps entering your mind, just say all the blame and move on. Don't make it a big deal. Don't sit there and beat yourself up over it and go and say, I'm a horrible person. No, because if you didn't have that thought uh, intentionally, then it was probably just waswasa from shaitan. Cause you know, he likes to whisper and to make us think bad things. So don't worry. Okay. Oh no, Kinza, I'm so sorry to hear that. Um, I hope you and your father and are safe. Um, someone shared that they were in a in an accident, and I pray that you guys are all safe. Um, let's see here. If you're really poor, then are you allowed to deceive? No, uh, you cannot deceive people even if you're really poor. There's no theft. There's no begging uh, people. There's nothing fraud. No, none of it is permissible. Whether you're poor or rich, it doesn't matter. It's wrong. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who provides. So if you're in need, we're supposed to turn to Allah. If you're hungry and poor, you turn to Allah and you ask him to provide for you. And he will. The money will come. The food will come. There are people all over the world who are homeless, who are poor, but they still eat every day or maybe every other day, but they eat and they still have something because Allah is the one who provides for them. 
inshallah. Okay. Um, let's see. Oh, thank you, Lala. Very sweet. I look forward to seeing you on Tuesday and you're very welcome. She thanked me for taking the time to do this. Thank you for being here. Thank you for taking the time to be a part of this. You guys are so sweet. Um, Okay, very good. Bilal asked this great question. Thank you, Bilal. You said earlier that rish leads to haram income. How can you purify your haram income? We talked about this um, when we talked about uh, miserliness and we talked about the importance of giving zakat and sadaqah and realizing that none of that um, diminishes your wealth. It doesn't take away from your wealth and it actually purifies your wealth. We also talked about it on um, what other disease? Remember when we did that washing? Now I'm forgetting my stuff. But when we did the washing of the clothing, um, fear of poverty, we talked about it when we talked about Khauf al Thaqar. We talked about how zakat and sadaqah purifies any haram wealth that you have. Okay? Yes. If you give sadaqah, it will purify your wealth, inshallah. For, you know, we shouldn't uh, knowingly have haram income, but if you don't know if maybe some of your income is haram, then that's the way to purify it, inshallah. Okay, um, let's see. I'm just wanting to make sure I get all the questions. There's a lot of comments coming here. Um, someone asked, what if a Muslim killed 100 people? Is he still a Muslim? Okay, well, there is a very famous hadith that actually speaks to that. Um, where a man came, this was a long time ago, and he came to um, a, a Christian, you know, and he said, I have killed 99 people. I think it was a Christian. It might, well, I'm not sure, actually. Don't quote me on that. I think he was just a, a religious leader of his time and, and that time. But he said that he, uh, you know, had killed 99 people. And so then he asked him, he said, I, I want to be better. I've person, but I want to get better. I want to make toba. I want to, you know, be, get close to God. Will your God forgive me? And that man said, no, he was like, nope, you know, you're too, you've done too much evil. Um, there's no hope for you. Sorry. So the man was so overcome by his anger. And this is a good story because it relates to anger. He was so overcome by his anger again, that he ended up killing that man. So now he's killed a hundred people. Eeks, right? This is a, a pretty awful person, right? In, in terms of what he's done. So he's killed a hundred people, but he makes, he wants to make Toba. He, he's not Muslim. He's never, uh, you know, uh, had good guidance before and he wants to become a better human being. So he goes and he finds a Muslim, uh, you know, and he asks him, he says, you know, can I, uh, or I want to become a better person. This is what I've done. Can I, will your God forgive me? And that man tells him, yes, but you have to leave this place that you're in because the place that you're in is not good. It's corrupt and it's part of the reason why you are, you've done all the bad things you've done. So go to this other place. And he told him where to go. And he said, over there are really good people and they will make you better. They're believers, right? They're Muslims. Muslim is a believer, right? They're, they're people that will that make you better. So just go to those people. So he was so happy because he'd never thought that he could be forgiven for all of the crimes he'd done. And here someone gave him hope. So he was so excited that he ended up, you know, going uh, to that place. And on his way, something interesting thing happened. He died. Okay. So he dies. Now, when someone dies, there's two different angels that come. If they're a believer and they're a Muslim, uh, we, the angel of Rahmah comes, right? And that angel comes to take the soul. And then uh, the if it's a non-believer or a bad soul, then the angel of torture comes. You know, there's different angels and they each have their own job. And so that person, because they're not destined for, you know, they, they, they were a bad person, uh, that angel takes them. So when they both come, they're like looking at each other like, huh? what are you doing here? What are you doing here? Because it's usually one or the other, not both. Um, and of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is knowing, uh, he's witnessing everything and he's, he's, he decides to send Jibreel alayhi salam to go and give them 
uh, you know, instructions on what to do because they don't know what to do. So when Jibreel Ali Salam comes, he, they explain to him what happened. And then he says, he says the order, the command is that you have to measure the distance from where the man was, like where the city that he was leaving from, to where he was going. And whichever place he was closer to, where he, he's passed away, he's died on the road, um, whatever place he was closer to, the angel will take him. So if he's closer to the place, the bad place, the angel of torture will take him. And if he's closer to the good place, the angel of mercy will take him. So um, they measured the distance and he was one hand span, so a whole distance of the hand, closer to the place that he left from. So at that point, the angel of torture was ready to go take his soul because that's what the command was. And then Angel Jibril said, wait. And he said, I've been commanded to what? Do what? To constrict the earth. So that means he brought, he squeezed the lands together so that he was now closer to the place he was going. And then at that point, this is all from Allah, right? Because Allah can forgive anyone he wants to. And he saw the sincerity in this man that he wanted to be better and he wanted to be a Muslim, he wanted to be a believer. And so even though he was taken and his soul was taken before he could do all of those things, Allah still forgave him and he accepted him as a Muslim and the angel of mercy took him. So this story is related to us, a lot of lessons that we can take from it, right? About anger and the danger of it, but also of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So uh, to answer that question for the person who asked, um, Allah is the only one who can judge uh, us according to what we've done. And he's the only one who can forgive or not forgive. So it's entirely up to him. But that hadith uh, is specifically about someone who killed 100 people. So that's why I thought it was important to share it. Um, but thank you for asking. All right, you guys, we have gone over our time. And again, I apologize for uh, starting a little late. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for spending your, your afternoon uh, with me. Uh, we look forward to, the, to Tuesday's last class, inshallah. And uh, I, yeah, there's a lot to cover. So inshallah, we'll start on time. We might go a little bit over, let your parents know. Um, but thank you so much again. Oh, thank you, Captain. <laughs> Jazakallah khair. And I love having you in this class. Uh, may Allah reward all of you and decrease all of you, inshallah. Uh, we will, um, thank you, Amen. Thank you so much again for your for your lovely comments and we need your du'as remember it's the last 10 days we need your du'as you guys your du'as are very powerful i'll take a child's du'as any day any day you give them to me i'll take them so please keep me and my family in your du'as all of you even though i don't know all of you personally you're still in my du'as because uh, you're beautiful children and i love children and i i pray that you and your families all of you that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect all of you and give you the best of this dunya and the next and that you have a most mubarak uh, remainder of your month inshallah have a wonderful evening and we'll we'll catch you guys on tuesday assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Everybody, bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala ashrif al-anbiya'i wa al-mursaleen. Sayyidina wa maulana wa habibina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ala alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman kathira. Assalamu alaikum, you guys. Thank you for joining uh, us for the last class. I know, we are just talking about how time zipped uh, by, but subhanAllah, here we are, seven classes with you guys. Uh, I really appreciate those of you who've been in attendance have uh, been on time, coming every week, and I hope you've been benefiting from these classes. So Jazakumullah khairan. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept all of our efforts. There's so much to cover today. So I'm going to make this quiz that I normally do with you guys. I'm gonna just kind of shorten it a little bit because we have a lot of, uh, of information to go over today. So last uh, thir two, Thursday, excuse me, Thursday we covered three diseases. Um, this particular disease has to do with not really taking seriously Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's commands. So, you know, you just are kind of being carefree, irresponsible with maybe your prayers. You're not, you're just not taking things seriously. 
uh, what disease of the heart describes a person who is knows about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but isn't taking their faith seriously and then they end up falling into sin? Who's got this? I got answers, but nope, those are not the correct answers, you guys. Um, no, no, not yet. I don't see a correct answer. Normally, you guys are on it. Where, um, where is, I don't see, nope. Hello, Captain. <laughs> Aw, don't cry on the inside. <laughs> so sweet. So yeah, I'm asking about, very good. There we go, Ehsan, excellent. Heedlessness, ghafla, that's the disease of the heart. It's when you become, to become heedless is, become, is to become careless. You're just dis too distracted with life, uh, with how exciting things are. So you're not um, doing what you should be doing. Okay, very good. So this next disease, this is when you react in a way to something that is imbalanced and it can lead to harm, and you know it's an, an emotion that we have. But you, you, if you don't have balance, then it can control you. You're not controlling it anymore. Okay, very good. So we have an answer uh, from uh, Yasin in the English. But what's the Arabic Yasin? Got to come with both. Ehsan Bey. That's what I'm talking about. You gave me the English, and you gave me the Arabic. Good job. So it's ghadab, ghadab and anger. So remember to do that, okay? Danya also, good job. All right, so then the remaining one, I hope you know this. This is when you're trying to get rid of something or sell something, um, or you're maybe presenting yourself in the wrong, in a way that's not true, right? So if you're selling something and you're hiding defects, you're hiding something that's wrong with it, or you are trying to misrepresent yourself, what is this disease of the heart called? And I'm looking very good. We had Rahil, excellent. Or wait, I'm sorry, Ehsan Bey, forgive me. I saw, I got, the names are coming too fast. Ehsan, once again, you got it, mashallah. This is Ghish, which is fraud. Okay, great job. Again, I'm sorry to cut this portion uh, short. It's just that we have so much to cover. So I need to use my time wisely, okay? All right, so let me go ahead and present the, or pull up the presentation. Bismillah. We are at week four. I'm going to get the present screen. I should be super fast by now at this, huh? All right, here we go. So inshallah, you guys can all see me and see the presentation. So week four, we've got six diseases of the heart to cover. Okay, more than normal, right? We usually have three, so double the amount. That's why we're going to get started. So bismillah. Let's go ahead and look at what we're covering. So we're gonna cover rancor. We're gonna cover boasting and arrogance. We're gonna cover displeasure with blame, antipathy toward death, obliviousness or obliviousness to blessings, derision, okay? غير الفخر ان كبر كرحة الدم كرحة الموت نسيان النعمة الحافظ, okay? So all of this is going to be explained to you as we go through this, bismillah. I'm just gonna again check the chat box. I see messages coming through. All right, let's go. Bismillah, number one, ghil, okay? This is extreme anger. So ghadab, we know, is anger that's out of control and imbalanced. Ghil is the result of unchecked anger that leads to violence. So when you're overwhelmed by your anger to the point that you actually cause harm to another person or something, this is ghil. And rancor is, it's kind of this, um, you know, inciting the, it, uh, disease that wants you to do something beyond just feel something because ghadab is your feeling whereas ghil wants you to act on that anger so it's a it's a much worse form of uh, of anger and so here we have uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us in chapter 59 verse 10 our Lord forgive us and our brethren who became who came before us in faith and do not place into our hearts rancor ghil, for those who believe. Our Lord, you are kind and compassionate. So we should be making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asking protection from this disease of the heart because it's such a toxic disease, right? And then Anas ibn Malik reported that the Prophet وسلم, said to me, so he, he's speaking to Anas when he was younger, right? He was Anas was about I think 10 years old when he um, became came into the service of the Prophet. So he said, 
Oh boy, if you are ever, if you are able every morning and evening to remove any rancor ghil, from your heart towards anyone, then do so. Oh boy, that is my tradition, and whoever revives my tradition has loved me, and whoever loves me will be with me in paradise. So asking, you know, removing these feelings from your heart is going to bring you closer to the Prophet So it's such an important thing to do, and we should not ever want to have these types of negative feelings because they're not in line with his way, okay? So that's Ghil. Let's look more into this. So one of the things about Ghil that we have to understand is found in this quote by Ali ibn Abi Talib. He said, do not scold people too often because verily too much scolding leads to rancor and hatred. Too much is bad manners. So and you guys are children, or some of you are younger, right? You're youth. So you know how it feels when someone pulls you in a harsh way and, you know, uh, reprimands you, which is, you know, stops you from doing what you're doing and scolds you, yells at you, maybe calls you something that's not very nice because they're angered by something you've done, right? Um, how does it feel? It doesn't feel very good, right? When you're scolded in a harsh way and it's all often, like maybe every day. There's children, unfortunately, they're in homes where someone's always yelling at them. You know, someone's always telling them what they're doing is wrong. Um, and this can turn into really you know, difficult or uh, more complex emotions for that child because they're feeling shamed, right? This adult, or maybe it's a sibling, you know, it could be other people too, but it's a way of an older sibling, right? It's a way of shaming someone in a really harsh way when you scold them, right? They may have done something wrong or, you know, so it's, it might be that they need to be stopped and to be corrected, but the way that you correct a, a person really you have to be careful because it can cause more problems. So this is what he's saying is that when you scold someone, and I used images that would relate to some of you because it's a youth class, but even adults scold people all the time. You know, you have uh, parents uh, who are elderly scolding their, uh, young, you know, older adult children, spouses are scolding each other, siblings scolding each other into adulthood. So this isn't behavior just for children. Even uh, employers, you know, a boss may scold his employee in front of people, right? A teacher may scold their student. So this is just a normal human thing that happens when someone loses their their comportment, right? Their, their, uh, just their, their being there, they just lose control. So uh, th this advice is to say, when you do it too often, this is what happens. It actually leads to rancor and hatred on both people's, on both, on the part of both people. If I am always scolding you, you know, and shaitan is loving it, right? He's the one who causes all of these negative emotions between people. Um, he might put hatred in my heart towards you, rancor in my heart towards you, because I'm annoyed. I'm annoyed that I'm always having to correct your behavior. And so I start having all these resentment feelings, right? These negative feelings. But the one being scolded, like here in this first picture, you know, that child, you see that finger right in someone's face. It feels really bad to have, to have someone, you know, shame you. You, it, it's very natural that a person who experiences that often, even for someone that they originally love, like a parent or a teacher, that it turns their heart against them. And it invites this very toxic emotion called rin, rancor. So this is why we don't do that in our tradition. We don't shame people. Even parents, you know, have to be reminded not to shame people, right? We have to be very careful and, and cover people's faults, take children to the side if you want to correct their behavior. But the shaming is a big problem. Now, the uh, pictures here, you know, look, you see this boy, uh, he's getting upset back at his mom. So he's also losing adab, which is what, what the other problem is, is that not only does it invite resentment and rancor, but you also start to lose adab with, with people because you are constantly being picked on and that makes you just highly, you know, reactive to other people. So you end up, you know, just losing your adab. Um, and so, and uh, like I said, all these pictures show the effects of what happens when you scold too much. So really important for children to understand this, but also parents, if they're tuning in, 
to understand this as well. All of us educators, adults have to be really careful um, when we're interacting with people that we don't do this because it's, it's never, there's no benefit in it whatsoever. Okay, so let's uh, go to the next slide. So if we see here, the Prophet Sallallahu now the opposite, right? It's total opposite message, subhanAllah. He says, you must be gentle. Verily, gentleness is not in anything except that it beautifies it and is not removed from anything except that it disgraces it. So we have to be gentle in pretty much everything that we try to do, right? Um, and so here you have images of uh, a different type of teaching moment, you know, where the mothers are trying to, you know, relay to their daughters, you know, what you did was, you know, you shouldn't have done it. And of course, you know, I just picked these two images, but fathers should do this with their sons, brothers should do this with their younger brothers and sisters and, and what have you, spouses should do with each other. But these are just simple examples of being a little bit more gentle when you're correcting. And you can see they're smiling, right? They're actually in a positive state because um, they're both understanding that this is you know a teaching moment and we're going to move past this that's how conflict should be handled okay so how do we remove ghil? if you have ghil in your heart well one of the advices that imam al-murud offers is that you show goodwill to the person that you have rancor for so if you have ghil towards someone where you really are just so angered by them that you're like oh if i see them i'm gonna just punch them or I want to hurt them because that's what real is. Remember, it's anger that makes you want to hurt someone, right? Sometimes siblings, for example, they feel this way. If you are um, in a family where you are all, you're bickering a lot with your brothers and sisters, first of all, that's pretty normal. But if it ever enters your heart to want to do something to harm them, that's what this is. And you have to be very careful from that, okay? Because a lot of things uh, can happen in, a heat, in the heat of the moment, they say. In the heat of the moment, if your anger gets the best of you, like we talked about last time, you can cause a lot of harm. You can harm someone permanently, God forbid. So you want to be very careful with this disease of the heart. But a good thing to do is separate, you know, initially, if, you're, if it's a fight or an argument, and then try to force yourself to do this, where when you're in two separate spaces, you know, um, and you know, you're, if you're, this takes time and practice. So don't worry that if it's hard or it almost sounds impossible to do over time, as you mature, it will be easier to manage your emotions where you just start to think about the good of that person. Because, you know, uh, especially if they're in your family or they're close to you, there's good in them. It's just in that moment over that particular issue, all you can see is the bad and you're angered. So you can't see it, but you want to force yourself to do that. Because the more you do that, the less likely that you will allow real to enter your heart, you know, that you'll realize that's a wrong thought. I shouldn't think about harming my you know, sibling or whoever, you know, I shouldn't think about that. It's haram, it's wrong. And so you'll start to push that out of your heart. Also, you want to recognize that um, one, what, that by having it in your heart, you actually deprive yourself of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's forgiveness, right? Um, so the, the Prophet warned us here, or he's relating to us um, a hadith Qudsi that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said about his forgiveness on Mondays and Thursdays, right? Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives uh, people, except, forgives everybody except for two people. And those are the two people who are fighting, two believers who are fighting. They don't get Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's forgiveness. So when you have rancor uh, in your heart, ghil in your heart, you're, you're not being forgiven. Ya Allah, you know, that's, that's the worst state to be in, that, that Allah will not forgive you. And he says to the angels when they come to tell him that these two are fighting, he says, leave them until they set things aright between themselves. Like he's not forgiving them and he's turning from them. We never want Allah SWT to turn from us and to not forgive us. So this is why it's such a dangerous disease of the heart, okay? All right, next we have, um, let's see here the next disease, and I'm checking time just to make sure I don't go over. So we have Fakhr and Kibr, and this is boasting and arrogance. Now you're going to see some similarities with, uh, you know, what we talked about last time, vanity, arjib, right? Vanity is a form of arrogance, and so this is the extension of that. So let's Let's look here. Um, first, you know, these diseases are the diseases that are associated with Iblis, okay? Um, 
Iblis, remember, he had envy, right? Hasad for Adam alayhi salam. But he was also incredibly arrogant with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He actually talked to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he, you know, commanded him to um, to make sajda to Adam. He spoke in a very rude and disrespectful way, and which is why he is who he is. But he says to Allah, do you see this one whom you have honored above me? Right? Astaghfirullah. He's challenging Allah. Like, how could you, uh, ab- you know, choose this one? He's talking about Adam alayhi salam above me. If you delay me, and now he says, if you delay me until the day of resurrection, I will surely destroy his descendants, like his children, all the children of Adam, except for a few. So Iblis is, you know, full of arrogance, astaghfirullah, for him to speak to his own creator that way, right? And then he says in another verse, in chapter 7, verse 12, he says, what, um, when Allah subhanahu wa says to him, asks him, what prevented you from prostrating when I commanded you? And he said, what? Qala ana khairun min. I am better than him. So this is boasting, right? This is what the definition of boasting is. He's arrogant with Allah, and then he's boasting. Like, I'm better than him. Why should I, why should I bow to him, right? Astaghfirullah. You created me from fire and created him from clay. And then, astaghfirullah, so we don't want ever to have any qualities that are close to Iblis, ever. Um, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah does not love the arrogant and boasting one. So he specifically tells us in the Quran that these two groups of people, that he doesn't love them. So you never want to be yadabla from any group of people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't love, right? So that's why it's so, so dangerous. So let's look, you might recognize these pictures, right? Boasting and arrogance are paired together because arrogant people look down on others and make them feel inferior. So, you know, you're arrogant because you think you're superior to other people. And then the boasting is what the words that you say to make them feel that bad, right? You You want them to feel low, you want them to have doubt about the, their, themselves, so you boast. You tell them how much more talented you are than them, how much better you are, how much smarter, how much better looking. You know, oh, I have uh, my hair is nicer, my eyes are nicer. I'm better at this sport or at this game. I'm better in my studies. I got this grade. You know, um, my, I'm, you know, I did all my work, and you just start showing off all these things, but you're doing it for the intent of making the other person feel bad because you truly think they are lower than you. You look down on them, just like, again, these two images that we have. This is a perfect example of what arrogance does. It leads, or boasting, it leads to this type of behavior, right? All right, so the treatment for boasting and arrogance, first we realize that all the good that we have is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that we always have to be in a state of gratitude right? And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows everything we do. He's fully aware. So it's a, you know, same uh, treatment that we found for, for Ajib and some of the other, uh, you know, uh, diseases that we talked about, ostentation, riya, suma, all of these, where you just start to forget that Allah is the source of all of your blessings and that he can remove them at any time. So you want to remember that whatever thing you're boasting about, or arrogant about, they didn't come from you. You don't have them because you just were, you know, have them. They were given to you and they can always be taken from you. Okay, so that's one of the ways to put that fear in your heart that this is not acceptable behavior. Um, also, you never want to walk around thinking that yourself, uh, yourself anything, right? And this is where you want to check your uh, self image. Is it tied to? The way that I dress, the way that I look, is it tied to these superficial things, right, about me? Or is it about my character? Like, what are the things that I'm so prideful about? But uh, check yourself if you ever, you know, connect your self-image to the things that you have, because it might put those feelings of pride and arrogance in your heart. So these are also very important. And this is the same slide we used, again, for the previous diseases of the heart, so you might recognize them. So let's go ahead to the next disease. Remember, we have six to cover, and I want to make sure that we are um, on on target here. So let's see. One second. Sorry. Bismillah. Okay. So we have displeasure with blame is karahtul dham. Okay. And this is 
not liking ever to be corrected or criticized, even when it's constructive. Constructive is what? Constructive is when you when someone is trying to correct you because not to make you feel bad about yourself or feel down, but they're actually trying to help you, right? So sometimes you might have um, your parents, your teachers, your cousins, your siblings, someone correct you, right? But they do it in a way that is makes you feel like they're mocking you, right? That's clearly wrong. Um, and, and it's okay to feel like, well, that's not nice because the, the believer, we're never, we should never be humiliated or humiliate ourselves. So it's normal to not like when someone seems like they're mocking you while they're correcting you. Like if they're telling you, what's wrong with you? Why didn't you know that? Oh gosh, you're so not smart. You know, if someone says that to you, and then they tell you what the answer is or what you should do better. That's totally wrong. You know, that person is also now being boastful, right? It's a form of arrogance to do that, to show that you are so much smarter and that you're this person that you're correcting doesn't know. So we don't do that, right? But if someone is trying to just teach you uh, something and you yourself don't like it, you just don't, you don't like them ever to tell you that what you did was wrong, and immediately you have an attitude problem. You might even, you know, say something back to them, like whatever. Um, yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. You don't need to tell me, or it's none of your business. Mind your own business. This is probably because your your nafs is just doesn't like to be corrected. And this is uh, again, it's one of the diseases of the heart because the believers always want to be better, right? If you're a Muslim, you want to be the best person that you can be. So if your fellow Muslim or a friend or whoever is trying to help you to become a better person, you don't take offense to that. You actually look at it like, thank you. Thank you so much. Because I want to remember, present my heart, uh, my qalbun salim to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I want to, um, I don't, I want to be free of all of these diseases of the heart. So if you can help me cleanse my heart, you're helping me thank you. That's how you look at it, right? And so you have to have a very good attitude about that. But if you feel embarrassed, if someone, you know, uh, if you make a mistake, let's say you're in a classroom setting and you get the wrong answer, you raised your hand and then you got the wrong answer. And then you're, you you sit with that and you feel bad and you feel like you're annoyed um, and embarrassed and you kind of want to hide and maybe you never want to go to the class again. This is all part of this disease of the heart, okay? It's you're, you're having a hard time because your nafs doesn't like to be wrong. And then if you think about what others think of you, you're too worried about their opinion of you, them liking you, um, more than you're thinking about the truth or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is also another sign that you have this disease of the heart. So you want to be very careful and pay attention to yourself. Because sometimes, you know, these things, like I said, they, they're subtle. But if you, um, if as a, as a Muslim, you're always looking for two things, truth, right? And to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are the most important things for us. So if uh, someone, you know, if you have a problem with that and you'd rather not be, you know, have an honest uh, exchange because you, you'd rather cover your faults and pretend like they don't exist because you're too worried about your image, then you're not thinking about the right things, right? So really important to distinguish that. Okay, so here's the treatment for uh, displeasure with blame. It's to be more concerned about being a witness to the truth, right? That's what we said. Believers are concerned about wit being a witness to the truth, even if it's against themselves, right? Allah subhanahu wa tells us in chapter 2, verse 143, and thus we have made you a just community, right? He's talking to the Muslims, that you will be witnesses over the people and the messenger will be a witness over you. So, to be a witness over the people means that you are a person again. You're just, uh, you're, you're, uh, you're, you're, you know, you you speak the truth and you fight for justice for all people. But you can't do that if you're not concerned with the truth, you know. And that's what a person with who has this disease of the heart. They're not concerned with the truth. They're concerned with their image. So they they don't care about whether or not something is right or wrong. They care about if they look right and they don't look wrong. You see the difference. Very important to know. And then we should have modesty before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instead of 
focusing on being embarrassed in front of people, right? Our priority should be to have modesty before Allah. And that's why, you know, you want to really think about why do I care what people think of me, but not what Allah thinks of me. Rather, I should f- hold my head down because if, if, you know, you do, you make a mistake and someone's correcting you, your heart should be more concerned with being modest with Allah instead of embarrassed with people. And this is, you know, from the Prophet he told us, uh, two things. Verily, every religion has a character, and the character of Islam is modesty. And then he says, directly, be modest before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as is his right. So he actually needs, you know, this is the right of Allah, that we show modesty in front of Allah, that we're not worried about people as much. Because people are in front of you, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one who matters. His opinion is the only opinion that matters. You could spend the rest of your life making all the people in your life happy, but if you're doing it in disobedience to Allah, you're you're the ultimate loser. You know, even if they give you mountains of gold and crowns and call you all these amazing names, if you got all of that by disobedience to Allah, but you made all these other people happy and rich, you know what? Unfortunately, that's your, um, you're, you're, like I said, you're the ultimate loser. There's nobody worse than that person who's just living to please the people and forgets Allah. Like that's ghafla beyond ghafla, right? So you have to think the opposite. I need to make Allah happy. And this is actually also explained to us. Uh, there's a hadith that says the person who f- works on pleasing people um, and, and not pleasing Allah, um, will the people will never be pleased with them and Allah will not be pleased with them. And the one that focuses on pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala over the people, Allah will be pleased with them and then he will make those people pleased with him. So it works to your advantage to put Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first because he will be happy with you and then he'll make everybody else happy with you. And you'll you'll see the difference. You'll see being you'll you'll be treated with respect. People will want to listen to you. They'll you know invite you to things because you're prioritizing Allah. But if you're doing it for other people, they're not there's you know, as I say, haters. There's a lot of haters in the world. You could spend so much time doing good for people, but they'll always find something to pick on and uh, you know complain about. And you'll you'll see it in your life that human beings are not easy to please. So why put all of that energy in pleasing them, whereas Allah is easy to please? And then he has the power to uh, change your circumstances so that you find ease in your life. It just makes sense, right? So prioritize. All right, the next uh, disease of the heart. This is called antipathy toward death. Karahtul maut, okay? This is a disease of the heart because it is tells us if you have a problem where death, the mention of it, you know, that if someone mentions something dying or someone passing away, that you can't handle it, right? It gets you to a place of you just, um, you shut down and you don't want to, you run from the conversation, you get upset. No, 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 it's too depressing. I don't want to talk about it. I don't talk about it. It spooks me out, freaks me out, scary. You have to be careful because that means that you likely have too much of an attachment to this dunya um, and you like this dunya so much, but you don't realize that by attaching yourself to this dunya, you're causing more distance between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because the way for us to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to leave this dunya, right? So if you want to meet Allah, if you have the desire to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you don't look to death as this horrible, terrible thing. You understand that death is like a door that you have to go through to get to the other side, right? And so that's how you look at death. It's not like this terrible thing. It's just something has to be done. And so here's a hadith that we have. um, Whoever loves to meet Allah, Allah loves to meet him. And whoever hates to meet Allah, Allah hates to meet him. It was said, O Messenger of Allah, does hating to meet Allah mean hating to meet death? Uh, For all of us hate death, right? And then he corrected. He said, he said, no, rather that is only at the moment of death, right? But if he is given the glad tidings of the mercy and forgiveness of Allah, he loves to meet Allah and Allah loves to meet him. And if he is given the tidings of the punishment of Allah, he hates to meet Allah and Allah hates to meet him. So, This is important, right? Because it's okay to think of death and be a little spooked out by it, but you don't hate it in the sense that you don't 
uh, you can't see that it's, you know, leading to that meeting with Allah. So to, to dislike the idea of it, it's a normal human thing. Most of us don't, you know, want to think about those things, just like this Sahabi said. He said it very honestly. Nobody who loves death, right? It's sad. It's a sad thing. You lose someone, right? So um, that's not the point here. We're not saying you have to love losing people. We're, we're talking about is not having this uh, feeling towards death that you um, forget that it is, as I said, a passage to the other side where you meet Allah. So you just have to look at it like it is what it is. We're all going to pass. And that's why Allah tells us in the Quran, he says, every soul shall taste death, which is just a fact. Everything dies. Flowers die. I got flowers for Mother's Day and we had to throw them away the other day because they died. They were gorgeous for, you know, a week or two. And then they started to die and decay and wilt. And then the water gets brown and it just kind of spoils. Food dies. How much food is thrown away every day? Because it dies. Uh, animals die. There's roadkill every day on the roads. We see poor animals dead. Uh, flowers, uh, trees. You know, there's so many things that die. Stars. Stars die, you know. So, um the point is, is everything dies, and that's just the nature of this dunya. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in chapter verse, uh, excuse me, 62 verse 8, the death from which you flee will overtake you. Thereafter, you will return to the knower of the seen and unseen. He will then inform you of all that you had been doing. So death is coming for all of us. When it happens, Allah knows, but we don't... Um, we don't run from it. We just accept it as part of life. And we are grateful for every day he's given us. And we make the most of every day he's given us. Okay. And that's, that's how the attitude is about death. And then here we look. I like this sort of imagery, right? Because we got to have be honest. Look at the phases of life. We all started in this childhood infancy stage. And we can become toddlers, little kids, and adolescent, pre-adolescents, and teens. Then adults, right? It kind of just moves into these different, um, you know, uh, ages and, and then look at the end of life, right? Everything kind of, we go into this growth period and then it starts to come back down. We're getting smaller, we're shriveling up, our bones get shorter. People who are tall in their youth, suddenly they don't have as much height because we kind of just start to come down a little bit. This is the nature of life. And then we return to the graves, right? People come, inshallah, they make dua for us because there's a whole, you know, uh, phase that happens between this world and the next life called the barzakh. And that's where people who have passed on, they're in that realm. Um, and inshallah, they're in a good state. All of our loved ones, they know when we go to visit them. And this is all in the knowledge of Allah. But we have a positive understanding. And then we know that, again, we're all returning back to from where we came from. We came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we return to him, which is why we say, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun, when someone passes away, because it's just the natural uh, thing that happens, right? Okay. So how do we get over the fear of death, right? Because again, we said that it is reflexive to have, uh, you know, to be afraid or to be not, you know, just death makes you uncomfortable. Um, but you have to remember that there is comfort in death for the believer, right? We see it as a uh, as leaving this place, right? Because the dunya is a place of discomfort. If you're looking at it, we have sickness, we have we have um, pain, grief, loss. There's a lot of uh, hardships that come in this dunya, and that's by design. So when you look at leaving this place of problems, right, of filth, like, you know, dirtiness, there's things that are not pleasant, even smells, sounds that are not pleasant, foods, you know, things that taste, don't taste pleasant. There's a lot of things that are not pleasant in this world. When you think about leaving this world and going to the next world where everything is the opposite, it's amazing, it's incredible, it's beyond our imagination, it's everlasting, nothing dies, everything is clean, it's uh, it's fresh, it's new, and it's within minutes and in, you know seconds, whatever we want uh, in our mind will come before us. So there's just think about that. So that's why when we again think of leaving this place, we don't look at it as a final act. We look at it as a transition. We're going to the uh, the next better place, right? It's an upgrade. Um, 
And then here's a quote from a famous a scholar who says, Sheikh Ibn al-Habib, he said that in death, there are 1,000 repo reposes. Sorry, there's a misspelling there. It's supposed to be reposes, no N, for the Muslim. As long as you are in this world, there is not a cell in your body that does not experience pain, right? Inflammation, right? That's a form of pain inside the body and disease. Once you are out of this world, all of that ends. So when we leave this world, all of that pain that our bodies go through, right? Where we are, we need to stretch and we need to twitch and we need to do this and that and drink and eat this or go get an ice pack because I have pain here. I need a Tylenol. I need, I need medication. I have a fever. All of that that happens to human beings throughout our lives, it comes to an end and we finally have repose. Repose is like rest. And then the Prophet ﷺ encouraged the remembrance of death. Um, those who do will be blessed with certain qualities. So if you remember death often, and not as a sad thing where you sit there and think about, oh my God, going in the grave and you freak yourself out. No, we're talking about just that it's a reality and it can happen and we all go back to Allah and you just kind of are aware of it happening, that you become more content, which means you are satisfied in life more you uh, have a lack of greed and covetousness. So when you remember death a lot, you don't, you're not really um, concerned with uh, d the dunya. So then you become more generous and you're not as greedy, right? And you have more energy to achieve good deeds um, because you are you know, motivated that you know life isn't precious, time is precious, and you need to make use of your time. So you have that motivational drive. And then you have, you're increasing in Toba. So all these amazing things that happen as a result of the remembrance of death. So this is a way that we treat antipathy towards death, okay? So next uh, disease is obliviousness to blessings, nisyan al ni'mah. This prevents one from recognizing the blessing that he or she has and makes them display ingratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then negativity to his creation. When you are a negative person, right, you're just not ever grateful for what you have. You always find flaws. You're always complaining. Nothing's ever good enough for you. Um, and your attitude about life is just negative, negative, negative. This is the danger of this disease of the heart is that it makes you ungrateful to Allah, but also you just have an energy that nobody likes. So a lot of your people who have, who know people that are like this or have this disease, they don't want, ever want to be around them. Never. If they are sitting somewhere at a, let's say at school or at a coffee shop and, or at a restaurant, and then they see that person coming, they want to turn and hide. It's like, oh God, there's that person. I don't want to see them. Why? Because they're so negative. They're always complaining. You know, I can't, I can't handle it. It's such negative energy. It makes me feel bad. So do you want to be that person? No, nobody wants to be that person that people hide from, Right. Um, so the Prophet also taught us whoever is not grateful to the people is not grateful to Allah. So if you're not grateful to people, then that means you're also not grateful to Allah. So this is how we have to understand. It's so important to be in a state of gratitude. And this is what this disease does. It takes you out of the state of gratitude completely. You're blind to the obvious blessings Allah has given you. So something just to keep in mind so, you know, in order to prevent this from taking root, we have to increase our gratitude, right? How do we do that? Well, we have to understand that there's three different types of gratitude. The first, we call it shukr, uh, shukr bil qalb, and this is gratitude of the heart. And this means to be grateful from the core of your hearts and have iman. Shukr bil lisan is uh, to be grateful by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with his attributes, right? Praising him. And then shukr bil jawara are your limbs. And this is by doing good things with the, the physical body that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you. You do good deeds. You pray your prayers on time. You're fasting. You're giving zakat. You're giving help. You're giving advice. You're teaching. You're actually using the body in the right way. That's a form of shukr. So you, it's not just sitting in with your tasbih and going, alhamdulillah, 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 alhamdulillah. That's not enough. That's just lisan, right? You have to look at it as all three. That's all three are, are important. We have to have uh, all three forms of shukr. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us also that he never changes any blessing he has bestowed upon a people until they first change what is in themselves. Okay, so just to keep in mind, if you want to change your negative situation, maybe your life is hard and that's why you're negative, 
then this ayah is the answer to you, that he will not change your condition, your state, whatever it is that's happening for you, until you work on yourself. So you have to start doing this, what we're doing here, tasqiyat al-nafs. You're cleansing your heart. You're trying to become a better person. You're pushing yourself to be more concerned with other people than to be selfish, right? You're being more generous with your time, as we said. Those are all good steps. And then inshallah, Allah will bring the relief, okay? So also it's very important that you get the practice of being more grateful. Like it's something that you actively do. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us if you give thanks, I will give you more. It's such an easy formula. If you want more blessings in your life, if you want more happiness in your life, the way to get that is what? Be more grateful. Just be more grateful. Say Alhamdulillah. I thank you, Allah. Thank you for everything that you give me and really saying it out loud or in your own heart and listing um, those things. You know, there's a lot of, you know, even non-Muslims, there's research, like there was a, these two scientists who did a study um, here. It's by Sacramento, UC Davis, but they did a study where they took people who had all these like health problems and real big issues going on in their life. And what they did is they had them do a, a gratitude journal. They started getting in the practice of, of journaling and really recognizing all of their things that they are grateful for. And just by doing that for you know a few days or a week or a month or so, they their physical symptoms started getting better their sick, whatever injuries or problems they had uh, with their, uh, as I said, like their body was healing. And then also emotional healing from, you know, whatever depression or anxiety or things that happened, trauma in their life. And like all of these really positive things started happening for them. The only difference was that they started doing this. That's it. They started changing their mind and taking focus of their brain instead of letting negative thoughts come in, which uh, oftentimes are from shaitan. He's the one who's whispers, right? He likes to make us feel bad. You cast him out of your heart by increasing in gratitude. And so you want to make a list like this. And of course, the first and foremost thing you should always be grateful for is to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet That is the greatest blessing of existence is that we know our Lord and we know his beloved. And then of course, you look to your family and home life, your health, your friends, your time, the fact that you have time to do things. Safety, it's not in the list, but you know, safety, food and drink, nice clothes, material things, all the things that you have, but think about them deeply because there's a lot of people who don't have even one fifth of what you have. How many kids don't have their parents? How many kids are born as orphans? They don't have more than one outfit. They only have one pair of clothes. They, some kids don't have shoes. They're, they're homeless or they're you know living in such impoverished situations where they don't even have uh, shoes so they have to walk around and then get injured um, you know playing can you imagine playing or trying to play who uh, many of them don't even have time to play because they're forced to go and collect uh, you know soda cans and garbage so that they can make some money or to do some you know they, they'll go far from their home because they, they're desperate for to eat so they'll go look through garbage cans and and do so much because they're they have nothing but they have to do that barefoot they don't have shoes they don't have uh, toys. You have some, my kids, they have a toy room. I'm telling them all the time, like, be grateful for your toys. Do you know there's children who's never, who've never seen a toy before? They've only played with sticks and rocks. They've, they have no idea what a Lego is. They have no idea what a doll is. They've never in their life seen these things or electric stuff. Forget it. They don't know what electricity is. A lot of people in our world are living in really difficult situations. So. You have to be grateful to Allah that he gave you such an amazing life, you know, and that's why the more you do this, then you're spared from this terrible disease of the heart where you don't even, you can't even mention the things that you're grateful for. That's what people like this are. They're so negative. Nothing's ever good enough, right? And then to remember, the more grateful you are, the more you'll get. Allah is so generous. So... This is the last disease of the heart, and this is called um, Hez, which is ridiculing, okay, and making fun of people, humiliating, caricaturing, lampooning. Anytime you try to take someone down and really just mock them to a place 
uh, where they're humiliated, you have to know right away, this is haram on every level. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in chapter 49, verse 11, O oh, you who believe, do not let people mock another people, for it may be that these are better than them. Nor should women mock other women, for it may be that they are better than them. And do not taunt one another, nor insult each other with nicknames. Really powerful reminder that you, if you're someone that just likes to mock groups of people, like there's a lot of people who make racial jokes, you know, they like to make fun of certain groups, like certain races, um, and they'll, you know, do terrible things to point out the things that make them look different or speak different, like languages, whatever, but they'll, they're, you know, they'll just mock groups. So this is what Allah's saying, don't mock groups of people. And then he's also saying, don't mock individual people, because it could be that one is better than the other. So very um, clear warning that this is haram, right? So let's look at this. I mean, anybody who's ever been in a situation where you felt bullied, right? It's a terrible thing to be the receiving end of that because especially if it's, I mean, there's shaming, right? You're being shamed in front of people. So it's a horrible feeling. Um, and then there's a lot of sometimes harshness because uh, in their words. So it's not just they, they might, they might be taunting, you know, making sounds, but oftentimes they come with words that are also very hard to hear, very damaging. So this is why we say, Words can be weaponized, okay? What, are, what does that mean? A weapon is what? It's something that you, you, you discharge and then it sends something to a, a target and it's supposed to harm that target, right? So your tongue has the ability to discharge the same way a gun or an arrow, bow and arrow. Um, it can discharge words that come out and then they land on whoever you're speaking to. So if you weaponize your words, that's what it's like to the one who's on the other end of it. It's very painful to hear that. And so, you know, we never, of course, want to be those who bully and mock ever. May Allah forgive us. But to see that it's, um, you know, it's, it's like what we saw with scolding. It can have a really negative effect because not only does it cause so much pain as you can see in these images, they're all crying because it's hard to hear people teasing you and mocking you. But you know what? The, the danger is that this, if shaitan uh, is around and he will try, what he can do is basically take that those feelings of shame that the person being mocked feels and turn it into rancor. Ghil. He can do that very easily because he'll take this uh, bullied soul and he'll just work on them. How could they do that to you? You know, they're such terrible people. You should teach them a lesson. Who do they think they are? And this is why, Billah, you've had, we've had many times in history, throughout history, where the bully, uh, the one who's bullied, excuse me, turns into a bully. Because all of that, those feelings make them feel that they have to get back, right? This revenge enters their heart, this need for revenge. And that, of course, is from ghil, because it's the anger of being shamed and being mocked that turns into wanting harm on the other person. This happens every day, but throughout human history, much of uh, our greatest human tragedies have come out of this uh, happening, you know, that, that someone or a group of people were mocked and then they came back fierce, fiercely and attacked even worse than what happened to them. So we have to seek refuge from this. It's a terrible disease of the heart, right? So let's look at um, the treatment. Uh, first of all, we should know that this is a sign of ignorance right away. Um, well, there's many reasons, but you know, one incident is when Prophet Musa, he was asked by his people because he told them, he gave them an order uh, to sacrifice a cow. And when they heard that he wanted them to do this, uh, they replied, are you mocking us? Like, why would we do this? And his words are clear. He says, I seek refuge in God from being ignorant, which means the one who mocks is ignorant, right? This is how we see this ayah. So you're just an ignorant person if you do that behavior. And that's why he's like, no, I, I would never mock you. I'm not an ignorant person, right? 
And then it's also a form of arrogance because usually people who mock do think of themselves as better, right? This is why, uh, you know, they kind of hold themselves a certain way and then they do the whole pointing of the finger. It's very, it's called posturing. When you posture, you're showing that you think you're stronger and better. So you puff yourself up and you then you talk down to people. So this is why a lot of bullies, that's how they do. And that's why you see bullies in school, for example, they'll pick on kids that are smaller or younger because they like that power dynamic to show I'm stronger and more powerful than you, right? It's also arrogant, right? And so this is why we have said, Nadi said, do not belittle anyone for he or she may be a saint of God. What does that mean is that everybody in the world, nobody knows who they are to Allah. Just because someone might, you might not like them or they say something to you, doesn't necessarily mean they're a bad person. Maybe there was a misunderstanding. Maybe something happened. For example, I'll give you an example. Um, so this is just, I'm making it up, right? But this happens all the time. It's a hypothetical. Hypothetical is like, you know, it's just a, it's an example. But this scenario has happened many times to many people because I've heard it from people. And I know it happens. You're at the masjid, Okay. And you're walking by um, and there's someone that you recognize. And maybe it's kind of like there's a lot of people, but you look over and you smile and you say, Salaam Alaikum, and they walk right past you. Nothing, no words, right? So what could happen is you start to think about it. And then Shaitan, of course, is right there with you. And he's like, wow how rude who do they think they are you they totally saw you and they ignored you oh my gosh what a disrespectful person and now you have this terrible opinion about that person this is called what su'adhan remember we talked about negative thoughts so when you rush to thinking the worst about someone su'adhan right su'adhan so you thought all of this because that person didn't say salam to you but what if what if, and this could happen, right? Especially now with hijab, I and mean, let's just say it was a sister. What if she was um, on her AirPods and she was just, someone just gave her the worst news ever. Someone was, you know, called her in a panic emergency and she's rushing out of the masjid as you're going in because they're telling her, oh my gosh, you have to come, your house is on fire. You know, something like really intense. So maybe the sister saw you, but she's, having some information being told to her that is so shocking to her that she cannot even acknowledge you. Um, is there a bad intention on her part to hurt your feelings? Is there a bad intention on her part to disrespect you, to ignore your greeting? No, she's a human being, but you're not seeing what is happening because you're assuming the worst. That's why we have to make excuses for people. Those AirPods, if she has AirPods or a headset, are hidden from you. And you're just, you know, seeing her walk pa past you. But the reality is known to Allah. And that's why you don't judge people. Because you don't know who they are to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of the scholars said about Omar, you know, Omar, Omar ibn al-Khattab, he was, um, you know, a part of the, the mushrikeen before he accepted Islam. And so there's a famous quote that says that Omar uh, was beloved to Allah even when he was worshiping those idols, when he wasn't Muslim. Because in the knowledge of Allah, Allah already knew who Omar was and who he was going to be and that he was going to die, you know, as one of the greatest companions or, you know, second greatest companion of the Prophet, right? He already knew that about him. So even though Omar didn't know that and he was still, you know, bowing down to the idols, he was still beloved to Allah because Allah knew his ending. And that's what we have to understand is we don't know people's ending. Nobody, none of us know how people are going to die. And a person can become a beloved to Allah in their last and final moments. You know, I had, um, there was actually a video that was going on earlier uh, this morning. And it was this uh, very sweet lady. Uh, she had become a Muslim. She's like eight, maybe 90 plus, maybe close to 100 years old. Her name is Maryam. And she's learning a dua and she's reciting it. And I just was like, subhanAllah, she just became Muslim at the very tail end of her life. You know, she's, 
she probably doesn't have that much life to go, but Allah gave her Islam so late in her life. And inshallah, that's someone, there you go. You could have seen Maryam in her 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s and maybe even her early 80s and you would have thought all these terrible things about her. But look at where she is. To, for her to have guidance before she leaves this world, may Allah protect it for her. That shows you she's a beloved of Allah. So you don't know where people are going to end. And that's why you should never, ever, ever uh, have bad thoughts where you are not just ridiculing and mocking people, but then you're also Billah, making claims about about them, like oh those are you know they're such terrible people, um, and they'll you know Allah will never love someone like that. Sometimes people say these really awful things, like oh he you know they're going to go to hell. They'll say things about people go to hell. Yeah, Billah, who are you to ever say that to someone? You should never say that, right? So we have to be very careful. And then also that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says here, know that those who mock people in this life will be mocked in the hereafter. For it is a divine law that God recompenses people with the like of what they have done. So on, on the day of judgment, a lot of the things that people do, the evil people do in this world, they will have that same thing done to them in Jahannam. So this is why you want to be very careful from ever doing anything that displeases Allah because he'll teach you a very serious lesson later down the line that you don't want to learn. So may Allah protect us from all of these diseases, inshallah. So that, my dear beloved children, um, is the end of this presentation. So just to because we do have a little bit of time and someone I saw briefly ask about a summary. Let's try to do what we can in the few minutes. We might have to go a little bit over parents. So if you're able to, please keep your kids here for just maybe 10 minutes more um, after the hour, because I want to try to do a, a summary of this, inshallah. Wow, there are a lot of slides. I, <laughs> I forgot how much effort this was, <laughs> but it was worth it. It was worth it for all of you. You came here every single a day and I truly truly appreciate that. So let's look here. We started with purification of the heart. This was the what text of Imam Al Mawlud Al Mawlud, and he is a Mauritanian scholar, right? And then we have um, what do we have about him? Um, uh, we have I mean, sorry, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf is the what? Who is he? The translator of the text, right? So um, here we go. Is his biography. We went over these details, right? And then we talked about Sheikh Hamza, that he's the president and founder of Zaytuna College right here in the Bay Area, remember? Alhamdulillah, make da for both of them. Do not forget Imam al Mawlud. Do not forget Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. You have to make da for them. If you enjoyed this class, you should make da for them before you make da for me, if you're making da for me. I hope you are, but you should make da for them before you make da for me, okay? Um, and then we talked about why it's so important to purify the heart because the hadith, right? The Prophet told us there's a piece of flesh that if it lies in the body. If it's sound, the entire body is sound. And if it's corrupted, the whole body is corrupted. Verily, this piece is the heart. So subhanAllah, it's so important. This is the mo number one thing that we are going to present to Allah on the day of judgment. It takes, uh, it, it's so important that we focus our entire lives on keeping this heart clean. So then we talked about the eight different types of hearts. And we said that there are, uh, there's a dead heart, right? Which is here. Then we have the hardened heart. And each heart has its own problems, okay? So its own uh, qualities that we need to understand how it happens, how they become this way. The darkened heart, the blackened heart, the sealed heart, the locked heart, the blind heart, and then finally the sound heart, the qalbun salim. This is the one that we want. So we de described the qualities of these hearts. Then uh, we went into comparing and contrasting the effects of disease on a physical heart and the effects of a disease on a spiritual heart, that it's very similar. It hardens, right? And it prevents the heart from working the way that it, sh that it was designed to work. Same with spiritual diseases. So here are the list of the 25 diseases that we have. We have... Uh, miserliness, wantonness, hatred, iniquity, love of the world, envy, blameworthy modesty, blameworthy thoughts, fear of poverty, ostentation, relying on other than God, displeasure with divine decree, seeking reputation, false hope, negative thoughts, vanity, fraud, anger, heedlessness, rancor, boasting and arrogance, displeasure with blame, antipathy toward death, obliviousness to blessings, derision, subhanAllah. All of these we went through. 
And we are just going to, again, go through them. We went through Bokhal, which is miserliness. We talked about how it's related to the word mesek, which is, or comes from the word mesek, which is, uh, you know, the same from constipation, because when you have Bokhal, you're holding on to something that actually harms you, right? And we talked about that. We talked about Batr, to have this unbridled uh, feeling that you just can't control yourself that makes you prideful and do things in excess, Right. And the disease of uh, we talked about Bogod, having hatred, uh, you know, uh, again, of others, you, it, it makes you an unjust person. So you have to be aware of hatred. Right. Um, then we moved on to iniquity, buggy, harming anything in creation without justice or just cause. Excuse me. You can't just go around harming things or people. Right. This is haram. There has to be a reason if you're protecting yourself, you're feeling in danger. That's one thing. But just because you feel like it. No, there's that's not an excuse. Uh, right, we talked about love of the world, dunya, the dangers of attaching yourself to this place because it makes you distracted from the remembrance of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. You'll start to uh, do uh, more sins. You'll fall into sinful behavior, and then it'll increase you in many of the other diseases that we're talking about. Because dunya, according to some of our scholars, is the root of of all diseases. Then uh, we talked about how, again, Allah, the Prophet warned us that uh, towards the end of the time, we'd be like the, the foam of the ocean. We would be weak. There would be a lot of us, but we'd be weak. And it's because of hubba dunya. It's because we're too preoccupied with money, 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 money. We want all the nicest things. We want the cars. We want the homes. We want the jewelry. We want the delicious food. We want everything. It's like we're, we just want to consume, eat money. And that's why the Prophet told us that the son of Adam, his mouth will never be full truly until he's in his grave. And it's the dirt of the grave that fills his mouth. So here we see this uh, character here. He's just stuffing his face with money. Well, it's never going to be enough because that's what Habit does. It's like an empty, bottomless pit. And this is uh, the other problem, too, is that you start daydreaming. You're not thinking about the stuff that matters, right? You're not thinking about Allah or the Prophet or giving and going to the masjid and doing good works because all you're thinking about is what? Getting money and getting things that you want, right? So the remembrance of death is how you treat that. Uh, and then we talked about also the uh, different categories of, of love of the world, right? And then <clears throat> we talked about hasad. And how, again, when you um, have hasad, you have envy for other people. You want them to lose whatever blessing they have. We distinguish between jealousy and envy. Jealousy is having that feeling of, of that there's something missing that you want, and that you, uh, you. But it's not necessarily tied to a person. Envy is where you actually have someone that has that thing, and then you want them to lose it. They're distinct, but they're very related as well. And both of them, you want to remember death. Um, and this is a good way to get rid of it. We also distinguish between uh, healthy envy, right? Ghibta, when you're competing uh, with uh, other someone else for the sake of the pleasure of Allah, this is called ghibta, and this can be done primarily in two ways, which is um, when you see someone of wealth, and you want to have increased wealth because you want to do good works with that wealth and wisdom. If someone has knowledge, you want the same knowledge because you want to also be able to teach. So in these two cases, it's perfectly fine to have ghibta. Now we moved on and we talked about uh, the uh, the rest of these diseases here, which we'll get into blameworthy modesty, right? This is when you're, you lack courage and you don't speak up when you should. Um, you don't ask questions when you should, and it can stand in the way of you being a person of justice, right? You, um, you actually may turn away when you see a situation that needs justice and needs your attention because you you're, you don't have a balance. You're, you're, you're thinking too much about maybe your image or other people. You're not thinking about doing the right thing, okay? So then we talked about uh, our thoughts, right, and how to control our thoughts that we have anywhere from up to 60,000, some say, you know, even more than that thoughts a day. 80% of our thoughts are, are negative, 95% are actually repetitive, and so we have to be very, uh, you know, control the flow of our thoughts, right, um, and make sure that if we have blameworthy thoughts, uh, that we know that those are from shaitan and we should not entertain them. Those are thoughts about the nature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We can never know him beyond what he's already revealed to us through the 99 names, through his book. But trying to imagine him is just all from Iblis. We don't do that. 
and then thinking bad thoughts about other people, right? Just assuming the worst, like we talked about earlier. So then when you think about bad people in the, in the absence of any evidence, just your own thoughts and minds and suspicions, it leads you to uh, having this disease of the heart, blameworthy thoughts. Fear of poverty is similar or kind of tied to hobodunya. Um, you just want, want, want. It's insatiable. You can't uh, let go of your wealth when you should, which is also similar to miserliness. So it really contributes to a lot of other diseases growing from this idea that, oh my gosh, I'm not going to have enough. I'm not going to have enough, right? And so you're all you're doing again is you're thinking about money, which makes you um, uh, compromise your principles and your religious values. So you start to, uh, you know, forget all the things that you're supposed to do to with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your worship of him, but also for your family, because your mind and eyes, all it can see is money, 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 money. Okay, and so you want to be very careful from that. And then also the importance of charity. Um, this is how we protect our hearts from it because we know that we our wealth never diminishes when we give for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is how we uh, increase our reliance on Allah and remove this disease of the heart. Um, we talked about um, also, yes, just this is that was the point about charity cleansing your wealth. Then we moved into the next um, disease of the heart, which are ostentation. Yeah, this is when you show off and you're getting trying to get attention from people uh, for the deeds that you're doing. And these could be religious deeds or otherwise, you just like the attention. You want people to, you know, see you and you're not doing it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala anymore. This is a, called what the minor shirk. We want to be very careful from this because you are uh, all the beloved associating partners with Allah, which is the worst of all things that we could possibly do, is to say Allah has partners. Well, when you start to do things for people and not just Allah, that's in a way what you're doing. You're putting those people as if they're the same as Allah in terms of your importance. So you want to be very, you know, in terms of the way you're prioritizing them. So you want to be very careful never to, uh, to fall into this very, very dangerous thing. And we also talked about how sneaky it is that it can creep into the heart the same way that a black ant on a black rock and on a dark night can undetected, unknown, and it's very subtle. So it's something that you have to always check your intentions, always ask yourself, why am I doing this? Is it for the sake of uh, being seen and having titles and, oh, you know, people praising me and complimenting and making me feel special? Or is it true? Right. Um, and then we talked about um, having trust in uh, any in other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? This is when we try, call on other people and we don't put our trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We never beg, for example. Begging is considered reprehensible. It's not a good thing to do. We turn to Allah. And then, of course, if we need really help, you know, assistance with something, we can look to our masjid or our, you know, there's sometimes different organizations in our community that offer services to people. That's different than begging. Begging is going and making people feel uncomfortable and asking them to, uh, you know, to put themselves in a burden for your sake, which is why the Prophet said that it is better uh, for you to, um, hold on, let me get here. Where's that hadith? Did I skip it already? I think it's on the previous one. Sorry. Uh, yeah, that you, um, no, there's a hadith about selling wood. Did I miss it? I think I missed it. No, I don't want to misquote it. But there is a hadith that says, the Prophet said that it's better for you to sell wood, uh, you know, collect, gather firewood and sell it than to go in and beg people. Okay, so I don't know where that hadith disappeared. I thought it was in here, but that's okay, mashallah. So here are the uh, answers for... Um, for that, for relying on other than God. Then we moved on to displeasure with the divine decree. This is when you can't, you know, why me? Why did this have to happen to me? Something happens, something breaks, something falls. You can't get into maybe a class or some program that you wanted to go to or a trip it falls through. Maybe you had a vacation planned and then it doesn't happen. Why, 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 why? Whatever it is that you're, you know, upset about and you're denying the qadr of Allah, this is a disease of the heart. Uh, and so we talked about that. And then we moved on to seeking reputation. So Matt, which is similar to ostentation, right? You want people to hear um, about all of your good works, not necessarily, they don't have to see you, but you want reputation. You want people to know what you're doing. So you kind of throw in, you know, things here and there, because ultimately it's like you're, you're chasing fame, right? You, you, you're chasing that carrot, right? On a stick. And so we talked about that and then um, the dangers of it right? Very similar to the, uh, then we went into false hopes, negative thoughts, and vanity. So this is where you think you have all the time in the world and you can do whatever you want. And you're not really thinking about 
um, the, you know, the fact that life is unpredictable and Allah can take you at any time. And when you do that and you have too much uh, hope, then you become what heedless, uh, careless with your worship of Allah because you keep procrastinating everything. Oh, I'll do it later. I'll do it later. I'll do it later. This is the danger. This is why Imam Ali said people are asleep when they die, they wake up. So you have, we have to wake up before we die. Right. And that's uh, we can't have false hopes when we do that. So remembrance of death is important. Negative thoughts too. And then this is when you just, again, think badly of people for no reason. It's haram. Um, and uh, the tongue is, uh, you know, every day our limbs wake up in the morning and it admonishes the tongue because uh, it says, fear Allah for our sake. We're with you, but we're going to be rewarded or punished based on what you make us do. So if you're straight, we'll be straight. If you're crooked, we'll be crooked. So the tongue is, you know, uh, very dangerous. And we have to be very careful with what we say because negative thoughts leads to negative speech. That's why we're mentioning this. You can't just have a negative thought about someone and keep it inside of you. You you usually almost always want to share it with someone else. Did you see what so-and-so did? Can you believe them? Oh my God, I can't stand this person. And now you've committed riba, which is why it's so dangerous. Okay. Then we talked about, um, this is ajab, right? Uh, vanity, where you think you're so amazing and you can't help but just stare at yourself all day and praise yourself and you're taking selfies and it's like, oh, look how cute I am. And then you want attention. You keep posting those images because you want people to look at you and just want to be like you. This is all ajab, it's vanity. Um, and you're basically self-obsessed. Hmm? Then we have... Uh, we, we talked about, again, how uh, the Prophet ﷺ warned us about, because uh, ajib and arrogance are tied, they're connected, right? Uh, they warned us about these diseases, right? And so there's a lot of um, things. We, we covered this in today's class as well. You can go back and look. Uh, and then we went and did fraud, anger, and heedlessness. This was on last Thursday. We talked about ghish, which is fraud, where you're trying to trick people into something that they're not fully aware of just to get something out of them, some material gain, whether it's money or a job or an opportunity, but you're trying to use trickery in order to do that. This is completely haram. Right. We told, talked about the story with the Prophet Sallallahu and the food. Right. And then we um, talked about ghadab, anger and how anger for other than the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is can be easily, uh, you know, um, it can cause harm and it can lead someone to lose their cool and control. So we have to restrain anger. Many, many hadith that talk about that. La taghdab, right. And then we said that the, that the scholars have used this analogy that it's kind of like that hunting dog. You have to command it. You can't just go wild on its own. It's not going to help you. It's not going to do what it's supposed to do. Anger has a purpose. It has a utility. So you have to rein it in and then keep it uh, on that leash until you need it again, but it shouldn't control you. Okay. Then we talked uh, more about how, what to do if you're angry, right? The Prophet system's advice. Uh, when you're angry, if you're standing, sit down. If you're sitting down, recline, make wudu, pray. That coolness from wudu calms the fires of, of you know, anger. And then, of course, say, Aldu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajim, because the uh, shaitan and shaitan will run from you. We talked about how once the Prophet saw a man, he actually looked like, uh, you know, his face got reddened, kind of uh, like shaitan. And the Prophet told him, again, I have a word if spoken, it will remove this anger from him. Aldu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajim. So then we talked about ghafla, right, and how people become heedless and forgetful of Allah and the dangers of that and how that happens. It's because they, again, know right and wrong, but their love for the dunya makes them completely turn away. And the Prophet told us that the danger of being not in the remembrance of Allah versus being in the remembrance of Allah is the comparison of someone that has life and someone that's died or something that has life and something that's died. And here's that image for you to see the comparison, the contrast. The contrast. And the heedlessness uh, is treated by remembrance of death, right? And then knowing that your prayers are not answered if you're heedless, right? So if you have any desires or wishes in this world, you're not going to get them if you behave heedlessly. Then today we covered all of these. Rancor, right? We talked about all this, so I don't need to review. Fakhar and Kibir. Uh, we talked about Kahat al-Dam. We talked about Kahat al -Mot, And then we ended on, or Nisyan al -Ni'mah, And then we ended on Hats. Okay? So alhamdulillah, that was your quick, super fast review for whoever asked for that. I hope that was helpful to you, inshallah. Let's see, I know some of you might have to go. I don't wanna keep you, but I do wanna see if there's any questions, you guys. And I wanna thank you again. I will try to see if there's any questions, but I wanna thank you again for 
being such a engaging and awesome audience. Wallahi, you made my Ramadan very special. Uh, it was a lot of work to put all this together, but like I said, you were so worth it because every day when I would work on this, I would imagine uh, the sort of excitement that we would have in our Q and A's when you guys would be rushing to answer. It was so cute to witness that and all of your amazing questions and insights that you've had throughout these seven sessions have meant a great deal to me. I really, really thank you from the bottom of my heart for spending your Tuesdays and Thursdays um, with me, or if you're watching them on uh, at other times, whatever time you're giving to this, thank you. It truly, truly means a great deal. Um, now, let me see if there's any questions, inshallah, and any comments from you, because I'd love to hear from you guys too. Anything that you think um, we can do better next time? This is the first time I'm doing it this on this format for youth. Usually I've taught it a couple of times now and it's, you know, weekly sessions, uh, lower, slower paced, certainly. But yeah, let me know if there's uh, anything else here. So I don't think I have any questions. Alhamdulillah. Yeah, I don't see anything here, or maybe I'm just not. Um, alhamdulillah. Oh, thank you, Hassan John. Very sweet. Alhamdulillah. So the cure for displeasure with blame, did I not go over that? Um, you know, is you have to humble yourself and know that Allah whatever blessings you have, Allah can, you know, uh, remove that for you, but also to know that you're, you're, uh, you know, it's, you should be grateful when people correct you, they're doing uh, you a favor because they're getting you close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So to just humble yourself and to know that we're all works in progress, right? Um, but to be appreciative that when someone corrects you, uh, that it's a good thing and to thank them for it. All right. So, Alhamdulillah, we stayed over a little bit. Let's see these comments. You guys are sweet. Thank you, Ihsan Khadafis, to you, Rahia. Thank you for this class. Oh, you're so sweet. Jazakallah khairan. What a nice compliment. Mashallah. Thank you, Uthman. Amen. Mashallah. Thank you. You guys really appreciate it. Thank you, Captain. I'm so I'm so curious about who Captain is because your name, the others I know who they are. Their names are a little clear, but I'm very curious. Captain, who's your who are your parents? Do I know your parents? Uh, let me know who they are. Um, Alina. Okay, sweetheart. Alina. Well, I hope I can see you and meet you, Alina, one day. Inshallah. But thank you all for your very kind comments. Jazakumullah khairan. Keep us in your dua, okay? Okay, well, say, give, give your mother Maimuna my salam, inshallah, please. But keep um, me and my family in your duas and... Um, I hope you guys have an amazing rest of your month. Remember, tonight is a very, very special night. Very special. So make sure your duas are strong. And if you haven't written them out yet, you should maybe write your duas, okay? Because tonight is a powerful night, inshallah. All the nights of Ramadan are powerful, but there's something special. Of course, we know about the 27th. So write your duas out, you know, and really think about it. It's kind of like what we talked about with that gratitude, right? So inshallah, I really hope to, again, uh, see uh, you all in the near future in better circumstances, hopefully, than on lockdown. Jazakumullah khairan. Please make dua for all of the MCC staff, especially our dear brother Munir, who's going through a, a challenge right now in his personal life. Make dua for him and his family, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings them all ease. Make dua for Sister Homera, my co-panelist, who's been amazing, okay? She's been here every week, staying, even though she has a full-time job and she has to work and she's got meetings and she probably does not want to be on a computer all day long, but she has facilitated and made this class possible. I thank Sister Homera so much for her time. May Allah bless her and all of uh, the people at MCC who make these programs possible, and all of you, again, and your families. May Allah reward all of you. Jazakum Allah khairan. We'll end in dua. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdika. Shadu an la ilaha ila anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Allahumma salli wa sallam wa barik ala sayyidina wa maulana wa habibina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasneeman kathira. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواسوا بالحق وتواسوا بالصبر الحمد لله اللهم بلغنا ليلة القدر إن شاء الله yes make that dua ya Allah please let us let us experience ليلة القدر إن شاء الله إن شاء الله آمين جزاك الله خيرا الحمد لله السلام عليكم everybody